have on the closed session items, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the public line will be closed and inaccessible. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through your phone. Please note, there's a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely, and I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. When it's your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The time will be set for two minutes, and you may hang up once you've commented on your item of interest. I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers? Council Member Byers? Uh, okay, well, Council Member Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Boulder? Here. Watkins? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? <coughs> Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. Is there any members of the public who would like to comment on items on our closed session? Now is the time to call in. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And uh, once you've been recognized, you'll be unmuted and you will have two minutes to speak. Territory of the Owasso speaking Yupi tribe. 
The Onwitson tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taking a mission to Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historic trauma. Uh, with that, we have, to begin to kick off our meeting, we have a couple of proclamations. Um, the first one is for David King. David King, a native of Del Norte, Colorado, was born on June 16, 1951. And whereas David King uh, was the... Mayor Cummings, sorry. That, that particular proclamation is not on this agenda. Oh, okay. All right, well, I'll, I guess we'll follow up with that in a future agenda. Um, first proclamation on our agenda um, is honoring Marilyn Elwood's 40 years of service, uh, which that is a profound commitment to the city. And so um, with that, on August 3rd, 2020, police property and evidence specialist Marilyn Elwood is retiring after 40 years of faithful and dedicated service to the city of Santa Cruz and its citizens. Whereas on September 22nd, 1980, Marilyn Elwood was hired by the city of Santa Cruz Police Department as a photo technician. And whereas during Marilyn Elwood's tenure, she served in various roles, including property clerk, property attendant, and most recently, police property and evidence specialist. Whereas Marilyn Elwood has been an outstanding example of mobility and has been a tremendous asset to the city of Santa Cruz, its community, and its police department. And we will be long remembered and appreciated for both her friendship and for 40 years of commendable service. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim August 3rd, 2020, as Marilyn Elwood's retirement day in the city of Santa Cruz, and encourage all her coworkers and citizens to join me in expressing heartfelt appreciation for 40 years of dedicated and exemplary service and numerous contributions to the city of Santa Cruz Police Department and the city of Santa Cruz and wish her well into her retirement. I'd like to invite if there's any council members or staff who'd like to share any comments um, on this proclamation. Hearing none, um, the next item on our agenda is a proclamation uh, proclaiming August as American Muslim Appreciation Month. And I know there's a, a number of members of the public who have been invited to join the meeting um, to receive this proclamation. Hello, oh, should I go ahead? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start by reading the proclamation. It'd be great if you all could share some comments. Um, so where freedom of religion holds a distinction as a cherished and essential right and a fundamental value upon which the law and ethics of the United States are based. And whereas the Bay Area has a thriving community of 250,000 Muslims and over 100 mosques and religious centers, and Muslim Americans pursue diverse professions make rich contributions to the social, cultural, and economic vibrancy of the United States and have distinguished themselves by fostering greater respect and understanding among all people through faith and service. And whereas the Islamic Relief USA has committed to distributing $5 million nationwide in COVID-19 assistance and its Northwest office has coordinated with local charities to distribute masks, hygiene kits, hundreds of meals, 50,000 pounds of food to at-risk communities in the Bay Area, packed 50,000 meals that were sent overseas, and donated tens of thousands of dollars to organizations who distributed aid to local impacted community members. And whereas the Muslim Student Association at the University of California at Santa Cruz is a welcoming and open community that aims to spread awareness and create a safe, supportive environment for Muslims in Santa Cruz and has offered virtual programming on self-improvement and how to navigate around during COVID-19 through their Muslim Mental Health Workshop series, as well as lectures on solidarity, structural racism, and a conscious call for justice. And whereas it is appropriate to acknowledge and promote awareness of the myriad of invaluable contributions 
of American Muslims in California and across the country and extend to them the respect and camaraderie every American deserves. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of August 2020 as American Muslim Appreciation and Awareness Month in the City of Santa Cruz to acknowledge the rich history, contribution, and guiding virtues of American Muslims and commend all Muslim communities in California for the lasting positive impact that they have made towards advancement of our city and our country. Uh, peace be upon you. My name is Madiha Griffiths. I am one of the founders of the Islamic Center of Santa Cruz. Hello, and I'm her daughter. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Sabrine Griffiths. I was born and raised in Santa Cruz, so this community is home for me. And I went to Santa Cruz High just up the street from the city's office. Um, and my mom has been a part of establishing and growing the Islamic Center of Santa Cruz since the late 90s. So our mission as a center is to serve the collective needs of Santa Cruz residents regarding the Islamic faith but also to promote cooperation and understanding between Muslim residents and other communities, such as, but not limited to, the Jewish and Christian communities in Santa Cruz. So we thank you, uh, the city of Santa Cruz, for commemorating the fifth anniversary of August being designated as the American Muslim Appreciation and Awareness Month. The history of Islam in this country, as many of you will probably know, dates back to before its founding, originating with enslaved Africans who brought their Muslim belief with them to the Americas, and who later contributed numerous ways to the founding of this nation. And today, there are millions of American Muslims, both immigrants and native-born, of diverse backgrounds and beliefs. Muslim Americans in this nation, in this state, and in the city of Santa Cruz are teachers, lawyers, doctors, social workers, tech workers, nurses, business owners, among numerous other valued professions, as well as peace builders, activists, entrepreneurs, and politicians. Unfortunately, the Muslim community has been and continues to be the target of harassment, discrimination, and assault. But with the continued support, such as this Proclamation and Appreciation Month, we can work together to promote awareness and extend to the Muslim American community their spread, the respect and camaraderie that every American deserves. So again, I thank you for this recognition by the city of Santa Cruz as American Muslims have and will continue to contribute to this city and to this nation. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd just like to say thank you so much for being a part of this community, and please let us know how we can continue to support your community as well. Thank you. All right. With that, um, I guess we'll continue on with our meeting. Thank you. Um, I have a few announcements, and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website. City uh, Mayor, we have one more presentation item. Oh, we do? Okay. Sorry. Oh, my mistake. Looks like we have one additional presentation. Um, Monterey Bay Community Power Annual Update. And I'll turn it over to Lena Williams, Manager of Energy Account Services for Monterey Bay Community Power. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, uh, board members. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I know you have a jam-packed agenda today, so I'm going to make this um, as brief as possible, and then you guys can ask me any questions that you may have. <clears throat> so uh, this afternoon, I would like to thank you, uh, Mayor and illustrious board members, for allowing me to present you with your annual um, JPA member update for Monterey Bay Community Power, soon to be Central Coast community energy. Um, for anybody who may be new to the board or not be aware of who we are, of course, we are um, the current um, primary clean energy provider for the Central Coast. Um, we are Joint Powers Authority, now made up of these 29 um, wonderful communities of which Santa Cruz is one. Um, and as I mentioned, one, as we continued our expansion down the Central Coast to include cities in Santa Barbara um, County, and in San Luis Obispo County, um, we made the decision as an organization to move towards a renaming um, effective this September 4th to Central Coast Community Energy. Our accomplishments to date, I'd like to share these with you. A few of them you may have heard, but we've had some changes over the year. Um, of course, when we launched in 2018, NBCP was providing two um, energy choices for the members um, in the communities that we serve, 100% uh, carbon-free offering, and for those who wanted to opt up to 100% renewable and support renewable energy, that offering was available as well. 
Um, as um, an, an organization in its entirety, we currently have about 94% of the eligible customers in all of our um, communities in, enrolled. Um, we have supported the economic vitality of the Central Coast, and these are some numbers that are new since last year. Um, so we have actually um, it reinvested over $12 million in energy program customers. Uh, um, throughout the um, communities that we serve have experienced over $17 million in energy savings so far. And just this past year, in 2019, we established a $25 million resiliency fund that was in response um, to the um, pg e power, the public safety power shutoffs that were actually going on. It actually is a revolving fund that allows um, critical facilities to actually take, a, take advantage of initiating resiliency projects so they can keep their power on for in their communities and in those essential buildings. Um, during power shutoffs for an extended period of time or um, part of the, in an emergency preparedness plan. So that fund is still available. And when I go into more detail about our energy programs, of course, I'll be sure to mention a little bit more about that. Um, we've entered into over $800,000 in contracts with local lenders. So in addition to those being within the Tri-County, there also um, are some in uh, the cities of San Luis Obispo and Morro Bay. We have now expanded to a second office. So in addition to our original office located in Monterey, um, we've also opened an office in San Luis Obispo to actually support the community members in San Luis Obispo um, and be closer to those community members in Santa Barbara County as well. Um, we've achieved over 140 million in reserves and as was mentioned to you previously, all of the um, loans were paid off. We have continued uh, to add to our renewable portfolio, so over 450 megawatts of renewable solar, wind, and geothermal um, has expanded in addition to projects um, that include um, solar plus storage. Uh, Monterey Bay's community, community power's response to COVID-19 was uh, swift. With uh, unanimous support from the boards, we were able to actually launch for the months of May and June a 50% across the board rate reduction for 100% of enrolled NBCP customers. That was regardless of rate class or energy program. All students, excuse me, all customers receive that on bill savings. Um, you may have received an email or seen a notification like this, or your constituents may have seen um, an email just alerting them that that was coming um, and was available. But if they weren't aware, that's actually on, still visible on their bills for some folks that are billed late um, in the month, later in, in the month, so they can see that there. But um, it resulted in over 22 million of funds reinvested directly into our community and it was the largest CCA response to COVID-19 in the entire state of California. Um, just a brief overview here, and I know you have this in your, um, your deck when I mentioned some of our renewable projects, including uh, solar plus storage. You can actually see the extent of some of the projects that we've actually um, entered into over the last year. Um, some of these go live in 2021, some in 2022, um, including a memorandum of understanding um, for an offshore wind project in Morro Bay. Um, so energy programs, um, our structure actually um, provides for 3% of gross revenue being set aside each year for energy programs. And so in the last year, we were actually able to not just expand what we offered. I think there were only two programs that were launched in the year before. We were able to actually continue funding for existing programs and then build on that success. So Cal EVIP um, providing for the electric vehicle infrastructure, the affordable housing um, program, um, that is actually something that took place uh, more recently, 2020. The school bus electrification program, so that is um, in conjunction with MBARD and it's still um, in progress for 2020. The Ag Electrification Grant Program, so that was actually just launched last month and it will be continued into the next year. Residential electrification is to come later this year, including residential resiliency. Um, and then 
and the greenhouse gas inventories from member agencies. So if your um, agency still has not applied, the, that is available. So there is there are funds set aside um, for each agency in addition to the REACH code, code incentives for the member agencies. Um, in terms of the 25 million total investment, this goes back to the uninterruptible power supply program. That is our um, resiliency project, the $25 million revolving fund, $20 million of which was set aside specifically for the public sector um, to initiate projects with um, critical facilities. So those funds are still available. Of course, um, MBCP is available to um, support you in identifying those projects if you don't already have those um, in progress where you may be able to add resiliency or you already have resiliency um, battery storage or generators um, as part of that plan and you want to see if there's additional funding or support there. So there are um, there continue to be funds available for the public sector. So the reason that I'm here, so the city of Santa Cruz numbers. So we have here 2018 and 2019, just so that you can see what has been saved uh, to date. City of Santa Cruz um, has 22,880 enrolled in count, accounts, which represents um, between residential and commercial uh, combined, almost 96% um, of the eligible account holders within the city of Santa Cruz enrolled. Um, the city accounts, so the um, buildings that are buildings and meters um, and lights that are currently owned uh, by the city of Santa Cruz and paid for by the city of Santa Cruz. In 2018, um, there was over 18,000 in savings and in the past year, 2019, you're looking at closer to 45,000 in savings. And then overall, um, Santa Cruz community members in 2019 saved over $700,000. So as NBCP continues to unify the Central Coast, of course, um, we have had additional communities uh, that have um, agreed to get started with NBCP. As you see, we already are at 29. In October, though, of um, 2021, um, we are roughly within October or Q3 of 2021. We will also have three additional Santa Barbara communities joining us as well. Santa Barbara County, um, Gua, excuse me, um, Carpinteria, and Goleta. And then in 2022, we um, now have um, the city of Fulton. So that would mean that by um, January 2022, all of Santa Barbara County will be enrolled with NBCP. Um, we are continuing um, as we go forward with our name change in September to make additional announcements about that. Um, but we will also invite our um, member agencies for our quarterly member, member agency update to get more details on the available programs um, that are coming up in the next quarter for you to take advantage of. Um, so in uh, my presentation, um, did you have any questions for me while I'm here? And thank you for your presentation. Um, are there any questions from council members that want to Brown. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I have uh, just a quick question that is related to the overall functioning of the uh, unified Central Coast CCA that we're moving towards. I'm having been on the board, I'm uh, really appreciative of all the work that you all have done to make our CCA so incredibly uh, robust and effective and uh, bring that kind of community savings and all of the other benefits. Um, I know that we've been receiving from your, the director uh, information about this threat to CCAs as a result of the moves that may be made by the PUC to help subsidize uh, the big three, which includes PG&E. And um, I'm just wondering if you have any uh, comments on that or anything that you think that we could be doing to be helpful in that regard. I know the mayor of San Jose has written a op-ed and there's probably other activity, um, but just if there's anything we can do to, to try to support your efforts. 
Well, thank you. That's actually a really good question. So I directly am not aware of the things that you can do to add, but what I can do is I can reach out to our regulatory team. I know that we have several uh, members of the NBCP staff right now, three of them that are kind of fighting the big fight, uh, the good fight for us, and um, there may actually be things that we can actually reach out, say, comment on, um, or be a part of. So absolutely, I will um, go ahead and ask uh, him for that information so that I can share that with the rest of the board. Great, thank you. And just for the public, if you're listening, this is about, uh, you know, the, the differential that we then now have to pay as, as the CCA um, is to kind of help the big three, including PG&E, cover their costs, and they're allowed to increase the rates um, uh, without a whole lot of uh, mm, uh, pushback. So I think it's time that we start pushing back, and I just wanted to, to make that uh, you know information uh, available to the public too. Thanks. You are very welcome. Thank you. I'm sure I speak for everyone in saying this is just a spectacularly impressive annual report. And how NBCP has grown really quickly on the scale of things from a small band of devoted activists. I mean, what was it, 15 years ago, something like that? You know, we have a vision, and this is just so impressive. And just congratulations to everyone who kept that vision and kept working on it and proving that it would work. It's just amazing. Thank you so much, Council Member Matthews. Yes, Mayor Myers. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you also for the um, presentation, uh, Mina, and uh, I especially just want to make note um, of your of um, Monterey Bay Community's power to really committing to helping people with their bills over the COVID-19 period and. Um, it's it's great that you guys basically are leading the state and really forecasting and doing that right away out of the gate. So thank you for taking care of um, that for p people in our community that needed that assistance. And um, again, thank you for the wonderful presentation and all the work that you've been doing. Thanks. Thank you. No further questions from council. Uh, thank you again, Lena, for that presentation and for all the hard work that you all are doing at Monterey Bay. Well, thank you so much for having me. Have a great afternoon. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next part of our agenda, I'll have a few announcements and then we'll move on to the regular portion of our meeting. Uh, today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, the instructions will be provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item. It will be opened up for public comment. Please note that public comment is heard only on items city council is taking action on and not on regular updates or reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are numbers 10 through 33 on our agenda, with the exception of item number 29. And um, with, like, with that, I'd like to ask if uh, there are any council members with statements of disqualification today. If, hearing none, I'd like to ask the clerk if there are any additions or deletions uh, to the agenda. There are not. Uh, with regards to oral communications, Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur on or around 7 p.m. If you wish to like the uh, to make a comment during oral communications, please call in at 7 p.m. this evening. Next item is an uh, update and report from the city attorney on items from closed session. Thank you, Mayor Cummings, members of the City Council. <clears throat> uh, this morning, the Council convened in closed session at 9 a.m. to uh, consider um, the following items. Uh, item A was a conference with labor negotiators 
<clears throat> and uh, the uh, council discussed with its uh, labor negotiators uh, the following bargaining groups, which represent all uh, essentially bargaining groups in the city. Yeah. Uh, Police Officers Association, uh, Fire, IAFF Local 1716, Fire Management, Police Management, uh, OE3 Mid Managers and Supervisors, SEIU Local 521, and unrepresented employees. Uh, there was no reportable action on that item. Item B is a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims. There were eight liability claims on uh, this morning's uh, agenda. Six of those, uh, including the following, are also listed on your uh, open session agenda as item number 16 on the consent calendar. And those are the claims of Beverly Hoffman, Dwayne Lansing Peterson, Safeco Insurance, Troy William Swain, uh, Margarita Lizarraga, and Celeste Boros. <clears throat> uh, items seven and eight, the council also received a report from and gave direction to legal counsel, and those are the claims of Markle for Santa Cruz Bay Inc., DBA, Deeks Market, and Damien Ramirez. Um, there, there was no reportable action on those last two items. Item C was a conference with legal counsel involving existing litigation. Uh, item one was the pending litigation in the matter of Save Our Big Trees versus the City of Santa Cruz currently pending in uh, Santa Cruz Superior Court. Uh, item two was uh, an amicus uh, request for support in the matter of Sharon L. Fulton et al. versus the City of Philadelphia. Uh, that's a legal challenge to the city of Philadelphia's uh, ordinance that bans discrimination on the basis of race, uh, religion, or sexual orientation. Uh, item three was the matter of the state of Washington versus uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, and that's a legal challenge to a change in the rules uh, under the Affordable Care Act, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of uh, gender identity or sexual orientation. Uh, in those two items, the Sharon L. Fulton case and the State of Washington case, the council voted to join in an amicus uh, petition, uh, one pending in the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, the second State of Washington case pending in the United States District Court for the Western District of Washington. Um, I would just add that in the Washington case, um, there are other, several other uh, pending litigation uh, matters in various districts throughout the country, which are also uh, raising the same issues, and the council authorized joining in amicus briefs filed in those other uh, uh, cases as well. Item B was a conference with legal counsel concerning anticipated litigation. Uh, one was uh, significant exposure to litigation, and the other item was uh, initiation of litigation, and the council received a report from and gave direction to legal counsel on those items. There was no reportable action. Thank you very much. There are no further questions or comments by council members. Uh, we'll move on. Next item on our agenda is uh, City Manager report to provide updates on city events and business items. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I do have uh, several items I'd like to update the council on. Uh, first, uh, just a, a COVID-related item. Uh, the council may be aware that we've been seeing uh, additional uh, vendors on Beach Street uh, in front of the, uh, the uh, volleyball court area. And uh, we've, uh, have, uh, I've issued executive orders to provide for um, rules so that there's social distancing in place uh, in that area. And thus far, we have been having a, a difficult time uh, getting compliance uh, from the vendors there uh, with respect to the, the uh, rules that have been put in place that require that vendors uh, 
have certain conditions in place uh, as far as wearing masks, as far as, as as far as spacing is concerned, and where they locate so that they don't uh, come into conflict with uh, pedestrians and bicyclists and, and other users of that pretty pretty confined and busy area. But we've been having issues with that, and I just want to let the city council know that we will be having to take some additional measures and actions to address that. Uh, so we'll be doing that uh, here soon because it's becoming uh, very, very difficult to um, keep people uh, apart. And given the rising numbers in uh, COVID uh, cases and, and the spread of the virus, uh, we're going to take action on that uh, soon. So I just want to let the council know about that. Second, a couple of uh, budgetary related items that I just wanted to highlight. Uh, first, uh, the council does have a study session uh, next week, uh, as I understand that's scheduled at 11 a.m., where the council will get an update on the city's uh, budgetary status uh, and some of the actions that the council uh, may need to consider and, and take as we deal with our increasing uh, fiscal crisis. Uh, so I wanna let the council and the committee uh, know about that and uh, for them to uh, tune in and to hear uh, a more detailed uh, update and analysis of our budgetary conditions, uh, which again are, are pretty significant at this point in time. And then finally, um, again, related to the budget, uh, and I'll share my screen really quickly here. I wanna let the council know that uh, we have, um, real quick. The, um, the mayor has signed a letter uh, to, that was sent to the County Board of Supervisors relative to requests regarding funding for, in particular, homelessness-related items. Uh, the county has received a significant amount of funding from the state uh, related to homelessness uh, allocations, uh, and uh, the city having uh, uh, a need with respect to a uh, number of areas around homelessness uh, put together a letter that was submitted to the Board of Supervisors. They are holding their, their budget hearings on these items this week, uh, in particular with respect to uh, some of the funding tomorrow. So just wanted to just go over those with you very briefly and for the public to uh, make you aware of some of the major areas that we'd like to work with the board and the county on uh, trying to address. Uh, first is the potential catastrophic wildland fire risk uh, in our city and regional open spaces. Uh, as the council may be aware, we do have uh, quite a bit of open space and we'll, we will need to be doing some uh, wireland interface uh, to address the potential uh, spread of a fire, major fire event. And that would, uh, would likely result in the displacement of individuals that might be, uh, or that are actually uh, camping out in the open spaces, particularly in the Pogonip. And so we'd like to uh, ask the county if they could assist with providing surge capacity to address uh, those that might be displaced by having to move uh, individuals because of the need to do the uh, fire mitigation in, in that area. Secondly, as you may know, uh, we are working with the county and housing matters to make improvements on Coral Street with respect to operations there, with respect to the conditions on Coral Street and the surrounding areas uh, to provide a, uh, a better environment for the service providers, the uh, participants that uh, come there to, to obtain services, and also the residents that live in that area, and have been working with the county and uh, housing matters to make some improvements there. Um, and again, we are asking the county to provide some assistance with trying to make some of those improvements. Uh, you'll also recall that uh, we did get awarded some money for the purchase of the Seabird property acquisition, which we're not moving forward with, and so that money could be allocated to making improvements in that area. Uh, third, uh, as you all I think also know, we have been seeing an increase in RV parking on the west side, and we have increased the RV parking capacity in the city. We have an additional parking lot now in lot 17, which is the parking lot uh, behind Real Works, uh, as well as some additional capacity at the police department, but really would like to request that the county provide additional RV parking uh, options throughout the county. Uh, so as to uh, spread the the uh, the, uh, the options for people living living in vehicles to reside. So that's the, the third uh, request here. And then uh, fourth. And then finally, um, uh, the the county, in conjunction with the cities, is uh, has embarked on uh, 
a process to change the way uh, how homelessness is uh, addressed in, in our community as far as a governance structure uh, and planning to, uh, and, and how to move forward with that. And uh, we'd like to uh, request that the, uh, that the county also um, uh, allow the city to participate the, and, uh, in that process and that we move forward with that process as soon as possible. And I'm sorry, there's actually another one. And then the final one is with the Spectre CARES funding. The county did receive about $27 million in CARES funding. Uh, the purpose of that was to address COVID expenses and also to address the homelessness. And uh, we received some funding as well that we'll be allocating towards uh, COVID response, particularly the impact and services that we've had to provide to address the homelessness issues. And again, I've asked the county to also allocate some CARES funding uh, for those purposes, including some of the uh, items that I just pointed out. So I just want to highlight that for the council and the public. I sent a copy of the letter to the council as well. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions at this point in time for the city manager and council members? Councilmember Brown. Thank you for the updates, Martine. Uh, it's great to hear that the conversations with the county are continuing and um, productive. I have a question that I hope you can just clarify uh, for the general public, mostly because I've been getting questions from people, um, both tenants and landlords, about the eviction moratorium. We uh, extended that until August 13th, and but the language also included, um, or you know, depending on what the state does, uh, and the governor did extend that to September 30th. There seems to be some confusion, though, in the community about that. So I'm hoping you can just clarify that, and then also, could we could we like get that uh, some kind of notice on that uh, on our website with the with the COVID resources page, just to clarify? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, thank you for for that. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so it, the governor did extend, so the council um, uh, extended and then uh, allowed us to move forward with the extension uh, if, the, if the governor did that. And so we anticipate, though, that if the governor does not extend, that uh, we will be bringing forward at the council an item around that as well so that you can uh, review options to extend further uh, and also to see uh, what, the, what the governor will be doing. Uh, but right now, we do have the, uh, the state uh, uh, extension in place, and we can certainly uh, provide an update and additional information on our COVID webpage and on our housing web pages as well. So we'll do that. All right, close meeting. Councilmember Matthews. Um, did we get a copy of that letter? Uh, if not, Yes, I, I, I emailed it uh, to you. I can I can resend that again. But yes, you should have a okay. copy. I, I don't doubt that you did. But <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, I'm happy to send it again. Yeah, thank you. Councilmember Goldberg. Um, I want to say thank you, um, City Manager, for sending that and working on that. I think it's really important for the public to understand where um, the revenue for Health and Human Services and Homeless Services comes from, and I think the continued um, working together is going to really help move things along, so thank you. And actually, if I may, uh, there's another item that I'd just like to make the council aware of, too, that uh, I was reminded of. Um, again, just an FYI to the council, but uh, this relates to um, the uh, situation at uh, parking lot number 27, which is the parking lot on Laurel and Front Street uh, that uh, has been uh, utilized by Food Not Bombs. And again, I just want to let you know the council that we are receiving uh, complaints and concerns around the use of the lot uh, as it relates to uh, social distancing uh, and some of the conditions there and associated impacts uh, uh, with uh, the surrounding area. And uh, so wanted to just let you know that that's a, that's a problem and that we, uh, and unfortunately also Food Not Bombs has not been complying with the permit that uh, was, uh, was provided to them. Uh, as well, so we'll be we will be having to uh, uh, work on and address that situation as well. And I just wanted to let you know about that. Uh, Council 
Councilmember Watkins and then Councilmember Byers. Uh, thank you for the update and for the um, letter. My uh, my request is that if, if you do hear back or if you anticipate hearing back a response, that you share that with us as well. It'd be great to hear yeah. if the county has regards to those suggestions and hopes. Yes, that'd be great. And uh, we, we did ask, uh, and I don't know if uh, the mayor or the, or the vice mayor or council member uh, might be able to, uh, if possible, uh, participate in the budget hearings. The, the, the county will be um, hearing this at their budget hearing tomorrow on the CARES Act funding. Uh, so it might be helpful to have uh, a council member at least present there to, um, you know, uh, in person provide input uh, to the board, if at all possible. Or our staff could do it too, but uh, we can certainly work with the council members. I can do it. Okay, thank you. Yes, but we'll do that as well. Okay. Councilmember Byers. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Martin, for the update. Uh, regarding the vendors on Beach Street, I think I understood you say that uh, we'll be implementing the, uh, the pandemic rules. Is that what? What is that going to do? I mean, it won't move them; it'll just distance them. Well, we've what we did was already uh, put in place rules that uh, where we have areas that are outlined where they can be. Uh, oh. where they Station. Those have been in place for several weeks now. Mm -hmm. We've also worked with them to uh, get them to comply with respect to obtaining a business license, working with the health department to get whatever health permits they need. So I think we've been facilitating um, and working with them to, to do that. The problem has been that since then, even with these conditions in place, uh, they have not, uh, and even with uh, quite a bit of enforcement, quite frankly, and work with them, uh, it has not been working. Uh, many have uh, continued to uh, site uh, in the non-designated areas and in, in, in such that it's creating very, very crowded conditions. There have also been problems with bicycles, in, uh, intruding into the bicycle paths. And just uh, unfortunately, a lot of issues and it's just become uh, a place where there's a lot of overcrowding and, and it's obviously it's not conducive to uh, trying to prevent the spread of, of the virus. So quite simply, it's, it's, a, it's a health issue, uh, health hazard, and uh, it's something that we need to try to prevent the, the spread of, of, of the virus. So we're looking at having to change or add additional conditions to try to mitigate it even further because what we've done thus far has simply not, not worked, unfortunately. So what is the next move that I'm missing? So we haven't finalized it, but we may uh, limit uh, hours. We may limit uh, uh, locations or just change uh, 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 where they can be or not be. Uh, so we're, we're working with the city attorney's office and the police department. Hi there. Okay. I just okay. called her to see if she could come out. Did you need to talk with her? Oh, no. Somebody's on the line. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we have not finalized those uh, council member buyers, but it will be really uh, limiting or prohibiting uh, the vendors uh, in, in certain areas or with certain conditions, again, to truly try to uh, limit the, the spread of the virus uh, and, and, and to try to keep the social distancing in, in place to the extent possible. I uh, have to also recognize that uh, even with the, the extent of enforcement that, that we have out there, it's just been really difficult uh, because uh, we simply don't have the resources to be out there you know, constantly and the vendors have been very creative in, in trying to uh, avoid and it's a very competitive environment, unfortunately. Um, but uh, uh, we'll, do, we'll do our best to work with them like we have, but we, might, we, we do need to impose some additional restrictions too. Again, because the, addressing the, the, the COVID spread is really critical at this point in time. Uh, Councilmember Matthews and then Boulder. Well, I kind of expected to address this when we got to the item about uh, amending our vending ordinance to conform with state law. I don't know if you want to continue it here. Yeah, you can certainly talk about it then. It's uh, it, it's it's somewhat related in that uh, obviously the, what we're doing yeah. now is, is executive orders under the, the existing health order. It's not related to necessarily the ordinance right. with moving forward. The issue, well, I'll, I'll just put in my you, defense here and let it go for that. But um, 
it's really gotten bad, and and it's not obviously not just COVID. I mean, that's kind of the excuse to do executive orders, but um, uh, the whole situation there has gotten um, unsafe for the bike lanes. It's got it's become a real problem just the vibe for the beachgoers. I mean, who wants to have fights between the street vendors? That's not a pleasant experience. So, um, I personally would just encourage you to. Uh, um, as much in the way of oversight enforcement as is legally possible because it's just a bad vibe down there. And, you know, we've, we've all seen the correspondence we've been getting. And it just seems like, you know, there's so much just throwing up his hands, oh, can't do anything. And I realize the state law is a big challenge. So I would suggest that also in the future we anticipate John Laird will be in the Senate. I mean, um, let's... Uh, probably hope that at some point we can get a correction in the state law as well. It's, I know League of California Cities has, has been interested, opposes the extent of the state law, and uh, we are not the only city uh, grappling with this issue. So uh, for the short term, uh, let's do what we can to make the experience both beach and downtown. I'll put downtown in the same, um, same spot here. Um, obviously safe, but also um, uh, claim what local control we possibly can on this issue, which is the, the scene is just not helpful to us. All right, it's muted. Tom Clover, go there. As long as we're on this topic, then I'm gonna just throw in my two cents too, if that's okay right now. And um, I'm just curious, uh, I, is it my understanding that in order to vend like these people are doing, um, you need to have a business license in the city? That's correct. And then to have a business license in the city, do you have to like live within the city or the county or can you have a business license in the city and live in other places too? You don't, as I understand, you don't have to live in the city to have a business license. I guess that makes sense, duh. So yeah. from, 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 the, I don't know if anyone's on that's from the finance department, or maybe they can get back to us. For the mobile vendors, are most of them coming from, you know, the city or the county or from out of the county? Do we have any idea? Uh, my understanding from the staff that's been working with them is that the, the vendors that are in the beach area are, are not from the area. They're from the Central Valley and Southern California. Thank you. All right, there's no further discussion on this item. Um, our team, thanks for the update on those items. And I'm sure we'll, the discussion around street vending is before us later today, so I'm sure we'll get into further discussion on that. Thanks for, thanks for the update. Um, I'll, I'd now like to call the clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. Um, nothing except for the trying to narrow down a start time for the August 18th study session. I sent you guys an email to see if 11 a.m. does work for everyone. It would be great to solidify that now. I think if council members can get back to the clerk ASAP, um, let her know if 11 o'clock works. Okay, so um, moving on to our next item, item number nine. Uh, this is the time for council members to report on any actions and external boards, committees, joint power meetings. Um, so if anyone has any updates that they would like to provide, um, I'll let council members go ahead and start kick it off. I'm very pleased to say that the ethics subcommittee finished our job <laughs> and uh, we will be forwarding the report to you. Um, Lisa put in a lot of work on that, so that was the name, Captain, on that one. Okay. Councilmember Brown. 
I just have a quick update uh, at our RTC Regional Transportation Commission meeting last Thursday. We approved uh, a, a transfer of funds from open streets, the t typical RTC funds that are used for open streets, uh, to their the slow streets programming and bike Santa Cruz County and Ecology Action will be uh, the recipients of that, or they already received the funds, but they'll be directing those funds towards slow streets. So I know a lot of people in uh, the community are very interested in this, and I thought I'd uh, just update that that's an additional, uh, some additional support for go moving forward. Thanks. Um, I'd just like to provide an update. Um, the budget committee met um, and with, we met with management partners to get an update on some modeling, which uh, we also received a presentation during closed session today, so the public is aware. And then we're going to be having a special meeting on August 18th, um, the time to be determined. But uh, sounds like we're aiming for around 11 or 12 in the morning, 11 in the morning or 12 in the afternoon. Um, so that will be coming. Uh, AMBAG is meeting tomorrow. so. I'll have an update at the next meeting. Uh, with city schools, uh, we've been having a lot of discussions around the impacts of the schools, of COVID-19 on schools. Um, as many of you are aware, it's like the, uh, the federal level, uh, they didn't renew one of the orders that allowed for schools to distribute food. And so um, I haven't received an update on whether or not that's changed, but the city schools, um, have uh, reduced their meals programs that they're handing out to families. Um, and so there's you know, discussion around what that's gonna look like moving into the fall. Um, there's been discussion around uh, whether there might be potential city facilities that could be used for in-person learning when that's allowed again. There's been discussion around outdoor learning as well. Um, and, you know, but a, a lot of discussion around how to get meals, ensure that we're getting meals and learning materials to students um, so that everyone has an opportunity to do distance learning this fall. Um, the Climate Action Task Force has been moving forward with their 2030 Climate Action Plan. Um, and then, and with regards to the almost two by two, I think we're going to hear a lot of information around the cash report this afternoon and we'll be able to ask questions. But the county has been moving forward with a six month plan that uh, was before them at the previous, at the last um, uh, county supervisors meeting. Um, and so I think that's all I have to update on the committees at this time. Vice Mayor Myers. Mayor Myers, if you're there. Sorry, hand was raised. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Mayor, for covering many of those. You and I share um, a number of committees, so I won't. Um, I will not repeat those. I do want to just. Um, to touch on a few committees, though, that did meet. Uh, the Downtown Management Corporation met yeah. um, in July, uh, and we have been uh, reviewing uh, use of the budget. Um, we are seeing a budget uh, decline, but we have uh, committed to continuing with our Downtown Ambassador Program. And um, we've also received uh, a report from the Downtown Association uh, staff on the number of closures that we're seeing of businesses downtown. And um, so that was um, disheartening to hear uh, about so many of our beloved uh, community businesses starting to uh, not make it downtown uh, any longer. So uh, definitely a sobering meeting. Um, we, uh, but we will be uh, refunding at a, lim at a sh slightly reduced amount many of the services downtown with the intent of trying to, um, again, draw people back, make sure that it's um, 
uh, you know, there that the, the ambassadors are there to welcome people, answer questions. Um, also along those lines, we are uh, seeing obviously the popularity of some of the uh, the street closure and outdoor dining, which is uh, also great. So um, I'll let Councilmember Matthews add to that if she'd like to add more. Um, the other two things I'll update on are um, the CALS Working Group. I'm sure many of you saw the uh, media. Um, the CALS Beach was off, has been taken off the beach bummer list by Heal the Bay for the first time in 10 years. Um, there is still work ahead to do. Uh, the group is now focused on um, basically submitting a grant to do an epidemiology uh, study which is basically a study to interview folks who uh, may have gotten sick from the water or have symptoms so that they're wondering are related to the water. We'll uh, be conducting that and trying to raise those funds to do that work hopefully in the next, uh, in the next year or so. Um, we also, there was some great media that saved the waves and the city put out, city put out a couple of great videos about that work. Um, and we'll be continuing to try to refine that as well. We're also uh, through Save the Waves, who is a member of the working group um, and the city and other members of the working group will be working with Stanford University on a um, drift study in that area so we further understand how the currents work in that area. So uh, some nice news during this period of time. So um, good news from that. And I'm just looking through the list here, uh, I think, that covers it for my items. Um, so that's my report. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Matthews. I'll, I'll just add, uh, you know, every committee we're on, the revenues are down. We all have that experience. Um, Metro is trying very hard to adjust to the COVID reality. Ridership is way down. Um, they are retrofitting the buses and instituting a whole host of safety measures to protect both drivers and riders. They're drawing down some reserves as we are. They have been some federal funds, but they too, like us, are looking as a public agency um, for a uh, financial survival over uh, a long recovery period. Um, Council Member Myers is on the Finance Committee for that one, but I think that's, that's the thumbnail sketch there. Trying to maintain mm -hmm. critical service um, uh, under very trying circumstances. Regarding the Downtown Management Corporation, you know we were um, putting a lot of energy into the Puma recommendation to do the merger of the assessment district and uh, COVID just kind of blew that all apart. So we are back to the basic services. Um, and uh, we have talked about contracting for the ambassador program with a nationwide uh, entity that provides that service. And so there can be uh, still a uh, hospitality service, um, but uh, administered differently, still um, basically covered by the assessment district. And then Zach Davis, who has uh, Snap Taco and Penny Ice Cream Reef, uh, went off the board after six years. He's been a great representative of the business community, so we're recruiting for a new uh, board member from the uh, downtown business community. And yeah, the um, just kudos to economic development and this very, very quick work they and public works have done on occupying the streets. Boy, when you go downtown now, mm -hmm. it's amazing. <laughs> so, and I th that's a good transition to visit San Francisco County. I think I forwarded to all of you some um, uh, reports of what Visit San County has done in terms of um, a campaign to visit safely. Um, and they promoted it heavily in the um, uh, all of the industry lodging and visitor serving uses um, with some great simple graphics. So obviously, we do want to come to Santa Cruz, but we want them to be safe when they do it, distance, mask, et cetera. So they've, they've put a lot of effort into the safety campaign, which has actually been um, picked up by other entities statewide. Great, thanks for the report. And uh, thank, I want to just thank everyone again for all your hard work and commitment to being on these different committees and task force. 
forces. Uh, Councilmember Matthews. I gotta say one more thing. I don't know where this fits in. Uh, August 18th is the centennial of the ratification of the women's right to vote. So <laughs> let's have a proclamation. I know uh, Justin did one in oh, earlier this year for Women's History Month or week or something. But anyway, yeah, that's the date, August 18th. <laughs> and the Cabrillo Festival did a wonderful program on Sunday related to the uh, centennial. So. You know, I'll get out and I just have, I have one other thing to add, Mayor Cummings. Um, I just wanted to let the council know and our community know um, that on Sunday, last Sunday, the or excuse me, Saturday, the eighth of August, um, I participated with our sister city, Shingu, on uh, a remembrance of the 75th anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima, which actually occurred on the sixth. Um, but also the bombing of the city of Nagasaki, uh, which did occur on, on August 8th. Um, and the Sister Cities um, Committee uh, and Shingu um, folks were uh, all together on Zoom, and uh, it was timed in Japan and timed here in California. Uh, we both read proclamations. I read the mayor's proclamation. Uh, it was translated into Japanese for their community. They read a proclamation, it was uh, translated. Um, and then there was a coordinated bell ringing ceremony that took place at the, at the, at the um, temple in Shingu and in Nagasaki and other communities in Japan, uh, both on the 6th and the 8th. And um, it was, I have to say, it was a big highlight for me. It was, uh, it was a pretty neat thing to participate in. So uh, I just want to just uh, thank the Sister City Committee and the Shingu um, uh, folks who work with the Shingu uh, Sister City uh, folks because it was a really meaningful event. And um, I have asked um, the Sister Cities folks to uh, provide that uh, video to us. So hopefully we can, we will have a shorter uh, city council meeting and then we can broadcast portions of that video uh, for our community to see via city council. So forgot to mention that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, council Member Watkins and then Mr. Golder. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Vice Mayor, for attending. and. Um, I was disappointed I wasn't able to make it to say hi to our friends in Shingu, so I'm glad that you were able to make that event. Um, I just have a few additions, one to the state schools, just that it was really heartening to know that our staff from Parks and Recreation is working really closely with the city school staff on a regular basis just to make sure that they can mobilize if needed in any way possible mm -hmm. to support each other and um, to ensure that we're leveraging resources. Um, and then I just another uh, sort of brief reminder and announcement that to, to those in the community who haven't already, to please fill out your 2020 census that's coming up and we need to get as many responses as possible. So every opportunity we have a chance to, to remind you, we, we will do so. Um, and lastly, that um, there's the Resilient Coast Santa Cruz Community Feedback Opportunity, which is open right now and it's open through August 17th. And it's um, on our website at thecityofsantacruz.com backslash uh, resilient coast. So for those who want to participate in that survey, please do so by visiting the website. And I will make sure to wear my shirt on August 18th. Thanks, Cynthia, for the reminder. Celebrating 100 years of women's right to vote. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great. Council Member Golder and then Council Member Brown. I just also wanted to acknowledge the Parks Department and Parks and Rec for um, attempting with the virtual junior guards and you know making a lemonade out of lemons. And I signed my daughter up, and we did a couple of the videos. And the um, instructors did a great job of you know doing the best they could with the situation they were given. And I just think um, it was a really cool way to highlight junior guards and mm -hmm. a very popular program given that they couldn't hold it in person. So thank you to them. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, Vice Mayor Myers, for uh, participating in that and reading the proclamation. I was able to sit in, and it really was amazing. And um, just the, the 
it, you know, all of the effort that went into it and the, you know, our sister city representatives in Shingu were just like thrilled to participate as were we at our end. It was really great. If we don't have the ability to or time to watch it uh, during a council meeting, which I hope we do, hopefully we can get it up on the website and I encourage people to, to take a look. It was lovely. Yeah. 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 Thank you all for those updates. I think if there's one thing I would like to add, it would be in addition to registering for the census, uh, just encouraging everyone to register to vote um, because we have a very important election coming up and uh, the sooner you can register, the better. So with that, uh, I'll move on to our next item, which, are cons which is the consent agenda. Uh, these are items numbers 10 through 24 on our agenda for today. And for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items 10 through 24. Uh, the instructions will be displayed on your screen. And please remember to mute your streaming device. Uh, and when you would like to raise your hand to comment, please press star nine on your phone and listen for the cue saying that you have been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled from the, con the consent agenda by council members for further discussion. Are there any council members who would like to pull an item uh, from consent? Hearing none, I actually, or do any council members have questions on any of the consent items? Wow, <laughs> big news, <laughs> sorry. I was looking at the news, sorry. Only because I got a beat. Guess who our VP running mate's gonna be? Oh, who? California, Kamala Harris. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> sorry. Now we know. <laughs> um, I did have a question on, um, Item number 19, and so I don't know if this needs to be pulled, but if uh, Lisa Murphy is around, I have a question on that, the temporary hardship program. I'm here. Uh, I was just curious, because I noticed with the item that there was a threshold, um, there's a financial threshold, and it was it, you know, above, I think it was, um, sorry if you're not having it uh, in front of me. I have it. If it's above um, 43,440. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could speak to that in terms of like what would the cutoff be? You know, so if somebody makes 80,000 or 100,000, would they still be able to have a plot for this hardship? The, oh, well, let me say a little bit about where the, the amount came from. So it, it was uh, suggested, I think SDIU came up with the suggestion, or it could have been the supervisors, that amount, and it was based on the CARES program for PG&E, which they felt was um, well vetted in terms of um, coming up with the, the tiers. But as, the, as to your question specifically, so we, we created two tiers. So a household income of 43,440 or less would be eligible for up to 1,500. And tier two, a household income of 43,441 or more, they would only be eligible for $1,000. There was no upper limit, uh, you know, whether you're 80,000 or 100,000 um, in terms of your, your, your household income um, to, to answer your question. Okay, yeah, I was just curious as to why, you know, the was another limit. I guess it would be good to know for council um, at this program. And I think it's great that we have the, the city putting on this program to support um, their employees while we're kind of dealing with this very difficult time. Um, I think it would be good um, moving forward to get report back, reports back on you know who's applied for those loans and who's received them and kind of what you know the prevailing income brackets are because just to ensure that we're getting those who are going to most need it. Absolutely, I'd be happy to provide you with those updates. Great. Uh, there's no further questions or comments by council members. Um, I'll turn it over to the public, see if there's any member of the public who would like to comment on items numbers 10 through 24 on the consent agenda. 
And so if members of the public would like to comment on these items, now is the time to call in. And once you join the meeting, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will be unmuted and given two minutes to speak on items on our consent agenda. I do have one quick comment of uh, thanks to our director Menard for the water meter item, the water re water meter replacement item. We um, talked about that in detail, and it's just goes by one of those things that goes by in consent. But um, I just appreciate the the work that the water department put into to developing that program, uh, in addition to sorely needed upgrade. It's also intended to uh, help develop our local workforce in um, uh, provide opportunities for living wage jobs. So I, I just wanted to call that out. And with that, I'll move the consent agenda. Okay. With a motion by Councilman Brown to see Councilman oh, Matthews. Yeah, I have a, a, just a couple of quick comments. I want to second the uh, 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 appreciation for item number whatever it was, 24, the meter replacement. And uh, there was a lot in that, <laughs> replacing the obsolete equipment and re recouping the losses and workforce development. But I'll say, personally, I looked at my water bill last month and shoot, I hadn't been billed for water for two months. And guess what? I was one of that 10% where the water meter was frozen. And <laughs> so that was replaced. I mentioned to my sister, she had the same thing. So it's not inconsequential. So. <laughs> you know, uh, good on many counts. And then I also want to um, thank uh, Lisa for the work on the temporary economic hardship program. Very responsive, low on bureaucracy. You were given general direction by the council, and I think you came back with something that really fit what we were shooting for. So good job. Okay. Seeing no further. Um questions or comments by council member. I'll turn it over to the clerk uh, to call the vote. Uh, there's a motion to uh, approve consent by council member Brown, seconded by council member Matthews. Thank you. Council member Byer? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Um, Meyer, uh, Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. Consent agenda passes unanimously. Okay, next item on our agenda is the consent public hearing. These are items 25 through 28. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you would like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Are there any council members who wish to pull items number 25 through 28? Okay. Hearing none, I'll turn it over to the member, to members of the public. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak on items that are our uh, consent public hearing? Uh, now's the time to do so, so please call in on the numbers that are on your screen. Once you've dialed in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you'll be given two minutes when it's your time to speak. Okay. Hey, um, member of the public, you're on the line. Yes, this is Garrett Phillip. As background to item 25, sadly, on June 26, the leftist legislature in California voted to place removal of the state constitutional prohibition on, quote, discriminating against or granting preferential treatment to persons on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in public employment, public education, and public contracting, unquote. That's right. The California government just voted to attempt 
to allow racial and gender discrimination by themselves through legislative initiative. It attempts to repeal Prop 209, which is an initiative of the people which passed with 55 percent affirmative in 1996 and was upheld in a Supreme Court challenge with their Prop 16. What we have is an attempt to set back civil rights discrimination 56 years back to the nation's 64 Civil Rights Act. The leftist state legislators wish to discriminate, treating different people unequally as they please based on what should be and are now protected personal characteristics. The repeal of Prop 209 is not yet law, and hopefully Prop 16 will go down uh, in the prejudicial flames its anti-racist, racist proponents want to fan. For the fourth time, I would remind the council the permit requirement advantages accorded minority and women in the proposed cannabis license ordinance are just such race, gender-based discrimination banned by current state law, and that they show preference one applicant's application is superior to another based on race or gender. For instance, the qualifier, quote, a majority of the business is minority or woman-owned. Systemic racism is racism, and acting into law, like Jim Crow or the separate but equal doctrine of segregation, that face of systemic racism is also exactly this, your faces, your votes. There can be no justification for race gender discrimination. This is what that is. Those who vote for this are the new anti-racist racists of the leftist progressive far left. Let's hear Mr. Kandati's take on how he would defend a civil rights lawsuit should this requirement be challenged by one solely denied a license for such an ill-conceived reason. Let's hear yours also. I expect weak tea, empty words compared with a fair reason truth. Don't set civil rights back 56 years. Bye. Okay, seeing no other members of the public who would like to speak to uh, consent public hearing items, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Councilman Matthews. Yeah, I'll move consent, uh, uh, move the consent public hearing agenda. Okay, a motion by Councilman Matthews. Councilman Brown. Second. Okay, a motion by Councilman Matthews. Second by Councilman Brown to move and approve the consent public hearing items. I'll turn it over to the, to the clerk to call the roll call vote. Councilmember Byers. Aye. Matthews. Aye. Brown. Aye. Golder. Aye. Watkins? I, but I'd like to register a no vote on number 25. Vice Mayor Myers? I, but I also will register a no vote on item number 25. Mayor Cummings? I. That passes um, with Council members voting in favor with the exception of Council members Watkins and Vice Mayor Myers voting no on item number 25. Um, sorry, Mayor Cummings, can I just confirm that was um, motion by Matthew, seconded by Brown, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on to our general business. Uh, item number 29 for 914 and 916 Seabright Ave, assessors parcel number 011-123-66. This item has been continued to the August 25th, 2020 City Council agenda at the request of the applicant and will not be discussed at today's meeting. Uh, next item up on our agenda is uh, item number 30, which is, um, Update on staff work related to project labor agreements and community benefit strategies for capital improvement projects. And this is a presentation by Council Member Irvine, uh, our Water Director Rosemary Menard, Director of Public Works Mark Dettel, and Director of Economic Development Bonnie Wexham. Uh, good afternoon, Council Members. I'm going to try to share my screen here. I just have a. Oh, okay, let's try. Uh, I have a fairly brief um, presentation that is really just focused on the um, on an overview of the recommendations, and then I'd be happy to uh, answer your questions. The uh, council received a presentation or a, a staff report that's fairly lengthy. It has quite a, quite a bit of detail in it. 
and uh, I guess basically the first of the sort of key elements of that staff report is an articulation by the staff of the um, of what we understood to be the council's basic goals from uh, the conversations we've had uh, in, about workforce development opportunities, about living wage uh, strategies for workers who are working on city projects, et cetera. And so we've articulated the, uh, these three particular goals uh, as sort of our understanding of what the council's main purposes are in um, asking us to look at both project labor agreement issues as well as the possibility of other kinds of community benefit, uh, strat benefit um, strategies associated with the implementation of capital projects, uh, whether they're utility projects or uh, housing development, things that the city gets involved with that in involves capital construction. Um, so I'm not going to read these. You, obviously, they were in the staff report, and um, again, this this was our premise of what we were really trying to do in terms of the, where the results needed to focus. Um, the the next segment of the presentation is really what I would uh, say are some recommendations to ask the council to adopt some key findings. There are three parts to this recommendation. The first is uh, to adopt the key findings. The second one has something to do with a, a project labor agreement enabling strategy. And then the third one is a, a community benefit strategy. The key findings really come uh, from the analysis work that was done by staff looking at uh, both the legal and the sort of practical realities of our uh, local construction workforce. and. So the first set of findings relate to the legal analysis, which indicates that project labor agreements need to be project specific and that they need to demonstrate that they are able to achieve uh, you know, these kinds of specific benefits, either de decreases in strikes, lockouts, uh, other kinds of uh, indirect cost overruns, that kind of thing. Um, direct or indirect cost overruns or increases in timely completion, uh, steady supply of, uh, you know, skilled labor um, or the percentage of local residents working uh, on the project and contributing positively to the local economy. Um, that's the basis of the legal analysis. And then um, additional ones are uh, sort of acknowledging that the city's construction projects do provide opportunity for generating community benefits through including local contractors and local workers in completing the work. That's a, a strong component of, you know, what we can do in addition to sort of getting the infrastructure reinvestment as uh, we just talked about with the meter replacement program. There is a way for us to, you know, have some benefits that, that go beyond that by, in that particular case, doing some really strategic workforce development um, and providing some opportunities for uh, long-term employment for a, a number of people, training of uh, unskilled labor and then bringing those folks to a place where they have a skill set that can be marketed to any, but any uh, entity that has meters, and there are lots of them in our world that we live in. And the second one is that um, that the, the analysis prevent, presented by staff, you know, makes it clear that we have a hard time filling certain kinds of our ongoing operating positions, not just the ones that are related to uh, specific kinds of construction projects, but both the uh, wastewater utility and the water utility have uh, major operating facilities that are complicated. They have a lot of electrical and mechanical elements to them. And both the uh, public works director and I have continuously, you know, struggled to fill key uh, skilled trade positions that are necessary for us to continue to reliably and sustainably manage these massive infrastructure facilities that produce these massively important 
uh, essential services for our community. So the idea here would be to figure out how to uh, utilize workforce development strategies, particularly in, in this particular situation, uh, the, the pre-apprenticeship programs uh, as a way of beginning to focus on um, the strategic development of some of these key uh, kinds of skill sets um, and uh, creating opportunities for both local hire and uh, pre-apprenticeship programs moving on to the formalized apprenticeship programs. And then uh, another, another um, sort of reality just based on the analysis that was provided about the characteristics of the county's construction labor workforce, a lot of the larger projects we have are likely to be awarded to contractors from outside the area because we don't have contractors here with the, uh, the scale of experience on the kinds of projects that we're often talking about or they're already booked up and have other work to do so they don't you know, end up uh, working on our projects. Um, there, but there are some substantial opportunities for us to figure out how to partner um, local general con local contractors of special skills, electricians, uh, others, for example, uh, with some of the larger contractors that would come in, and there's more we can do to facilitate making that happen. Um, so the first, uh, first of the other recommendations, the two are to, um, you know, have the council consider uh, use developing or giving staff direction to develop a PLA enabling strategy. And um, the idea here would be to adopt an enabling ordinance and then to um, direct the staff to, uh, you know, come up with the terms and conditions criteria for the appropriate project selection that would meet the key finding on, you know, the benefits that uh, the projects have to produce and uh, the selected projects have to, be, have to produce in order to um, implement them via a PLA. And next, the next one is to um, create some sort of thresholds uh, that would uh, maximize the potential for benefits uh, from the PLA to be uh, produced. For, for example, a larger size projects are probably better than smaller size projects. A construction schedule, a longer construction schedule creates more opportunities for apprentices that would be involved in these projects to actually get experience that would be important to them in making you know, the pathway through the, the multi-year apprentice problem, uh, pro programs that they're involved in to get them to the journeyman level and then being able to um, have that skill set and the higher wages that are opportune, uh, that are associated with that higher level of skill set. And then um, really to try to maximize the potential for there to be multiple skilled trades, because again, this gives us an opportunity to bring apprentices in on these various uh, types of skilled trades. And again, it's a leveraging of the basic opportunity. And then finally on this strategy, the idea would be for the uh, direction from the council to staff to negotiate a template agreement with the Monterey Santa Cruz County's Construction Building Trades Council that could be used when an appropriate project is identified and that meets these other terms and conditions that have been described. In addition, the staff is recommending that the council consider um, directing staff to move forward with the community benefit strategies that is really focused on workforce development and um, trying to leverage the opportunities for engagement of local construction trades um, and contractors uh, in city projects. So the first item on this list would be uh, find a way to um, facilitate information exchange between local construction related businesses and the city's main sort of bigger uh, contracts that are going to go forward. So there's an opportunity for sort of a, a matching up of some of the local providers with the um, with the larger providers that might be coming in from out of the area to bid on some of these projects. The second part is to um, you know look for opportunities to create that information exchange um, and to you know find that to support that kind of um, matching up of that subcontracting. Uh, I think there's some really good opportunities there. 
And then um, really one of the key, I think, uh, outcomes of the staff's analysis has been that really we need to work on the pre-apprenticeship uh, element to start at the beginning of the process to identify uh, local residents who might be interested in this kind of work to help them understand what the opportunities are and to find our partners in our community, whether it's uh, schools, whether it's uh, labor organizations, other non-labor organizations, to develop uh, and find opportunities to uh, advertise and engage local residents in these pre-apprenticeship programs, which help them to then identify the opportunities to move into the formalized apprentice training programs. Um, and then also to work with local labor entities and others to increase the participation of local residents in strategically identified apprenticeship programs. These are, as is described in the staff report, a uh, set of key skills that are necessary both uh, for in the construction trades but also in our operational needs, uh, electricians, mechanics, instrumentation workers, utility maintenance technicians. Some of these aren't existing apprenticeship programs, but I think there are opportunities for us to work together with a variety of uh, parties, including entities like the Santa Cruz County Workforce Development Board, uh, the labor entities, other interests, to really find a way to develop uh, these kinds of uh, apprenticeship programs and to make sure that our local folks have the information that's necessary for them to uh, understand the opportunity to engage in these kinds of uh, workforce development for themselves and professional development for the individuals. Um, and with that, I will um, sort of turn it back to the council to, that's an overview of the recommendations from the analysis and be happy to take your questions. I know that um, the public works director and the economics director, development director are certainly on the, um, on the call, so you can also direct your questions to them. Thank you very much. Thank you for that presentation. And I just want to, you know, um, to add how much I appreciate the outreach that's been conducted, um, especially, you know, trying to identify ways that we can improve workforce development. Uh, I will say that um, um, I wish I'd had a chance to weigh in a little bit before. I wasn't able to attend, so council members are aware, I wasn't able to attend um, agenda review when this item was placed on the agenda, but council member Brown and I have met with um, staff and we're working with um, members of the building trades and the unions to provide an opportunity for the unions to weigh in because um, they uh, had expressed a desire and wanted to weigh in on our decision. That meeting is actually set for next Tuesday, and so I just want to um, express my caution with moving forward with taking action today because the unions haven't had a, an opportunity to weigh in on what's been put before us. So I'll open it up to other questions if council members have them, but just wanted to let folks know that uh, there has been a meeting set with the unions to discuss this and discussion of the recommendations, and I think it'll be you know, in our best. I think it'll be good if we uh, had that discussion with them prior to taking any action. But I'll open it up to council members and then to the public, and we can circle back for action deliberation. With that, uh, Council Member Matthews, I'll let you start us off. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the staff for the breadth of this report, and this, I think, is responsive to the direction we gave the last time we considered this, which was to give us a bigger picture of our local workforce and the opportunities, um, both for workforce development and for project labor agreements. And I really appreciate the structure of this. I just have to say this publicly, um, uh, looking, first of all, at the, the context of what are our goals in doing this, um, the, the key findings part, what's the legal framework, what are the opportunities that are presented. Then the second part is considering a PLA strategy. And the third part, which is, Rosemary has mentioned this in her comments uh, uh, repeatedly, uh, as has Public Works. The, the, we have a lot of potential within the city operation to reach out to the workforce development 
uh, resources in our community and provide those kind of uh, workforce um, entry level and advancement opportunities. So th just the big picture on this, I thought was, uh, was really good. I don't have questions right now, but I would be prepared to make a motion when the time comes. And I, I, should, I should add, I think the whole discussion with the um, Central, uh, with the Building and Trades Council um, is set up. You have that in gear. And that's really intrinsic in part of number two here, um, initiate the discussion for a framework. Thank you. Um, well, I was going to save my comments until afterwards, but since we started going down that road, I'm just going to uh, agree with Mayor Cummings about the uh, timing and sequencing of considering this today. I do abs I very much appreciate the work that's been done by staff and really laying this out um, in a clear way for us and thinking about all of the opportunities that can come from, you know, continuing to engage in this conversation. Um, I, and I'm also prepared to make a motion. It may have to be a substitute, but uh, I, my question is um, for, I think for Tony about the, so the, the kind of the findings on the legal analysis um, indicating that, you know, we'd have to demonstrate uh, that some of these um, benefits might uh, be, might occur through a project labor agreement. They seem very um, uh, hard to verify, or difficult to verify based on, you know, cause some of this is about projection. For example, saying we can only do this if it will um, support uh, timelier uh, project completion. How, like, how would we know that? I mean, it's, those are those are pretty subjective and variable depending on projects. So, I guess I just um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on if we were to uh, move forward with these this particular component, how that would work, or how you see that um, evolving. Well, I, I mean, I think the way the staff has lined out this this process. Uh, part of what would need to be undertaken as um, the council considers adoption of an ordinance that um, specifies the, the criteria uh, under which a project, a labor agreement would be appropriate. Um, ultimately, it's an evidentiary issue, but the council's findings are accorded some deference in a, in a, in a determination of that sort. Um, but it has to be based on some objective standards. And, um, and, and so hopefully as we move forward with this process, um, we'll have a, a broader discussion and, and develop uh, criteria that can be supported with, with some backup uh, evidentiary basis. Thank you. Councilmember Byers. Thank you, um, Mayor. Um, in, in going, reading it all, and it was so new to me. Uh, I think there have been discussions, but it was uh, took a couple readings. But uh, obviously, the staff did a really good job in talking to the businesses and contractors. Now I just heard that, and I, it was lacking any mention of um, our building trades, our unions. So now I just heard that you have a meeting set up, but it hasn't happened. So it seems to me that's critical to look at the whole picture, the big picture, I should say. So I don't know whether uh, the council and, and uh, the leaders in this situation uh, see continuing it until after you've had that discussion and it becomes part of the agenda item. I think it's just, uh, it's, it's a big lack. It's just a big hole in the in the report. So I guess I'm putting out there that I would be will, more than willing to uh, move that we continue this, um, in fact, I'll turn it into a formal motion, that this be, uh, uh, see, I guess, a, put, um, put in for um, the next agenda item after we've had a report from the building trades. I'll, I'll just point out that since we haven't gone to the public, we can't take action yet. Okay, okay, hold that motion, okay. Well, glad to do. 
um, Council Member the Vice Mayor Myers and then Council Member Watkins. Yeah, I, I guess um, my qu my question is, um, well, you know what? I think I'd just rather wait and hear from the public. Um, I'm a, a little bit confused on w where we're at, so I think I'll hold my questions to, until after the the public. Thank you from hearing from the public. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Watkins. Yeah, I um, I just have a question, and maybe it's for you, Mayor, and then for you, Rosemary, if you want to add. I was just a little confused by your statement, Mayor. Did you say that you had a meeting with the trades, or was that with the staff meeting, or how is that um, related in terms of what the next step or missing step was? And then uh, I don't know if, Rosemary, you want to weigh in on sort of your anticipation around uh, moving this as your research kind of um, played out. Um, so the, it's my understanding that the meeting with the building trades that was then set up and was uh, discussed for a little while to be set up um, was really to focus on the workforce development opportunities, which I think are, from my perspective, a little separate, um, particularly the pre-apprenticeship sort of start at the beginning element of this that seems to me to be a critical element of moving forward. So uh, the, um, I, I guess the comment by uh, Councilman Byers related to the business outreach is uh, a comment that I would uh, respond to just a little bit, just uh, to put the, in context uh, why the labor site isn't in here, I guess, to the extent that it isn't. Um, was to was the council specifically asked us to um, reach out to the local business community and uh, get their feedback because we had noted as early as the initial discussion on this in uh, January of this year that really that we hadn't heard from that side of the the issue. We had uh, seen from the labor reps and heard from the labor reps at the January 28th meeting. Uh, what their proposals and concerns were. And Mark Dettel and I did have a meeting with uh, the president of the Building Trades Council at the end of February. And so uh, the, apart from the business uh, input that the council specifically asked us to include, this project, this, the staff report didn't explicitly didn't include the, you know, the various pros and cons of either project labor <laughs> in part because that wasn't the remit that we thought we had. It was to tell you what the situation was so that you could understand the degree to which the, the purposes, for example, the goals that are identified could be achieved by various different approaches. Okay. And then one last question for clarification. So the meeting that you have planned is something that you're also attending, Rosemary, is that correct? Mark and I are both attending along with uh, the mayor and uh, Councilmember Brown, as I understand. I, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I believe the city manager also. And I'll just say, you know, along with workforce opportunities and workforce development, and that's a, that's a big purpose of bringing forward the community workforce agreement to project labor agreements. And so um, having that discussion, and I think that the, as we've been discussing this item in addition to working with um, the business community, I thought you know a big part of the direction as well was also really trying to work with the um, labor unions and labor folks to figure out what's going to be, what can work for you know both labor and the city to kind of try to get to this win-win situation where we get something that works for everyone. And currently, I think that it's worth us discussing further with the unions some of the thresholds that have been put in place to get some clarification on that um, and, you know, really get to something that's actually going to work, you know, in favor of both the city and with the unions. And I think that it is critical to have them involved in the conversation because unions are one of the one voices that workers have. And so, you know, if we have the Chamber of Commerce weighing in, if we have the, um, the um, you know, the, the building companies weighing in, um, it's really important that the workers have a voice in the conversation as well. Okay. 
and that's you know why I feel like it's really critical that we meet with the union reps, we talk to them about you know what, what's before us in a way that's you know, constructive, that's timely, so it's not just two-minute comments. That we actually can have a substantive conversation before we make a very big decision that has um, impacts on our workforce. So I just wanted to put that out there as well in terms of my concern with moving forward today. If there's no further questions from council members or comments from council members, um, we did have two um, people who reached out for extra time. I'm not sure if they're on the call. Uh, the one person is uh, Justin White from Santa Cruz County Business Council and Christian Bacia uh, with, with Slatter Construction. I think what we'll do is when you are called on or um, when you're allowed to talk, please let us know by stating your name and you'll be given four minutes. And with that, I'll open up public comment. So first caller, um, Mr. Smalley, you're on the line. Hi, my name is Rod Smalley I'm with Operating Engineers Local 3. How are you doing today? Great. So the reason I'm calling in today is the letter that was sent out. It's kind of disturbing. If you were making a loaf of bread, why would you leave half the ingredients out? We know that we have a training center. We have a pre-apprenticeship program for Santa Cruz County, Monterey County, San Benito County. And we're open to all. So I kind of don't understand why we're trying to make bread with only half the ingredients. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, so that's all the time I'm gonna take because there's other people that really wanna talk. Uh, but if you're gonna make a loaf of bread, make sure you have all the ingredients. I think you're on the right track there, Mayor. Thank you. And for members of the public who um, would like to comment on this, again, I'd just like to let you know that now's the time uh, to call in. And once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And after you've raised your hand, uh, when you're called on, you'll be asked to unmute and you'll be given in two minutes. So again, if you've called in to, uh, to comment on this item, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And I'll go to the next caller. Is that me? Yeah, this is this is Sean Hebart. I'm the senior field rep for Carpenters Local 505 here in Santa Cruz County, and um, I'm also on the local Carpenters Training Committee. I'm also a trustee for the Training Committee for all of Northern California, and I'm a member on the Workforce Development Board for Santa Cruz County. Um, so far be it for me to uh, accuse staff of not doing their homework on this, but no one has contacted me in any respect on this outside of uh, conversations I've had with council members. And uh, so I didn't have a lot of time to do a lot of research on this, but I took about 20 minutes to go through the list of respondents for the survey. And so I just checked to see if they met the bare minimum requirements for doing business under uh, on for the city of Santa Cruz, PLA or no PLA. I'm just looking, we're looking for local people, that's our that's our threshold. So if we look at local contractors who are registered and able to legally do public works and have a business license in Santa Cruz County, we have a fantastic 20 pages of responses from these people. But of the 40 people on this list, seven of them meet that threshold, and only five have employed apprentices in the last five years. So let's keep this straight. We're fundamentally about workers in this project. We're talking about training, their benefits, and their wages. And now we have the results in. The the foxes are clearly anti-hen house. Who would have guessed? We have responses from as much as 400 miles away, and I'm not going to respond to Mr. Christian's characterization as us, of us as divisive bigots, as he clearly 
actually Googled Santa Cruz and thought that that would play here. But I'm just very, very disappointed in putting this out as data, and I'm making little air quotes when I say data, because this is not the way we do research to make decisions about public policy. Thank you. Yep. All right, next caller. Yeah, hi, this is Garrett Phillip. Uh, on January 28th, Emmanuel Panero, the CEO of the local building trades rep, said he provided and promoted project labor agreements to the city which found objections by some staff departments relating to emergency or special technical projects. He ripped non-union labor, the representatives, and non-union contractors for several minutes in his speech. He finished with, I quote, I know a lot of council members are unappreciated, but I guarantee you're passing the POA. Also, community workforce agreement will not go on unappreciated, unquote. I wonder if he was talking about political contribution appreciation. It would be in the interest of transparency and important public knowing today whether any of you who are running for future office has accepted or will be refusing if offered any monetary appreciation by unions for your future campaigns should you be voting on this union favoritism agenda item. It would appear in the construct of these agreements, all labor, union and non-union, would have to go through the unions to find work on such projects. While this skirts the absolute technical deprivation of people to find work who do not want to join a union, in practice I suspect their rights to individually bargain with prospective employers without union interference would be compromised, their rights then damaged. It is not in the interest of fair competition or the public pocketbook to erode free trade with such agreements. You have already made it possible to combine all aspects of a project to put out a complete bid, and as far as I know, are not required to take the lowest but lowest responsible bid. There is nothing that proves union PLAs are a necessary factor in obtaining this lowest responsible bidder, and no assurance PLAs in practice won't operate counter to that fiduciary duty of yours, getting value for public monies. What we have here is union reps wanting special government favors give us preferential work. Am I missing something? The idea of hiring local just because someone is local is not free market logic, but for practical reasons, common construction workers are in fact local or within commuting distance. Many workers commute and do not live in Santa Cruz. Many that live in Santa Cruz commute and work elsewhere. You would not apply this logic to them and should not here. Of course, non-union workers can also be local. Santa Cruz should not be a member-only country club for union workers. Bye. Hello? Hello. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Welcome. All right. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Cummings and me members of the Santa Cruz City Council. My name is Joe Lubis. I am a local resident and taxpayer. I am very disappointed to learn that the City of Santa Cruz is considering a project labor agreement that will naturally drive up the cost of public works projects for taxpayers. Such agreements have indeed pro been proven disastrous. Locally, at the Santa Cruz Metro Transit District Metro Base project, six of eight bidders were unresponsive. The project bid on September 12th, and it was awarded three months later. The life of project budget increased from 27.3 million to 29.4 million. The completion date was two years past contracted completion date. Furthermore, the Salinas Chamber of Commerce case study at Hartnell College in Mo the Monterey County market demonstrated that a PLA will result in fewer local jobs, not more. Without project labor agreements, according to this study, 56% of the money spent stays in the local economy. With PLAs, only 10% does. Nearby, the, with the city of Watsonville, with its F Airport Freedom Trunk Sewer Replacement Project, valued at $3.26 million, um, came in at $2.9 million. However, this, that bid was deemed unresponsive. Despite there being four other bidders, the winning bid came in at $4.2 million, which was 988000 or 30% above the estimate. Also, there is the Manana Lane Sanitary Sewer Project. Valued at $1.2 million, it only had two bidders, each were higher than that estimate. The quote-unquote low bid was $1.4 million. 
Change orders have increased the, pro the price of the project to $1.9 million, which itself is 50% higher than the original value. On a larger scale, uh, with the... Yeah, on a larger... On a larger... This is uh, Paul Bruno, one of the owners of Monterey Pence Engineering. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, I did send a letter uh, to each of the council members. I hope you had an opportunity to see it. Um, I do want to comment that uh, the contractor survey, I believe uh, an in-depth review of that survey, you know, will clearly let out some concerns and pitfalls of implementing a project labor agreement. I do appreciate the outreach and the opportunity we were given to respond to the survey. Um, our company does work for the city of Santa Cruz. Um, we have employees who live in the county, um, and, and someone said that employees do commute. We have some that commute here to Monterey to work in this area. We have some that commute from, you know, there back and forth. So, so when you talk about local construction workers, um, generally local means within 35 or 40 minutes of uh, primary office. So our employees do work in Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Benito counties. I consider them all local because they all circle amongst the, uh, the various cities in that area. So appreciate the opportunity to work. Um, my letter speaks for itself. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, this is Nicole Gehring with Associated Builders and Contractors, Northern California Chapter. We serve our members and apprentices in Monterey and Santa Cruz and San Benito counties. Um, we are heavily involved in our pre-apprenticeship programs with our community partners, such as the Salvation Army and Parole and Probation, and we would like to extend the same uh, opportunities and trainings in Santa Cruz County. Uh, some of the people that we've been able to change and transform lives include Eileen Gutierrez, a mother of six who went from homelessness to a career in construction. She fell on hard times and is getting back up and recently graduated from our construction leadership training program. Santos Torres is another example. He ran with the wrong crowd, uh, was in jail, and now, you know, has changed his life and is getting a fresh start. And our members are hiring these people and putting them to work and also putting them in our apprenticeship programs, again, serving their county for over 20 years. Under a project labor agreement, these people would not be able to work on projects in their hometown and, and in their city. So we would urge you to let your community Let's help you build your workforce in your community and let your community workforce build your community. Let's not, um, you know, pick winners and losers by different groups. Um, labor, I saw in your staff report that you want to negotiate a PLA with the Monterey County uh, Santa Cruz Building Trades Council. There are other entities out there that also do project labor agreements, and they are happy to be ones that are inclusive and, and that um, incorporate the entire diverse workforce in the area and also help recruit future people people into the, into the um, trade. So we would like to work with you on solutions that are beneficial for everyone, including all apprentices and all workers, because under a PLA, the local workforce would lose their money. A painter, for example, on a 2,000-hour project would lose roughly $25,000 of his benefit, and that's not mutually beneficial for the worker. So I would urge you to um, work with all groups to recruit and advise against PLA. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon. This is Ron Cheshire, Monterey Santa Cruz Building Construction Trades Council. 
Director of Training and Education. I've been a union representative for 30 years throughout the Monterey Bay area, and I've been heavily involved in apprenticeship training. <clears throat> we would definitely like uh, a time to sit down and uh, present you with uh, much needed information. Uh, I've read through uh, uh, the reports, and I'd have to say I'm slightly disappointed. The uh, legal analysis is invalid. Uh, project labor agreements do not have to be project specific. Uh, there are numerous counties, cities, public agencies which have blanket project labor agreements. They're all valid, they're all legal and such. And uh, so we would like to discuss that issue. Uh, I have also been working uh, in the Santa Cruz County area for over four years with the Workforce Development Board. We have a pre-apprenticeship program. We've graduated many uh, individuals that have moved on to construction careers, both union and non-union, okay? <clears throat> if uh, this virus wasn't uh, plaguing us at this time, uh, we have received funds from uh, the SB1 legislation, over $570,000, and uh, uh, are on our way to implementing uh, a better pre-apprenticeship program, but again, the virus has us down at this time. Uh, because I was uh, the CEO for the Building Trades Council throughout the two-county area, I want you to know that last year before I retired, I contacted the Department of Apprenticeship Standards. There were a total of uh, 383 apprentices in Santa Cruz County. Only 20 of them came from non-union programs. 363 were from joint apprenticeship programs, which are union. So again, we would like to present you with the information so you can make a better decision. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cummings and City Council, this is Casey Byer from the Santa Cruz Chamber of Commerce. I'll make my uh, comments very, very brief as we have another person that's going to speak to this issue specifically. I want to, want to thank Rosemary uh, Menard and her staff for her due diligence in putting a report together. And I also want to acknowledge the input from uh, a number of contractors and home builders in the area who, who were committed to a survey. It's an attachment for in your, uh, in your packet. Uh, I'm thoroughly kind of uh, disappointed a lot of the uh, information is being misconstrued by the labor community. Uh, it was the labor community that came to the mayor back in January that asked this item to be placed on the council. There was a very, very vocal debate uh, during that council meeting and it was asked for this, the city staff to come back for further report. Uh, point being in that report was a request by the council to include information from the community and from the labor community. Uh, we uh, proceeded to meet with the staff and provided as much input as we thought was appropriate and I think that it, it reflects in the particular pa package that you have before you. And finally, uh, the attachment to the Beacon, Beacon Economics report specifically shows that in Santa Cruz County and in, 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 the, in the central coast of the tri counties that there is a lack of skilled workers whether they're union or non-union. What we're asking you to do is take a look at the merit-based employers, the contractors that are in the county within the region and if you're going to go down the PSA out, uh, a PLA route, you should include them in the discussions uh, out, uh, to simply put a PSA that is labor intense and labor union orchestrated will shut out many, many eligible and qualified construction companies from doing business with the city. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay, it looks like uh, the next person up to speak is Justin White with the Santa Cruz County Business Council who requested four minutes. Good afternoon, everybody, and <clears throat> thank you, Mayor Cummings and the entire city council for allowing me this extra time. I'm gonna jump right into it. 
My name is Justin White. I'm the CEO of K&D Landscaping. I'm a second-generation business owner, uh, past resident of the city of Santa Cruz, now in the county of Santa Cruz. I'm the California Landscape Contractor Association Chapter President. I sit on the board of many nonprofits, including the Business Council and Santa Cruz County Parks, Friends of Santa Cruz County Parks. Uh, K&D is currently the Business of the Year awarded by the Pajaro Valley Chamber for our community beautification projects, and I've been active advocate in our community for economic disadvantaged workers and for the everyday entrepreneur. By passing this PLA, you're going to be excluding the 92 employees that work at K&D Landscaping from working on future city projects. For the last 30 years, my mother and father, Kendall and Don, have worked tirelessly to create a strong relationship with the city so we can work on many projects. We've, we've completed hundreds of projects with the city, and by passing this PLA, you're going to be excluding K&D from participating in future projects. You're not only excluding K&D, but you're excluding all non-union companies from participating on future projects. I don't think that that's going to improve the local opportunities for our residents and for our local employees of our companies to work for the city. Now, I'm not against the union. I think the union provides great resources for many trades, but why exclude non-union contractors? Why would you make a PLA agreement that requires all companies to hire workers from a union hall? You may not know this, but landscaping is not a union-recognized trade. We actually do not have a union. We fall into what's called the laborers union, and basically it's general construction labor. So whether we're putting in imp or grading, we're putting in irrigation valves, no matter what, it's the same general laborer. I have certified irrigation techs that have studied for 20 to 30 years to become certified and to be the level that they're at today. There is no construction labor that is going to be able to install material at the skilled level that they are able to install. By passing this PLA, you're excluding those people who have spent the last 20 to 30 years of their life dedicated to the landscape trade from working on your projects. The DIR and prevailing wage requirements are great. The staff at the city and the building planning departments are great. What is in place right now is working very well. I do not understand the reason for more red tape, for more complication. From a contractor's standpoint, if you think adding more red tape and more complication to the bidding process is going to reduce the cost, that is completely wrong. More red tape equals more cost. Not only that, but you're excluding a large percentage of the employees and contractors that are able to bid on these projects. When you have less competition, your prices go up. There's only two landscape companies that are union in this area, which means instead of having seven to eight bids for the landscape trade, you're only going to have one or two because not all of those companies are going to be at bidding every job. Now, I'm speaking very specifically to my company and to the landscape industry because it's what I know. I know PLAs because the city of Watsonville recently passed a PLA that has impacted our business greatly with the city of Watsonville. And you can talk with the city folks in Watsonville on how the PLA has worked for them. It has driven up costs of many construction projects and public works projects they have gone out to bid. I don't understand why passing a PLA is in the best interest of our local residents and our local companies. 80% of local companies are non-union that currently work for the city. You're telling them that they are not qualified and they do not treat or pay their employees good enough to work for your city. I please, I challenge you to ask around your city hall and your city employees. Ask them about K&D land. Ask them about Ask them about MPE, on you companies who are no longer going to be able to work for them and no longer been, going to be able to bid projects. Again, thank you for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, next member of the public. Hello? Hi there. Uh, my name is Robert Singleton. Um, uh, thank you, Mayor and Council Members, and thank you, staff, for uh, putting together support and for considering this item today. Um, I would definitely encourage the Council uh, to move forward today with some kind of item or some kind of action. Um, you know, this has been a long time coming. We first started discussing this item back in January, as Casey Byer mentioned, and then action was put forward uh, to try and get this back on the agenda in March. It's now been uh, uh, 
four months, and we've done extensive outreach in that time to uh, our local contractors, um, both union and non-union, and have incorporated them into part of this. Uh, essentially, the, uh, what the feedback we've gotten from a lot of our contractors is that this is a solution in search of a problem. You know, staff didn't put forward the proposal to move forward the PLA. It was the union-backed candidates who sit on city council who wanted to get this going. I also really don't appreciate the, the person who claimed that our survey that was sent out to contractors is somehow invalid because we actually took the survey, the survey respondents, the pool that we sorted from was all city contractors, both past and present and those expressing interest in future city contracts. So there are local contractors who are interested in doing local work. Um, I also want to make sure that we are clear that we can re realize a lot of the community benefits and a lot of the optimal outcomes that are the impetus for pursuing a PLA without a PLA through a community benefit strategy that is robust and I think staff is pursuing that strategy and has uh, given you action in your staff report to move forward with that. In terms of general problems that our contractors have expressed with PLAs generally, uh, because we have such a limited local workforce, uh, both union and non-union, um, as stated in your staff report through Beacon Economics, this would force invariably, uh, if you're going to only exclusively hire the union shops, non-local workers to be coming in and doing the work. Uh, I'll just conclude my comments there and saying we have a lot of other concerns, but I appreciate you hearing this item and hope you move forward. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members, and City Staff. This is Richard Markison, and I represent the Western Electrical Contractors Association, the Plumbing, Heating, Cooling Contractors of California, the Greater Bay Chapter of the American Fire Sprinkler Association, and the Independent Roofing Contractors of California, all contractor associations that sponsor apprenticeship programs. And, and one of the comments, and you've heard some excellent comments from uh, the community today about the Project Labor Agreement and the problems with it, but one of the comments that struck me in particular were, Ms. I believe it was Mr. Cheshire who suggested that because the unilateral programs, the, the non-signatory, the non-union apprenticeship programs are in the minority, that it's okay under the project labor agreement to discriminate against them. Is, is this the policy that the city of Santa Cruz wants to pursue, a policy of discrimination against state-approved apprentices because they're not affiliated with the union? This is the wrong direction to go. We would certainly encourage you that if you do decide to pursue the project labor agreement, that you include members of the business community, that you include local contractors, that you include sponsors of apprenticeship programs to make sure that you are truly developing an agreement that benefits the entire community, not just a segment of the community that are associated with unions, but the entire community. And I just wanted to say that as a alumni of UC Santa Cruz, I hope that my former hometown takes the right steps is of inclusive negotiations to do a project labor agreement or a community workforce agreement that benefits everyone, not just a segment of society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next caller is Christian Pilichia. I'm sorry if I got your name wrong. Um, we requested four minutes from Slatter Construction for the Santa Cruz Chamber of Commerce. I apologize, can you hear me? Yep, good afternoon. Um, hello, I'm Mayor, City Council, and staff. My name is Christian Plekia, and I'm Vice President of Operations for Soda Construction. Today, I'm speaking on behalf of the Santa Cruz County Chamber and our nearly 600 members, and specifically on behalf of Slater Construction, a well-known local Santa Cruz construction company that has been doing business here since 1986. The Slater family has lived in Santa Cruz for over four generations, and they've been running their construction company for over 35 years. One would be hard-pressed to find another contractor that has been involved with more Santa Cruz iconic structures 
than Slater Construction. From the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk to the Flatiron Building in downtown, from the Rittenhouse Building, which was the largest concrete pour in the history of Santa Cruz, to uh, Shakespeare in the Park, Slater Construction is deeply embedded in the history of Santa Cruz. Furthermore, after the Loma Prieta earthquake of 89, Slater Construction was integral in rebuilding downtown along with a multitude of homes and businesses throughout the county. We are a Santa Cruz company with Santa Cruz employees that contributes to a multitude of Santa Cruz nonprofits and other organizations other local organizations, excuse me. Uh, Slater Construction is against any form of project labor agreements, mostly because it is unfair for labor union organizations to dictate how a reputable merit shop contractor should conduct their business. I want to make it clear that we are not against unions, not at all. We are against uh, labor unions dictating how we conduct our business. In particular, what I would like to address today are uh, labor unions' requirements placed upon merit uh, shop contractors' workforces within a PLA. For example, most PLAs require that merit shop contractors use only 20% of their workforce and hire the remaining percent of the workforce from union halls. Slater Construction would never agree to using only 20% of our workforce. If one of the main objectives of this agreement is to employ local workers, how would a stipulation such as this achieve that goal? All of our Santa Cruz employees work on all of our Santa Cruz projects. If we were to work under a PLA, we would be forced to hire from a union hall where employees can come from anywhere in the state so long as they are recruited from that quote unquote local union hall. Furthermore, Slater's reputation is based on our leadership, the people we hire, and the culture that we have created over the years. Why would we, or any other merit shop contractor, agree to only using 20% of our workforce? That would be similar to me asking city council to use only 20% of their staff and hire uh, the remaining 80% uh, from tent work agencies. Uh, how efficiently would your organization run? Uh, you might be hiring trained and qualified workers, but they would be clueless as to how Santa Cruz City Council runs its operations. Um, if you wouldn't agree to those terms, why would you want us to? In conclusion, when it comes to some of the largest public works projects, union companies will most likely get them anyway, since they tend to be larger than merit shop contractors. Also, all public work projects already have city staff oversight and prevailing wage in place. Therefore, what problem are we trying to solve? If large public works projects will mostly like, most likely be awarded to large union contractors, and if you have prevailing wage and staff oversight in place, why do we need this extra layer of a project labor agreement? Uh, PLAs are not good for merit shop contractors, they are not good for local taxpayers, and they are not good for local employees. In turn, I implore City Council to vote no on project labor agreements, both now and forever. Thank you, Mayor, staff, and City Council. Thank you. Next. Okay, next caller. Council, 
Manny Pinero, CEO, Monterey, Santa Cruz County Building Construction Trades Council. Give you a couple bullet points here that I've observed on staff's opinion regarding accomplishing city goals. Now, much of the report deals with the city's existing local hiring policy in Santa Cruz, local construction workforce. It implies that too many local residents working in construction. I'm not sure why this is relevant to this discussion. I'd like to emphasize that working with local unions and their hiring halls will maximize the use of local labor more than it's already done under the local hiring policy. Union apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeship programs like the Workforce Development Board are vastly superior to the non-union programs. Regarding pre-apprenticeship programs, they are non-union affiliated entities popping up calling themselves pre-apprenticeship programs to get grant funding. This does little or nothing to actually get local people into the apprenticeship programs. We should not enable them, particularly not the detriment of high quality programs. Adopting the PLA, partnering with the Building Trades Council, greatly improve the city's contracting pool and in turn will discourage unscrupulous contractors from bidding on city projects. The city will not need a separate community benefit strategy, strategy if it adopts the PLA. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll try uh, last four digits of your phone number, 3914. Please unmute your phone. There you go. Hello? Good afternoon. Hello? Yeah, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, uh, this is Pedro Sauce. Um, I'm a local electrical contractor here in Santa Cruz. And I just want to express my concern about the PLAs. Uh, I am a non-union contractor. Uh, usually, uh, I do a lot of public works. Um, I do have, like, for example, four apprentices that they work and live in Santa Cruz. If you guys decide to pass the PLAs, um, I will be not able to build on jobs because I will have to be pretty much forced to join the union and use their labor force. So I will be not be able to use my own apprentices. Um, so uh, I think the, the PLA just represents a lot of big companies, uh, but it doesn't represent the small company, the local company. The people that we live here, uh, we spend our money here, and we, we have to, you know, uh, live here on this beautiful place. Uh, I think the PLAs always drive the price up. It's never, it's never a fair competition because usually PLAs brings big, big companies. Um, so please, uh, I urge you to say no to PLA. Thank you. Okay, next caller. Good afternoon. Hi, this is Amy with KND Landscaping. So I am the commercial department leader here at KND Landscaping, and if this PLA is passed, KND will not be allowed to bid or work on future projects in Santa Cruz. We plead with you guys not to pass this PLA. This will exclude us and all of our coworkers, all of our people that live within this community from working within this community and beautifying it. We just hope that you take this into consideration. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you. If there's uh, other callers who would like to comment on this, if you press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, uh, once you've been unmuted, you will have two minutes to speak. Mayor and Council Members, uh, my name is Dick Johnson. I am the Chairman of the Labor Management Cooperation Committee uh, covering most of uh, California. The City of Hayward just or, or still in the process of building a $40 million library. On that $40 million library, just last week, our organization filed 10 apprenticeship complaints with the uh, state labor commissioner. There are either no apprentices on 1,000 hours of work or unsupervised apprentices. A PLA does not guarantee an apprentice for a program. The uh, Los Angeles Unified School District has published on their website under their labor compliance program uh, violations in the last three years, there's over 400 of them. Half of those are apprenticeship violations. And the total amount is over $2 million in assessed valuation, assessed uh, penalties to those contractors. The other area I'd like to address is an on time PLA. The PLAs that I am familiar with, such as uh, Santa Cruz Metro. Uh, the Salinas New High School, uh, as well as Hayward, all are a year and a half or more over the time that it was uh, scheduled to be completed. So if you're looking for apprenticeship, I think what you need in the city is a good outreach to your citizens and putting in an apprenticeship program for that city. There is an apprenticeship program available to the citizens, but uh, there's no participants. Plumbers and seam fitters apprenticeship training coordinator. We service Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. Um, There's a couple callers earlier that um, it's kind of disturbing to hear, uh, specifically talking about disadvantaged workers. Our apprenticeship program currently has a ratio of 7% women um, in the industry or in our program and 35 percent hispanic so we do service uh, disadvantaged workforce community also i had a question on on why will it exclude any non-union companies um, having a pla merit shops are invited to bid on plas and nothing is preventing them from from doing so um, and also to the k and landscaping i've told them this before ua local 355 covers uh, landscaping, underground piping, so give them a call. Uh, also, our apprenticeship program is in conjunction with the Tri-County Free Apprenticeship Program. Uh, we do have direct entry, and I have used that avenue to um, bring in uh, eight apprentices over the last three years. And it's a great asset for us, and it, and it works really well. Um, also, we do have apprentices ready available and willing to go to work. So um, PLA would only benefit um, those apprentices looking for jobs that are currently out of work due to various reasons. Um, I urge the city council to postpone the, the vote on this, this agenda item until after they hear what the building trades have to say next week. And I thank the mayor and council for the time this afternoon. Thank you. All 
Good afternoon. You're on the line. All right. Thank you. My name is Shane White, VP Operations at KD Landscaping. And I just want you guys to really consider the benefit of what you guys are trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish here. And I feel like the PLA is very against that ultimate goal of benefiting the community and the local contractors. And really just urge you guys to think about this overall of how this will affect the local economy and keeping the money local. The PLA is not going to do that. So I just really hope you guys consider all the factors here. And what we have right now is working well. The city of Santa Cruz is great to work with. And I just really hope you guys look at all the factors and appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, if there are any other members of the public who'd like to speak on this item who haven't already spoken, uh, now's the time to call in and please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand so that uh, you can uh, comment on this item. So again, if you haven't had a chance to comment on this item, please press star nine on your phone uh, and we will, um, you'll have two minutes to speak. number are 0369. Please unmute your phone and you'll have two minutes. digits of your phone number 4273. Please unmute your phone and you'll have two minutes. And again, if there are any other members of the public who'd like to speak on this item, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when you're prompted to be unmuted, please do so and you'll be given two minutes. So again, if the last four digits of your phone number are four, two, seven, three, please unmute your phone if you'd like to speak on this item. Now's the time, please press star nine on your phone. We'll give another minute. And if there's no other members of the public who'd like to speak on this item, we'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Okay, seeing no other members of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item, um, I'll bring it back to council. I just want to address um, a couple comments that were shared uh, with the public just for clarification, and which is that um, you know part of the reason why we're, we're having discussions or we're wanting to have discussions um, with many members of the community is to determine what would be appropriate for the city of Santa Cruz. And in many communities where, appeal, where project labor agreements or community workforce agreements have been employed, there are thresholds that determine when those agreements kick in. So I don't think it's true to say that we would be excluding all non-union um, companies for being able to bid on projects. It's that above a certain threshold, these kinds of agreements would kick in. And so I, I wanted to put out there that that is that it's not true, and that's why we're trying to have conversations with all members of the community. And at the current point in time, we haven't had 
Um, we haven't been able to have these discussions with the with the building and construction trades that are in our area, and so I think that's a big um, important thing to point out. And then I just want to also remind council members that we did earlier in the year receive a letter um, that the sheriff had sent out where he had applauded project labor agreements and how it had helped with them meet the you know building of the new facility on time. And I just want to make sure that everyone's aware of it. Um, there is experience within the county where project labor agreements have been beneficial for uh, county projects. And so, um, and again, I think the last thing I'll say is that uh, providing us with more time to meet with the unions can actually help for us to address some of the concerns we're hearing from the community and figure out, you know, what can be, you know, work best and try to find a win-win in this situation. So with that, um, I'll turn it back to you, Council. Actually, I did want, I did have one other question. Um, this was around uh, something that was in the agenda report regarding the local hiring apprenticeship provisions because it states that um, uh, these apprenticeship provisions are being implemented as routine part of the city's contracting, but unfortunately data to document the actual performance of contractors in meeting local hire goals or utilizing apprentices on city-funded construction jobs is not readily available. And so that's one of the things that I think is really critical because um, if we're, you know, talking about not going in this direction, we currently don't have any accountability mechanisms put into place to actually track uh, the local hire and the apprenticeship provision that is currently in place. So you know, I think it's important that as we're moving forward, you know, that we're having something that we can use to understand whether or not are we hiring locally, you know, are we hiring apprentices, and I think that this is a mechanism that could, you know, help with that. And so with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Council Member Byers, and then we have Matthews, Golder, Watkins, and Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Well, um, if anything, I'm, I'm more, uh, um, more looking forward to having continued this item. There were so many things raised, and I think by your meeting, along with staff, it's very important that staff and the trades union and um, council members all meet together because there were so many things raised that I think can get, you've just mentioned a couple, um, Mayor, uh, that will be sorted out and understood by all parties involved. So it seems, um, as was, I think it was the first speaker said, we've only got, I don't know, half the ingredients for a loaf of bread instead of all. So again, I would like to move that this item uh, be continued. Uh, I believe your meeting is uh, the 18th, correct. So it would be at, uh, um, if, if it seems appropriate by the staff, I think they ought to weigh in on this, uh, to the next council meeting, which is the second meeting in August, which I believe is the 25th, and I'm not sure. Anyway, I still move. I'll second that item. And I'd just also like to ask, make a motion that maybe we could have some flexibility on when it would come back so that you know, it could potentially come back as early as the first meeting and well, no later than the first meeting in September so that there's some flexibility if we need to do more outreach. Absolutely, uh, yes. To be scheduled, you know. Uh, council members Matthews and then Golder. My turn? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm really not in favor of postponing this. Um, uh, you know, this came to us early this year <laughs> with a very strong push. Um, it was postponed for more information, and I think we've gotten that. Um, most of the concerns that have been raised about the details of PLAs are, uh, would be discussed and resolved in the number two section of the staff recommendation, which is to pursue a PLA enabling strategy. And so uh, that remains uh, work to be done. Um, I think many of the speakers said functionally, it's the large projects that are gonna be major union projects anyway. Um, and so uh, there is written into this, uh, this, the recommendation for number two, pursuing a strategy. There is a threshold already suggested. I think, Mayor, you mentioned that in your comments. 
um, let's let's really focus on the bigger project. So um, I would actually uh, favor a um, a motion um, putting the staff recommendation. Uh, up for a vote with a couple of um, uh, suggestions, a, um, a couple of additional suggestions um, that would give a sense of direction for the conversations to take place. And um, so I guess we have a motion and a second um, on the floor. My uh, substitute motion would be to um, uh, uh, approve the recommendations of staff in next steps one, two, and three, with additions that is uh, uh, confirming the goals, the legal analysis, in, et cetera, the opportunities in number one, and the uh, workforce development, the direction to pursue workforce, uh, broad workforce development strategy as suggested in number three. In number two, I would suggest, I would include in my motion, increasing the threshold to $6 million, including uh, an additional item that the decision to enter direction, direction for developing a framework with the uh, uh, building uh, and construction trade. Um, the decision to enter into a project-specific PLA as the preferred strategy would require approval by the city council at the time of project approval. That would be in addition in the direction of the framework. Also, I would like to see included in the general direction for a framework that uh, it, uh, in, in order to develop uh, an adequate number of competent workers in the construction industry, contractors and employers, shall employ apprentices from any California state approved apprenticeship program serving Santa Cruz County in the respective trades. So um, those are just a few small additions to that item number two, but I would like to move this forward um, uh, basically as suggested in the staff report with those two additions. Motion. We have a motion, by, a substitute motion by Councilmember Matthews. I'll second that. Okay. So the substitute. I motion reiterate that. Yeah, the, the the substantive discussion of what would be in a PLA all remains to be done. Okay, so the substitute motion by Councilmember Matthews. Second, by Councilmember Myers. Um, Bonnie, were you able to capture that language? <laughs> I just sent Bonnie an email. Um, I think I did. Uh, minus, oh, thank you, Cynthia. Uh, I, I don't have the staff report in front of me, so I was going by what she was saying, but I think I pretty much captured it. Do you want me to share my screen? Yeah, I think that's helpful. It's pretty clunky, so sorry about that. Can I just ask a clarifying question? Point of order. Sure. Point of order. Uh, we are, we'll be voting on whether or not to vote on the substitute motion, right? To accept the substitute motion for consideration and not the substance of it. That's right. Thank you. Okay. Um, I see there are other council members who have their hands raised, so I just wanna acknowledge them before we move on voting. So Councilmember Golder, Watkins, Brown. So I um, agree with what Councilmember um, Matthew said, and I was prepared to second that as well. And because I was getting reached out to by groups starting in January, I feel like people have had sufficient time to weigh in on this, and it's August, and I'd like to move along. and. Um, my husband and I are both union members, and I have a lot of respect for what unions do to protect workers. But that being said, according to the staff report, we have a shortage of skilled labor in our workforce. And so if we don't have enough workers, union or non-union. I love the idea of working to build our local workforce capacity. And from my perspective, it would be a deterrent to our local workforce if we had a blanket PLA even. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with the, what was it, the 
the, thre the threshold, I think, in the staff report was $5 million, and I'm okay with the $6 million as well. But I think it would prohibit some companies for, that have been doing business with the city for years from bidding on future projects, and this might have some unintended cost consequences in, like, costing the taxpayers more in projects when we don't have the luxury of having extra money right now. And so um, I think working with union and non-union, we collaborate with the schools to ensure we get people into the trades. I support awarding contracts to companies that pay a living wage, um, are responsive, provide local jobs, offer apprenticeship programs, and can compete and get the jobs done under budget and on time. And um, I think it's just really, we really need to think hard, especially given the information we got this morning about the budget in the next few years, about um, it, you know, we're going to want as many bids as possible moving forward. And so I think we should move on with what's on the table before us today and vote on that. Okay. Council Member Watkins, Brown, and then Vice Mayor Myers. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just had a few comments and then I, I offer if, if Rosemary wants to add, but you know, really looking at the agenda report, I just really appreciate how it's, it's really based on results um, and it's results driven, but also really looking at the themes of interest and the goals and priorities around um, kind of the overall sentiment of the council and, and doing so really trying to balance what would work for Santa Cruz. So kind of, Reviewing the, the agenda report, really looking at how are we leveraging the opportunities for community benefits, um, stepping back and thinking about the long-term view, um, really thinking about how, one of the questions that spoke to me was, um, is there an opportunity, the, the question is, isn't, is there an opportunity to improve the current situation with respect to availability of the local workforce that can participate in this work? It is what steps can the city take to improve the current situation? And I felt like that, um, Given the various perspectives, this is a really uh, thoughtful way to move forward, and I particularly just will agree with what uh, Councilman Golder said, that there's so much potential to really build up our local workforce here in Santa Cruz and to move forward in a way that's inclusive of our resources here, I think really is about leveraging benefit uh, with this. So um, those are sort of just my takeaways, given um, how complex this can be. And of course, uh, offer if Rosemary has anything she'd like to add based on the discussion or the community input. I just, I just would like to make one additional comment here. And I, I think that, um, that Council Member Watkins raises uh, the question that's been a focus for me anyway as I've worked on this, and that is what are the results we're really trying to achieve. And I, and I guess that I would give you a concrete example of that in an action that you took earlier in approving the meter replacement program. There is a concrete example of how we have we have the ability to make a change in uh, the way we've done business historically and to improve both the infrastructure and the, the situation for uh, currently under, underemployed or uh, you know unemployed workers. And I think that's really what the opportunity is to produce results. I have no questions or problems of working with a whole variety of people to achieve that. And I think there are tremendous partnership opportunities with the various players who weighed in here today. And that's personally, from my perspective, how I'd like to see us be moving forward is to figure out how to make those partnerships work and to engage with everybody we can in whatever ways we can to achieve the results that we're all that we all want. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown. Yeah, I'm not going to support uh, consideration of the substitute motion. I am uh, I'm pretty dismayed that um, about the way this conversation is unfolding. I'm I'm dismayed that my colleagues are taking uh, the information they're receiving from the business community as fact and um, denying the input of. Uh, the Monterey Bay Central Labor Council, um, and I'm sorry, the Building and Construction Trades Council, who have been trying to get a seat at the table to have this conversation since January. Those conversations have been postponed. 
and um, I, I believe that they need to be had before making decisions. Um, Councilmember Matthews suggested all of the, you know, PLA-related matters would, would be for an ordinance or a project labor agreement would be uh, to be determined, and then at the same, right after that. Uh, made a motion to raise the minimum threshold. So that is not uh, leaving the door open for a conversation with the building trades uh, next Tuesday. That is bringing them a, a predetermined decision and saying, here, this is what we're gonna do. And so I'm, I'm just not, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with the findings. Some of them I am. I'm not even necessarily opposed to moving in the direction uh, discussed in the agenda report, and I do think there are, you know, some some real, uh, you know, possibilities for moving forward in those directions. They are not mutually exclusive from considering project labor agreement uh, a, that kind of strategy. So um, I can't support the motion. I I wish that we could have had this conversation after our meeting with the uh, Mo the Santa Cruz Monterey. Building Construction Trades Council, and um, we'll see where it goes. Thanks. Vice Mayor Myers, and then I'm actually going to pause for a quick break because I think we've been sitting for a long time, and uh, <laughs> my, uh, so I'll just move on with Vice Mayor Myers, um, and then I have a comment to make before we take a really short break. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, yeah, I just, I guess, I just have a couple of questions. I'm, I'm trying to sort of follow our process here. Um, Rosemary, I do have a, a question for you, Director Menard. Um, my understanding was that the, the construction um, building and trade council had been, had been, had been met with, with staff. Is that, is that? I'm, I'm just trying to kind of piece together. I'm hearing lots of different things. I, I understand that they were part of um, the staff discussion and the staff um, uh, sort of engagement with them as it was directed by council back in January 2020. Is that is that correct? I, I believe that's what was put in your in your report or in your uh, presentation. I just want to confirm that real quick. I, I want to, uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, the Public Works Director, Mark Edel, and I met with Manny Panero at the end of, uh, at the end of February. And then uh, obviously immediately after that, or pretty close on after that, the COVID situation resulted in a shutdown um, and the council made a decision to, uh, in April to, you know, postpone the, the item a little bit, and then we had a further conversation um, in the time frame of the early June meeting regarding um, whether or not this was coming back or to be further postponed, and the council's direction then was for it to come back. So I guess what I would say is we did have an initial meeting. Uh, we did not uh, get into the sort of negotiation process at that time. Uh, specifically at the June meeting, we were asked to come back with an analysis of, uh, of the bigger picture and uh, with, you know, some recommendations for the council to consider. And th among that was the idea that we could come back with a uh, recommendation related to public or to project labor agreement, but that the council specifically said then that was to come back later, assuming that they made, uh, that y'all made direction. Uh, at this meeting to tell us to go forward and negotiate something. So okay, that's thank you. Part of framework. Yeah, that, that, that was my recollection. And, and I'm just trying to understand, uh, Mayor and Council Member Brown, so the, the trades, um, I'm just trying to understand comments around not being able to meet. If, if, I'm just trying to understand, I don't know if that's a COVID related, we're now in August and then in June, back, so back in June, we knew that this was moving forward. So I'm just trying to understand um, June, July, August, just kind of, just trying to understand the, the, the context of what's happening here. Um, just trying to evaluate your request and, and I'm just trying to get more additional, maybe additional comments in terms of um, 
maybe to the extent of to why the the meetings weren't apparently weren't done I, I'm assuming by you guys with the council with the building trade council if I can speak to that if I remember correctly um, I think this came before us at the last meeting in June Sandy and I it was the first meeting yeah first meeting. it's on the staff report yeah um, Sandy and I were able to meet with staff and we discussed you know, a way to move forward that was you know, trying to be inclusive of the different people who were engaged in the conversations. We, at that meeting, also agreed with staff around really needing something that's gonna help develop our workforce and our community. And at that time, we had you know, uh, decided that we were gonna meet staff, council members, the city manager, with the building and construction trade and people from labor. Um, Sandy began reaching out to those folks and we sent out a poll to see when people were able to meet and the earliest date that we were able to meet initially was August 17th and then it was August 18th because of conflicts. So next Tuesday is the earliest that we were um, able to meet, which is why, you know, unfortunately if I had been at a gender reveal, I would have asked to um, not put this on the, on the agenda at this time and to delay it so that we could have that opportunity to meet with them. It came on the agenda and um, and because it's here, it was worth having the conversation. We've been receiving input from the public, but you know, as has been mentioned before, you know, we're trying to have an inclusive process. What we're asking for at this time is to revisit this after we've had a chance to have that conversation with the unions because um, if we had had that conversation before today, I think we'd be in a position to move this forward uh, but we haven't had that conversation and you know what we've seen in the staff report is a lot of outreach with businesses and contractors but we don't really have sense of you know what is the position on unions because you know i think our objective is to, to try to figure out what's the what's going to work best okay. for our community as a whole and without you know having being able to have a, a conversation with the unions and labor before we move forward i think that's a, a problem because we've heard from the non-union community but we haven't heard from the unions if, can I just add a really brief context, Mayor? The, um, in, in terms of a direct response to the why the delay, um, as we, so we had the conversation with, with staff and everybody seemed amenable to moving forward uh, with uh, setting up a meeting. The doodle poll that we got was for weeks that were, three, it was three weeks out. So, um, the, you know, for a variety of reasons, people's schedules, I'm not sure. Um, it just took that long to get the meeting uh, scheduled. And I'll, I'll also just mention that a lot of folks were on vacation during July, so bringing city staff together along with council members and the building trade was problematic for the people taking time off, so. Okay, th thank you, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I seconded the motion. Um, first of all, I just wanna thank um, the staff and uh, Director Menard. Uh, I know that you've been working hard on this. Um, I also wanna thank all the business owners uh, and uh, union representatives who are um, watching us uh, this afternoon and participating in this discussion. Um, I especially um, am glad that we were able to have both the Beacon, Beacon Economic work completed. Um, and I think I, I, I'm gonna echo much of what you've heard, um, it, which is, you know, we need to design a program that's going to work for our local workforce, and um, I uh, I think that we have provided a pathway to continue to explore um, what PLA may look like for the city of Santa Cruz. But I do share um, the interest in the you know the workforce development piece in this. Um, I think that I mean I have family members that work in the industry in the construction industry, it's, um, it's, it's known throughout the industry that Santa Cruz, you know, it, the workforce is not being developed um, that's gonna replace folks and we need to support our local companies to be able to have the opportunity to do that. Um, and so I think this, the workforce and community benefit approach is of great interest to me. Uh, I think there's a pathway included in this motion where uh, the PLA can be further explored 
but I do believe that, um, you know, there's been efforts made to, to basically try to move this along. I remember a very extensive um, conversation in June, in early June, on our priorities where, um, you know, there, there was, you know, very clear direction and, and uh, you know, to bring this back in, in August. And so um, I feel like uh, our, our staff has done it, their due diligence. I think, um, I know when the, the item was brought to the council back in January, it, was, it seemed very clear there had been quite a lot of um, conversations with, with uh, labor and the unions back then. So um, I'm supportive of the motion. I think uh, I think this. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm very interested in just moving ahead with the benefits that we can we can get out of this program, uh, and really the focus on our local workforce, which I think is is very important. And, and uh, uh, so those are my comments. I will be um, yeah, I'm supportive of the motion. Obviously, since I seconded it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask we take just a quick. Um, five minute break in case people um, they need to use bathroom or what have you. But just to give you my opportunity to stretch our legs because we've been sitting now for, I think, what's going on, um, <laughs> almost two hours, two hours, so three hours. So um, why don't we take a quick five minute break and come right back so we can finish with this item. Once council members are back, if you can turn your videos on so we can see you.
So again, once council members return, if you could turn on your video, that way we know that you're back. Um, we can go ahead and get started. And I think we're just waiting on our team, Councilor Watkins, at this point. I think Council Member Byers pretty much uh, summed up my uh, follow-up comments. I will say that I'll be making, uh, uh, I'll be moving amendments to the main motion when it looks like that's where we're going to go. But I will be offering amendments. Council Member Golden. So. To, to Council Member Byers' point, I think there's been, just in my short time on council, times when I would have rather had more time to research something, but when it's on the agenda, I, I, you know, I get, on Thursday, I get some days to have people reach out to me or I can reach out to people and get that information. And so I feel like, um, just with the breadth of what's been on the agendas, and that are going to be coming on the agenda, I feel like that is the urgency that we can't keep having these long, long, long meetings. And there is so many things that when we when we talked about what our priorities were that we haven't even addressed yet this year. And so with that, I think there's a little bit of a sense of urgency. And since staff did take the time and um, the labor unions could have reached out to any of us at any point since January. Like they, it wasn't like it had like they had to wait for it to get on the agenda. Like I said, I was being reached out to by business owners and contractors and both union and non-union um, people that I know in the community since January. And so 
so for that, I feel like I'm prepared to make a educated, you know, decision, which way I'll vote. Um, and then um, I just wanted, yeah, I guess that's, that's pretty much it. I, well, I, yeah, that's all I want to say. Okay, the other thing is the process. So what's the process now? That's why I'm a little confused. So are we going to vote on Catherine's motion to postpone and then no. what happens? No, 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 no. I'm a little confused. So the next step, well, I'll go to the attorney when the The substitute motion under your meeting guidelines when there's a substitute motion, the council first has to vote on whether to accept the substitute motion. And if it's accepted, then the council will vote on the substitute motion and the original motion will essentially wither and die on the vine. Thank you for clarifying that for me. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers and then Councilman Myers. Uh, yeah, I, thank you for the comments. Um, I, I, just want to clarify, and I'm just trying to look up a few things here um, as we're as we're doing this. Um, I I was at agenda review. Um, I was informed right before the meeting that the mayor was not going to attend. I did not um, have time to call the the mayor to um, check in with him. So I just want to be clear: I am not the person who put this on the agenda. <laughs> nor did I have any control about why it stayed there or didn't stay on the agenda. So um, I was asked, um, literally, I was informed about 15 minutes before the meeting started, the mayor wasn't able to attend. Um, so I was responding to a list um, that continues to always be developed and uh, is iterative as we work through various, um, various parts of the agenda. Um, and I guess I'm, what I'm trying to understand here is um, a little bit about the past history in terms of when this was supposed to be brought back. I remember a very long discussion on the night, um, and there was um, very clear uh, intent that this move forward as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, so I, I think that our staff was responding to that. and. Um, I, I think that I think that the work that was done is is satisfactory. Um, I mean, I don't know. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of people who have taken time out of their day to be part of the meeting today. Um, a lot of businesses are on the phone with us. Um, uh, I don't. I, I'm not quite sure how two weeks is going to make. A big difference, and I think I understand the meeting is uh, next week. Um, but there could have been a meeting on Friday if this was what was needed. So um, I I I, uh, I, tr I struggle with the conveyance that somehow we're forcing this down, you know, our colleagues' throats because we aren't. We're just trying to process uh, a request that has been on the books since last January, and we're trying to respond to a lot of different um, items that I agree, I think we need to move through, uh, and we have a lot of priorities that we're not getting to. So uh, I want to clarify a few of the comments made by my colleagues, and um, I'll uh, defer to the, next, to the next speaker, to the next council member in terms of other comments. Okay. Um, if I could just respond, um, I appreciate the perspective, but I, just, I do want to bring, you know, forward a few things that I think that are being overlooked, one of which is that um, when COVID hit, we pretty much dropped everything so that we would have shorter meetings, so that we weren't burdening staff, um, but we were really trying to focus on the pandemic response. That's a big reason why this has taken as long as it has. And we were trying to not, you know, give direction to staff to work on these types of items that were not a priority at the time. Um, it came back to us at the beginning of July. And again, I think, you know, the staff all the work that they've done in terms of outreach. Um, the reason why this meeting is important is because it is that missing piece of outreach that is critical for ensuring that everyone's voice is heard on this. So we reached out to those outreach done to the chamber. There was outreach done to the 
contractors and they've had an opportunity to weigh in and we haven't and we tried to get an opportunity to speak with building and construction trade sooner um, and we weren't able to get that as soon as we could and this is something that came out of meetings that Councilman Brown and I had with staff saying that you know we want to do as best for the community we really think this way forward but we want to have an opportunity to sit down with the unions as well with staff so we can all be in the same conversation so that we can all you know we council members can hear from staff and hear the concerns we can share with we can work with the unions and try to work something out that would be you know something we can bring forward and try to come to consensus on that's all we're asking for and we have and we we tried to get that meeting to happen sooner and you know people's schedules wouldn't allow for it that's the soonest the soonest we were able to get it is August 18th and so you know I think what we're trying to do is really ensure that there's um, full community and participation, which is, I think, what we should be striving for. And the one piece that's missing is the voice of the workers and that the unions represent. And that's all we're asking for. And so it might not have a big change. It might have, be, there might be other recommendations that would come, but it would ensure that everyone has an opportunity to participate in this process. So that, that's why, you know, I want to provide clarification on, you know, priorities, why this didn't come quicker, and just the perspective that we're trying to bring. Um, Council Member Watkins. Um, no, I appreciate all the different perspectives, and I think that um, based on sort of what we've heard, right now we have an opportunity to just sort of take that vote and then figure out that next step. So in order to sort of move the discussion, I, I was just curious if you would, if, if we're planning on voting on whether or not to set to accept the substitute. Okay. Um, Council Member Matthews. Well, I have uh, labored long and hard throughout this discussion, and um, I am willing to withdraw my motion, and I know I'm going to disappoint some people on that, but I don't want fellow council members to feel that they have been blindsided. I agree this is not urgent. My position is not going to change substantially in two, two weeks or four weeks, so no secrets there. Um, I will say when this was first delivered to the city council earlier this year, it was a very heavy-handed um, delivered fully hatched item, and that was not appreciated. There was no effort to reach out to the broader community that time. And that's why direction was given when it came back to us to stop, reach out to the broader, learn about our local labor force, workforce, learn about the options, talk to people before ramming forward a finished product. So for those who feel that this is being um, there has not been adequate uh, discussion. Let me say that was the framework in which this was first presented. So I am willing to withdraw my motion in the interest of giving time for those who want another short bit of time to engage with labor. Fine. Uh, you know, other council members can remake the motion and they may very well be disappointed with me. Uh, I have tried, as some people know, over the years to um, be accommodating and allow for discussion. Um, we all know this is this is not going to. Uh, there is no calendar deadline facing us on this. But let's be honest. Those who want discussion now with labor, fine. We will all hear that. We had a very strong case made earlier in the year without consulting with the broader community at all. Let's hear the full story. Let's hear what it means for our local wor workforce. Let's learn what it means in terms of the realities of doing pro city projects. And then it will come back and then we'll decide. So with that, I'm gonna withdraw my motion. Others feel free to make it. <laughs> The motion's been made. <laughs> um, Council Member Brown, and I'll just say I appreciate those comments, and I think that you know, um, 
we've had, I think that we've respected that those wishes to, you know, trying to get more engagement in this process. And Pardon? I can't hear you. I was saying that um, I think that we've, you know, respected those wishes to have more engagement and, you know, I think that it's something that has been beneficial to this process um, and that as we move forward, you know, having this, at least having this meeting with the union before we, you know, make our final decision, I think would be beneficial to the community just for providing folks an opportunity to weigh in. I, I will just, um, one second. Um, I would just ask that uh, those whose wishes have accommodate, been accommodated in this move would extend um, equal openness as we go through the process. Uh, Councilmember Brown and then Matthews, Vice Mayor, well, we'll start with Councilmember Brown. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, I, um, Council Member Matthews, I appreciate your willingness to, to do this. Uh, to, um, I, I want to say that having not been one of the council members who originally brought this to our agenda, um, I uh, I too have since then been very interested in trying to have more of a conversation about this and not have it be one-sided and not have it entirely be two minutes at the you know uh, in public comment to us because i don't think that's the way that we're going to get to some kind of end recommendation that we can all feel good about we may never get there but we haven't even tried that yet and so i appreciate your willingness to um, hold off to at least take this next step and um and i certainly you know i I don't. I will not forget that um, you've given us some additional time to to have that conversation. But I just want to be clear that I my intention was never to um, you know bring something fully formed and and have it be you know imposed upon uh, the city and all of and all of its employers uh, without discussion. So that that was never my my goal, um, and I appreciate your recognition of. Our desire for more conversation. Councilmember Watkins. Could, could you please restate the original motion? Catherine. Catherine. Oh, sorry. Um, I move, uh, I think the motion was to um, table this for at this meeting and to reschedule it. I first said the first, uh, the second meeting in August, and the mayor asked if I'd make that more flexible. So I was just asking to delay it for two weeks. Either way, um, it was a very simple motion, just that we postpone this and, uh, for two weeks. That's all it said. Uh, mayor Cumming, specifically, it was the motion that would be voted on is to postpone it to come back either the August 25th or the September 8th council meeting. Yeah, that's what it ended up. And I wonder if I'm if, if maybe we don't want to have a, a sort of a strict timeline on it, given that um, there could be other items and that there isn't an urgency here. I mean, the 25th seems unrealistic to me just because in terms of a gender report, that's mm -hmm. not probably yeah. feasible. And who knows right. what happens on the 8th. So if it really isn't of urgency, then I don't know if it necessarily needs to have a strict timeline associated with it. I accept uh, that suggestion. That'd be flexible on the timeline. But yes, the 25th, I, I realize now, now that I'm getting the agendas on Thursday night, that there's a very little turnaround time from one one meeting to the next meeting. So, yeah. I, will, I will say um, that the one thing I, I do want to ensure is that we do, that this doesn't get completely kicked down the... Yeah. yeah.
I guess it's a, to clarify that language is that, you know, if it's continued with the intention to bring it back on before the first meeting in September, um, that way the, the intent is there, but the obligation is, is not concrete. If that's, if that's yeah, I accept that. Yeah. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, um, I guess I, I appreciate some of the comments, but I, I, again, I don't understand the urgency in this. Um, I don't understand why we're pushing this. Um, I recall a meeting, the meeting in January, and um, in fact, what was initially going to be a study to understand how a PLAs could potentially uh, be, be beneficial or also um, if there was downside. Actually, there was a motion made to actually um, begin an ordinance that night. So to say that um, this isn't been pushed, it has been pushed. Um, and I'm hearing sort of both kinds of comments right now, which is there's no rush to this, but I'm also hearing, well, it needs to come back uh, to, you know, the second meeting in August or the first meeting in September, which to me is being pushed. Um, so I, I'm, I'm trying to understand, um, I feel like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to understand because I, I, I don't feel like there's, uh, I don't feel like the intent is clear because I think that two things are being said. Uh, we don't want to vote today on this because we have additional work to do, but as soon as we do that work, we're going to want to get this right back on the agenda and get a vote. Um, there's a lot of people who took a lot of time to come here today, a lot of our local employers, a lot of our local um, family-owned businesses are on the phone listening to us right now, and we've been at this for over two hours. Now we're going to postpone it because it's not really urgent, but we're going to make sure it comes back in two to three weeks. So it's, um, I'm frustrated uh, because we're taking people's time. Uh, and um, it's, you know, I, I'm, I don't know what my vote will be in a few minutes here, but um, <laughs> it's, it's frustrating. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I don't think the I'm you know it's it's a frust very frustrating conversation. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I would like to request, if possible, if I could attend your meeting with the building and trade union folks, if that would be acceptable to you, sure. um, because I think. Um, that might be beneficial to have a few more another seat at, another seat at the table. So I don't know when the when the meeting is scheduled for, and I don't want to mess with the schedule. So we can talk about that, um, the timing of that um, as appropriate. So thank you. Well, I'll just say that I didn't I didn't expect this to be coming when it did because of the fact that we had agreed to have a meeting on August 18th. So the frustration is shared um, because, you know, we discussed having a meeting with the building trades folks before bringing this forward. And I think that Council Member Brown and myself thought that that meeting was gonna happen before this came before council. And when we saw it come before us, I was shocked. And I've expressed this um, when I had my meeting with the city manager the other day and, you know, wasn't really sure the best thing to do in terms of just deleting it from the agenda or allowing, you know, there to be some discussion. But I think that this discussion has been helpful in understanding, um, you know, people's position, probably for the public. And I do think that we want, you know, to not continue kicking this down the road because we probably could have gotten more work done with, if it hadn't been for COVID. Uh, but given the position that we're at, I'm more than happy. I think it would be great to show that we came to the meeting with us. Um, and I'm just hoping we can get through this so that it's not continuing to just come back all the time. Uh, Council Member Colbert. So I share in everybody's frustration. There's nothing I disdain more than meeting for meeting's sake. And like many of us, I have a full-time job and this is a you know second part-time job. 
ish. But when I, and I don't have the luxury of being on that agenda review committee. And so when I get my agenda Thursday night and I look at it, sometimes I'm up till one in the morning and then Friday night and Saturday all day and Sunday and Monday. And, and so I think, it's kind of up to us to do our due diligence and it's up to reach out to people that we think are stakeholders in these um, decisions that we're gonna be making. And I also don't wanna like, you know, upset anybody to the point where, you know, you know, we're, we're working together. So if we need another couple weeks, fine. But I, and so I'm not gonna um, block that, but I, would prefer when something's on the agenda that we address that issue at the meeting or remove it from the agenda as soon as you realize that, you know, there's some mistake. If, I, I, I don't know, Mayor, if you had the power when you did see it that you could have removed it Friday, you know, if that was a possibility. Like, it just, I felt like now we've wasted all of our time and the time of everybody else who's on this call and all of the people that came in to listen and find out what the decision is, and I, yeah, it's frustrating. That's it. But they haven't had a meeting scheduled that shouldn't have been on the agenda in the first place. So, you know, apologies for that. <laughs> you know, I'll just say that, you know, that we were meeting with stakeholders and we'd reach out to stakeholders, as you mentioned, and I didn't ask for this to come forward, neither did Council Member Brown, and so I don't, I mean, Council agreed to bring it back in August. We scheduled a meeting. It should, in my opinion, it shouldn't have been on the agenda, but you know, I think that this meeting that we've scheduled is important. So, um, and I think that in the future, should we be in a similar circumstance that um, either we reach out to council members or mayors, but we can keep items like this you know, off the agenda if we're still meeting with stakeholders in the process. But I also just want to add, like, it's nice that you and um, and uh, Council Member Myers and Brown get to meet with labor, like, in, in, a, in staff in a group. But like, the rest of us are prohibited from meeting in that group because of the no, no, violation of the Brown no. Act, right? No, no. We can meet, or we can't meet. No, just to clarify. Yeah. If I, if I could, we can't yeah. be in that same meeting, but any of us could meet with labor representatives on our own. Right, and they could have reached out to us yes. since Thursday. If anyone would have reached out to me, I would have met with them between Thursday and today. Well, as I mentioned before, you know, none of us were really expecting this to be coming back right now, given that we were meeting with the trades to have these conversations with staff and with council members to kind of see what a good, you know, cohesive and collaborative pathway forward would be. So I think many of us were shocked by this coming forward. Can I just uh, add, just to, to clarify just a bit too, because I think that, again, I think I think the issue here isn't about process, uh, because uh, what staff was doing was we were following direction, yeah. which is to bring it back on the state. Yeah. And I think, uh, unfortunately, what happened with gender review was, I actually missed the gender review too, I happened to be off that day. Um, and so there was a misunderstanding there, but there's no deliberate attempt to try to push something on a particular date or anything like that. That was the date it was set by council. That's what the staff was working towards. If it had been a different date, it would have been a different date. And then with respect to the, the, the meeting with the unions, again, I wasn't involved in it directly, but what I understand, the staff was, they were then the impression of the meeting was about a different topic. And so they weren't correlating the meeting with this action item. And so I think that's why there was that disconnect. But again, it wasn't any a deliberate attempt to try to subvert the process or make the process, you know, somehow force the issue at all. I just want to be clear about that. Um, so I know there's, you know, differences of opinions on the council, but as far as the, you know, the staff was concerned, we were just simply trying to bring it forward, uh, do the work that the council asked, bring it in a timely fashion. And if, you know, if that communication had happened ahead of time and uh, the request would have made to, to delay it a few weeks, I don't think we would have had any problem with that at all. It's just uh, that it, the, way, the way it worked out, it just happened to work out this way. And I think it's just, uh, unfortunate events, no, nothing deliberate on the part of anyone. Council Member Byers. Oh, I think I'm muted. No, you're, you're yeah, right. I'm okay, uh, thank you. Um, well, I wanna thank Cynthia, um, Council Member, <laughs> uh, very much for pulling your motion on 
it, I, it, it's, it's hard to describe because that's a hard thing to do. And you have a lot of, you know, great colleagues here who I think we don't know what the vote would be, but you certainly have a lot of support. And I appreciate it. And then the second thing I appreciate is I knew nothing about the history. I knew nothing about a meeting in January where it sounded, just from the words you used here, kind of shoved down your throat or something to that effect. I did watch some meetings way back in you know January, February, but I, I didn't see this one. So I didn't have any background of how this came about. I just thought it, because you had to give staff direction. I know the new rule is, staff direction to work on some things that's going over eight hours. So anyway, I thank you very much for uh, telling me all that. That kind of helps with the big picture. And thank you, uh, Council Member Mark. I was going to, um, for stepping up, I was going to uh, almost make a motion that a third council member attend the meeting should this happen. So I think you just stepped up before I did it. But that was very much on my mind to have a third person. I think it's very appropriate given all of this discussion. So anyway, thanks. Uh, thank you. I, I think that um, this is definitely a learning opportunity, hopefully, and I think if we could have gone back, it sounds like maybe we would have uh, been able to do this differently and save some time. Um, I will just say that I appreciate um, Council Mayor, Vice Mayor Myers wanting to join the meeting. I just, my hope is we're thinking about the bigger picture, the longer vision, uh, recognizing where we are coming from and using uh, the best information with community input and data to get the results that we want to see for our community. And so as you move forward with your discussions, um, having that in mind. And then um, in general, in terms of just sort of a agenda, agendizing, maybe Tony, you could work with the mayor. Or, you know, there is discretion of the mayor to pull items. So as you have uh, potential for this to occur again, maybe there's a learning opportunity around whether or not there was a window of time where this could have actually not made it onto the agenda given the concerns. But I don't think we need to belabor the point at this moment. I know we've had a long discussion, so I'm happy to go ahead and, if you're, we're ready, we can go ahead and take the vote. A quick, um, uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate uh, the conversation and definitely a uh, learning opportunity for how to move forward. I didn't mean to suggest by saying that it was very surprising to me that this came on the agenda prior to a conversation with the building trade to suggest that there was some intentional undermining of the process. So I, that was not my, um, my, that's not my feeling. That was not my intention. And most importantly, Vice Mayor Myers, the meeting is scheduled for next Tuesday, the uh, 19th. 18th. 18th, sorry, Tuesday the 18th, um, women's suffrage uh, day um, at 8.30 a.m. And we can send you the Zoom. And thank you for offering for, to participate. Council Member Matthews and Vice Mayor Myers. I just want to be clear that what's coming back to us will be this same staff report, this same item. It's not going to be a whole new fully cooked something or other. Is that correct? We are postponing this item as it was presented to us today, and we'll deal with it whenever. Is there agreement? Is that what the intention is? I think that's the intention, but I think there's also the opportunity to allow the building trades to weigh in, so I don't know. Yeah, if that yeah, comment, but comment on this agenda item. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I just, I wanted to uh, make that similar clarification. Um, I will share that I received a lot of communication since Friday through today that um, despite repeated attempts um, to also try to get meetings, that those meetings with uh, some of the local business folks were not, were not honored either. So, um, and I know specifically there's been attempts, um, uh, Mayor Cummings, to try to have meetings with you. And so um, several people mentioned that there was not even a response. So um, 
I'm very concerned that we're going to come back with a, another iteration of this uh, to Council Member uh, Matthews' uh, concern. And if we're going to be truly continuing to develop this with our community, then let's make sure we develop with, with all of our community. Um, and I'd like some commitment that uh, if necessary, uh, we do those communications as well. Um, so uh, I, I, I think it's important. I think this has been a kind of a misstep and uh, I just wanna make sure that um, uh, our local businesses are one of the most important things we should be considering right now as we figure out how to recover from COVID, and how to build the next labor force for Santa Cruz. And so we need to be very careful and very open to uh, hearing from our local businesses. They're suffering, you know, they're part of the solution for how to move ahead. So I appreciate, uh, I would appreciate to make sure that we extend um, those invitations as needed and that um, if we need time and we need to take the time, we keep working on this until we get it right. So that's my request um, uh, and thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we're at a point where we can move forward. Um, so I will call on the County Clerk, if you could repeat the motion before us, and then we can do a roll call for it. I think we can start moving ahead to our other items. Mm -hmm. um, continue this item to no later than the September 8th Council meeting. Understand it may get postponed. Understanding it may get postponed. That's the motion before us. Um, I guess, Bonnie, if you could please call the roll call vote. Member Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Did you hear me? Aye. I'm sorry. I did. Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. You're muted. You're muted. I'm gonna vote. I'm gonna vote no on this, and uh, I have a uh, an, an additional motion to make before we close off this item. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Mayor Cummings. Aye. The passes with Councilmembers Brown, Matthews, Golder, Watkins, Byers, and Mayor Cummings voting in favor. Vice Mayor Myers uh, voting no. Vice Mayor Myers, you said you had another motion you wanted to make. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion that we request the mayor uh, also to meet with the construction industry during this time as appropriate and with the additional council members as appropriate. Local construction industry. I'll just say that like, I'm more than happy to meet with them and I can do that. So, I mean, if you want, if the council doesn't want to vote on that, it's fine, but I'm more than happy to meet with the local construction companies. Um, I think that if, if there's direction to do that, it, it'd be good to be specific with who, because um, if the direction is to meet with all the local construction companies within the next two weeks, I don't think that'll be possible. Um, but I'm happy to, if council members want to send me um, those emails are emails I wanted to follow up on with those folks. I mean, I am happy to reach out to those folks who I want to make sure that we're going to have, you know, something that's going to work for our community. Um, and and so I'm happy to meet with those people as well. But I didn't want my in the communication to be representative of my lack of interest. I really wanted to just make sure that you know we have more time for this. So happy to meet with those folks. It's the, if you all want to continue with the motion, um, I'd just like to make sure that that direction is specific. I'll throw it around. 
Yeah, um, so I I don't see the necessity of this motion. I have I would be happy to meet with anybody who wants to meet with me in terms of contractor employers who are non-union. I have not received a not one message requesting to talk with me. The only message I messages I've received are the bundled ones that we get that go to all council members opposing project labor agreements. So I'm happy to talk with anybody. Um, I agree with Mayor Cummings that it would be a little unwieldy to, for us to all go re reach out. Um, but if anybody out there who's listening wants to communicate, I'm happy to take call. I'll, uh, I'll withdraw my motion and uh, I'll work with uh, local, local businesses to see uh, who we can uh, pull together. Thank you. Yeah, council member. I was just offering a potential alternative, which would be that you could say that for the record, but if the, if the motion's withdrawn and, and there's agreement, then I think that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, council member Matthews. And at this point, it's simply a comment, but I appreciate the effort to reach out to a broader um, spectrum of stakeholders, and that might also include um, local organizations involved in workforce development. That's been noted, so thank you all. Um, and with that, I think we can move on to our next item, which is item number 31, Senate Bill 946, pertaining to sidewalk vendors. I'll turn it over to City Attorney Tony Condotti. Um, before I do that, I'd just like to let members of the public know if you'd like to uh, comment on this item, now's the time to call in, um, and you'll be put in the queue in the attendees list, and when we're opening up for public comment. Please press star nine on your phone and you'll be given two minutes. And I'll turn it over to you, Tony. Um, yes, thank you, Mayor Cummings, members of the City Council. Um, the, this is uh, about uh, sidewalk vendors in the, in the city of Santa Cruz. And um, in the last summer and again this summer, um, I'm sure council members have received communications from uh, members of the public and in particular uh, downtown and beach area merchants um, concerned about um, sidewalk vending activities. Um, we had a recent incident uh, down on Beach Street involving uh, essentially a, an argument over um, which vendor could set up in a particular location. Uh, there's also been an altercation with a, a local merchant uh, and a vendor down there. Um, <coughs> So this uh, uh, ordinance is coming before you because of a change in state law that, that occurred back in the uh, Brown administration. Uh, it, was, it was enacted in September of uh, 2018 and went into effect on January of 2019. And um, I guess where I would start is that under our current ordinance, uh, language the city um, is uh, uh, very serious uh, seriously constrains uh, the types of sidewalk vending activities that are uh, allowed in the city um, and what the state law did is it basically undermines the city's ability to regulate sidewalk vending uh, in a myriad of ways that I'll that I'll go into um, the, the ordinance that's in your agenda packet is lengthy and complicated, and I'm not gonna go into each uh, chapter, but um, that is the product of the fact that as the municipal code evolved, um, the activities that would constitute ven sidewalk vending um, were incorporated in different areas of the municipal code. Um, chapter 522 regulates mobile vendors under the current code, um, but it doesn't distinguish um, really between uh, mobile vendors that operate in a motor vehicle and those that operate in a mobile um, like push cart or other um, uh, type of uh, device that can be set up on a, on a city sidewalk as opposed to in the street. Um, 
Chapter 5.81 deals with uh, vending and display devices on city property, and it, it largely restricts or prohibits commercial vending uh, in the downtown area and in areas along West Cliff Drive and B Street. Um, and then Chapter 1310 uh, seriously restricts the ability to set up vending activities in uh, city beaches and parks. Um, by its own terms, SB 946 applies to charter cities and essentially prohibits the local regulation of sidewalk vendors uh, except in accordance with government code sections 51038 and 51039. Um, and it also states that existing ordinances that conflict with the, the state statute are valid only so, so long as they substantially comply with SB 946. Um, so the current restrictions on sidewalk vending activities have not been enforced since January of 2019 because the state law now prohibits the city from regulating sidewalk vending activities in the way that our current ordinance, uh, our current municipal code does. Uh, for instance, under SB 946, the city cannot require the sidewalk vendor to only operate within specific parts of the public right-of-way, uh, except when the restriction is directly related to objective health, safety, or welfare concerns. Um, we also cannot prohibit sidewalk vendors from operating in a city park or on the beach unless the city already has an agreement with a third party vendor for exclusive concessions inside the park. Um, SB 946 does enable the city to uh, adopt objective uh, or reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions inside a park if the restrictions are directly related to objective health, safety, or welfare concerns or are necessary to ensure the public's use and enjoyment of the park. Uh, or are necessary to prevent an undue concentration of commercial activity that unreasonably appears, interferes with the character of the park. So you cannot require a vendor to obtain the approval of a non-governmental entity before selling food or merchandise. Uh, the city can require a vendor that sells food items to obtain a permit from the county health department, however. Um, and the city cannot restrict uh, vendors to operate only in designated air neighborhoods except when the restriction is directly related to objective health, safety, or welfare concerns. Um, in residential areas, the, the statute allows the city to uh, prohibit stationary sidewalk vendors from operating in residential zones, um, such as uh, lemonade stands, but it cannot prohibit roaming sidewalk vendors, such as uh, push carts. Um, the city cannot restrict the overall number of sidewalk vendors permitted to operate within a jurisdiction, and uh, uh, except if the restriction is directly related to objective health, safety, or welfare concerns. Um, with regard to objective health, safety, or welfare concerns, the statute expressly states that perceived anim uh, community animus and economic competition do not constitute objective health, safety, or welfare concerns. So um, if you think about, for instance, um, sidewalk vendors that may compete with uh, brick and mortar merchants along Beach Street uh, and, and concerns about the impact of uh, that vending activity on the viability of commercial businesses adjacent uh, or commercial brick and mortar businesses adjacent um, the fact that they may have a, a negative financial impact on uh, competitive uh, brick and mortar merchants is not a, a factor that you can take into account in attempting to regulate side, sidewalk vendors. Um, what the statute allows the city to uh, regulate by ordinance, um, it allows the, limit, the city to limit hours of operation for sidewalk vendors uh, so long as they are not unduly restrictive, but it defines unduly restrictive as uh, they cannot be more restrictive than any limitations uh, on other businesses on the same street. 
Uh, the city can regulate or impose sanitary conditions and requirements to comply with uh, disabled access standards uh, and can require vendors to submit information to the city regarding their operations, including a mailing address, a description of merchandise to be sold, and other information. Um, the city is allowed to prohibit sidewalk vendors from operating near farmers markets, swap meets, and other events subject to a special uh, events permit. Um, the city can require the sidewalk vendor to essentially register with the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration so that um, theoretically they could um, be required to collect and pay sales tax. Um, the new law also in, uh, limits penalties for violating local regulations on sidewalk vendors to administrative citations. So under the current law, if a vendor is uh, selling in violation of the city's municipal code, they can be issued an infraction citation and be uh, required to go to court or pay a fine. The new law would, um, would restrict the city to issue an administrative citation that would be administered by the city um, but it's not clear how the city would be able to compel uh, vendors who are cited with an administrative citation to appear and contest the citation or pay a fine. Uh, so I suppose what it relegates the city to doing is um, if it issues administrative citations and they go unpaid, um, the city would essentially uh, be able to file a, a civil action uh, against the vendors. Um, but to, to collect on unpaid administrative fines or penalties. Uh, I have serious uh, reservations about the um, effectiveness of those type of fines or penalties as a deterrent. Um, in enacting SB 946, the state legislature stated as its, among other objectives, that the purpose of the statute was to provide important entrepreneurship and economic development opportunities to low income and immigrant communities uh, and to increase public access to desired goods such as culturally, culturally significant food and merchandise. Um, I, I will say that although that's the stated intent, there's nothing in SB 946 that um, restricts who can operate a sidewalk vending operation. So. Um, you know, I, uh, what I worry about are corporations that can come in, um, you know, hire staff and bring in merchandise and compete with directly with brick and mortar businesses. Um, the, the intent of the legislature was really twofold. One is to support, um, it, 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 it has a valid intent to, to support in entrepreneurship among low-income individuals and immigrant communities. And also, it was intended by the administrative citation provision to um, reduce the risk of someone who is uh, vending, you know, someone, someone who's undocumented and is cited for vending activities in violation of a local ordinance to come into the criminal court system and thereby draw the attention of immigration uh, officials. So that, that was the intent, uh, laudable as it was. Um, the statute doesn't really have any mechanism for restricting um, who uh, is in, allowed to vend. Um, you know, corporations have the same rights to set up uh, vending booths on sidewalks in Santa Cruz and throughout the state of California as, as any uh, individual entrepreneur. Um, so, uh, like I said, the ordinance is complicated and there's a red line version of the ordinance uh, in your packet. I'm happy to answer any questions about any aspect of it, but uh, essentially all of the restrictions and, and the provisions that I referred to in my report uh, in SB 946 um, incorporate those restrictions. So. Um, I wish we were coming to the council with uh, measures to um, address some of the legitimate concerns about sidewalk vending activities that are going on right now in the community, but that's not what this is about. Uh, it's really just to bring our ordinance into compliance with state law. Thanks, Tony. Uh, are there any questions from council members? 
Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, I understand. I mean, this is all about coming into compliance with existing state law. Given this, um, what are the opportunities to do more than we are now doing in terms of enforcement, setting rules, et cetera? And just given some of the testimony that we've been receiving lately about the antagonism, the confrontation, people are being, residents are being stared down by people and they're kind of afraid to go out. Um, that seems to me getting to the uh, health, safety, welfare concerns and uh, inability of people to enjoy the, uh, the park <laughs> in a way. I mean, it's, from what we're hearing, there's some pretty, um, as well as the bike safety stuff, but um, it seems like the, um, the situation is progressing and getting more and more unpleasant. And so that's my question. What can we be doing that we're not already? Well, I mean, I, I would put it a different way. It's what are we doing that that we would not be able to do, but for the fact that we have a, 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 a public health emergency. Uh, right, right. Santa Cruz. Um, as the city manager mentioned in, uh, in an earlier report, um, the city manager has issued an executive order that, um, that places restrictions on sidewalk vending activities that are designed to reduce the risk uh, that they could become a, uh, a vector for transmission of right. COVID-19. Right. Uh, SB 9, and, and, and I, I believe we uh, absolutely have the authority to do that under the emergency powers uh, of the, based on the declared uh, COVID-19 emergency, but under SB 946, uh, expressly states that we cannot require sidewalk vendors to only operate within specific parts of the public right of way. Yeah. And we can't uh, also, we can also not limit the number of sidewalk vendors that are allowed to bend within the city. So, um, you know, this, in terms of what we, what tools we have for effective regulation, barring um, objective evidence that an activity constitutes a, uh, a, a threat to public health, safety, and welfare, um, you know, we don't we don't have uh, good tools in our toolkit uh, under SB 946. And how about the food vendor question? Well, the food vendors are um, already under existing uh, uh, health and safety code provisions required to have a, a license from the from the county health uh, department in order to uh, sell. Uh, food, you know, food and, and you know, edible products. Um, they generally can't get a license because the way they're operated doesn't comply with state uh, health regulations. And so, um, there has been an effort to uh, to, to uh, discontinue those activities as they're going on, uh, especially along Beach Street, um, through enforcement. Um, but unless there's an enforcement presence there, uh, no sooner do our officers uh, leave the area than they set up shop again immediately. And so, um, so under SB 946, we still will have the ability to require uh, a license from the, from the county health department, but um, the enforcement aspect will still be a challenge. And someone who is cited for not having a license uh, will be, um, you know, put into our administrative uh, penalty process. Councilmember Brown. Thanks. Just a quick question. So, yeah, we have received. Thank you for Tony for uh, working on this and trying to figure out how we navigate our way through. Um, We've some of the messaging uh, that I've received, at least, and I think it went to the whole council, um, suggested that there are you know, local vendors who have been around, who are really actually independent, who are now experiencing this influx from 
elsewhere. And I recognize that 946 does not, um, and nor any other <laughs> any other statute or legislation allow us to uh, restrict out of town access, but. One of the things in at least one of those messages was related to parking and the fact that people are coming and, you know, parking and, st and sitting for out, you know, for many hours, kind of longer than, uh, you know, two hour parking certainly would allow and metering. So I'm just wondering if there, if you've thought about that or if there's any discussion about that possibly being a way to mm, disincentivize uh, the, the, the race to, uh, Beach Street. Certainly, there's been discussion about the problems associated with. Really, it's the competition to get the good spots uh, on Beach Street. And you're right. Um, I've been uh, on Beach Street a number of times over the course of the summer, and I recognize some vendors from, you know, that, that have been on Pacific Avenue and and you know have been here for for years. Um, but th those are the minority, uh, and and most of them. You know, we understand are um, are people who um, to make a you know for their livelihood go to beach communities and other areas that have big crowds and and sell their wares. And um, under the statute, we don't really have the ability to to restrict who gets to set up shop in our in our city to residents. We just like we can't do that for brick and mortar businesses. I don't know if the city manager wanted to weigh in. Yeah, there have been a number of challenges around that with uh, uh, vendors uh, spending the night uh, in vehicles and in, at the booths, or, and also storing supplies in tents and vehicles on the beach and other locations. Um, and so we are working with, with parking uh, also on trying to address it from a parking perspective. Uh, but it's just been, it's just really difficult because, uh, uh, again, they're they're very good at keeping an eye out on enforcement and uh, they're constantly adapting, <laughs> um, and uh, so it's just become really really difficult. So I'm afraid you know we might have to do a, a pretty pretty drastic measure to just again I, I look at it from a public health perspective and we need to just act quickly so we may have to just do a, a more drastic uh, uh, not allowing it for a period of time in order to get a handle on it and then and then uh, and then maybe scale it back uh, after that so we're working with the city attorney's office now on, on coming up with something but I think we need to act pretty quickly to try to uh, do something that's going to be effective uh, pretty quickly uh, and if I could just qualify my question, uh, since you uh, also responded, Martine, uh, I guess I, when I say, you know, parking, the issue of parking, is there a way to, to address that? I also have heard about the challenges that people in the beach spots have, and I, I mean, I know in the abstract that's an issue, and I know it's getting ever more challenging for people to have parking, and so I, I, I'm not... Um, I guess I'm just wondering if, you know, like a blunt instrument that may end up affecting neighbors and community members is not something that I, I wanted to suggest I was interested in at all. But, I, you know, anyway, so I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Maybe I misunderstood that. But yes, we have heard from the beach area uh, residents uh, concerns about the parking uh, related to, not necessarily the vending, but. Uh, uh, and all of them would be part of it, but uh, also just the, the fact that uh, with people being sheltering in place, uh, parking is, 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 is more of a challenge. And so Public Works is working to, and, and Peter Bichet, our, our liaison, is working with the neighbors there to come up with uh, various options to try to address the parking issue there too. There's also a, a food vendor, it's a mobile vendor there. Also, I think we'll be working with them to figure out how to make things work for that neighborhood there. So there are some neighborhood issues that we're working with them to, to resolve, you know, separate from the, the vending issue as well. Um, I have one question before we move on. There's like a million questions and comments, I'm sorry. So what does enforcement look like? So you said um, that, they, that uh, there's administrative process. Can you tell me a little more about that, Tony? Yes, we would um, first of all uh, require vendors to um, provide a 
a physical address so they can be located uh, and identification. Um, and then in order to enforce, we would issue an administrative citation. It looks just like a criminal citation, only instead of being submitted to the court, mm -hmm. and um, in which case, in the criminal process, if you fail to appear for court when you're cited, even for an infraction, the failure to appear is a misdemeanor under California law. Um, we don't have the ability to. Uh, we don't have the ability to pursue people who ignore their administrative citations by citing them for criminal conduct because the remedies that the legislature uh, provided us to enforce our own sidewalk, sidewalk regulations are limited to these administrative fines. And then we would uh, need to, uh, first of all, uh, provide a time period within which the administrative citation can be um, can be paid and it's not, um, it doesn't really give us an effective remedy for going out and forcing someone to comply. And in fact, it, it, what it does is it, um, it provides uh, an administrative process where someone who uh, is cited can, um, can seek a hearing on their ability to pay and under, those, under certain circumstances, um, the the fines that are assessed uh, can only be 20% of the amount that are outlined in our code, which is uh, $100 for a, uh, a first violation and uh, $200 for a second violation, and each additional violation within one year is a $500 fine. So I essentially, I, I, I think where we're headed here is that we would be, um, that we would be uh, filing small claims actions against these vendors, and um, you know they're not going to be easy to get into small claims court. And if they are, if they do, it's not going to be easy to enforce a judgment against them. So okay. All right. And so I, I just have to say that I'm sure that this SB 946 had good intentions when it was written, but for me. Um, and, and I'm all for promoting entrepreneurialism, but I think with the way that it's worded with immigrant communities being like spelled out right there, it's kind of systemic racism in thinking that our immigrant communities can't um, make a living another way. And I have to say, I spend a lot of time at the flea market and I've seen some of these vendors in the, over the years at the flea market. I have to say that my friend's 19 year old daughter had run-ins with them for the last whole summer while she had to have her bike parked down there and, they, and she couldn't access it um, at night when she left work. My 16 year old had an incident with them where they were throwing the plastic cellophane onto the beach and he tried to confront them about not littering. And so my thought is, what about something else? What about jamming people up for littering? What about ADA access to sidewalks? What about um, the camping, um, the overnight camping on the beach above the high tide line? Like, what about things that are already in place for that specific section of street and not trying to like reinvent the wheel? Is there anything else we can do? So violations of other provisions of the municipal code. Um, and of course, our camping ordinance is, uh, at, at this point, not really enforceable based on a Ninth Circuit decision that you're all familiar with. Um, but other violations of the municipal code that aren't specifically uh, restricted to vending, like littering on city beaches, we can cite uh, under the under our uh, uh, municipal code, and those do constitute either infraction or misdemeanor violations that can be prosecuted. And my office does prosecute those in the criminal courts. Um, the problem is they're very difficult to identify the, the, the perpetrator. Um, a lot of and, and if there's a witness uh, that's not a, 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 a law enforcement officer, um, then the witness would have to essentially make a citizen's arrest or sign uh, a, a a, a citation as the witness to the um, to the criminal activity. So, um, so it's very challenging to uh, to enforce those types of restrictions. Um, we can do it, but it's it's just 
not going to put a big dent in the activity that's that's really at the root of the problem. But if I had, you know, if you detect a sense of frustration in in my presentation here today, um, it's because the legislature, in its wisdom, stated in uh, SB 946 that this law applies to charter cities because. Uh, it has, it's a matter of statewide concern. And under California law, under the, under the California Constitution, as a charter city, um, the city is supposed to have authority over what are considered municipal affairs. And to me, um, you know, regulating commerce in a commercial district, um, that seems now like a municipal affair to me, you know. Uh, does, does the council want to uh, promote regulations that support local brick and mortar businesses? Seems like a municipal affair to me. Um, but under the legal standards that apply, it would be very challenging for the city to, to take a position that it's not um, required to comply with the state law. Um, thank you. And after public comment, I could make a motion to move it forward as it's written to. I'm fine with that. Justin, you're muted.
advance. That's what I was trying to say, where the wheelchairs get on and off the sidewalk. I saw some of those were blocked when I was down there. Yeah, and I, th I think we can adopt those sets of regulations. Those would clearly have a direct bearing on public health and safety issues. Council members who would like to comment on these items. Okay. Seeing none, if there are members of the public who would like to call in, now is the time. Uh, the instructions will be shown on your screen. And uh, once you're in the meeting, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you'll be given two minutes to speak on this item. And the item before us right now is Senate Bill 946 pertaining to sidewalk vendors. Okay, first speaker, you're on the line. I understand I have four minutes. This is Robert of Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I believe you on the that I received your email regarding this, so you'll have the four minutes. Thank you. Uh, you know, we've heard about the inadvisability from the city attorney of the spacing restrictions both legally in terms of court challenge and practically regarding what actually happens when they put those in. And I've been wondering, because we've had this current situation for two years where there hasn't been an enforcement of these vending ordinances. Now, I understand uh, Councilmember Goldie's concern about you know, real problems that occur with blockage of the sidewalk, ADA problems. Uh, things of that sort. I probably disagree with a number of other things, but that's not the issue. The issue is, is it really to the point to, pro to push another law here, which is going to put an additional burden on the police, cause more conflict between people who are uh, on the streets, and I'm thinking, of course, of people who are outside, uh, or counterculture people, people who are jewelry vendors. I mean, I want to point out that this, what this ordinance does, and it wasn't mentioned by uh, the city attorney, and perhaps for very good reason, it actually reinstitutes a prohibition on um, the application of substances to others' bodies, including but not limited to paints, dyes, and inks, the provision of personal services such as hair weaving, cutting, or styling, the completion or other completion of, of visual art. So you can't complete a painting on Pacific Avenue if you want. The creation of visual art, which is mass produced or produced with limited variation, or, and this is the important thing I think for a number of people on Pacific who are a draw to tourists, even in the COVID era, uh, the creation of handi handicrafts such as weaving, carving, stitching, sewing, lacing, and beating objects, I'm reading from the ordinance, such as jewelry, pottery, silver work, leather goods, and trinkets. So, you know, my concern here is that this will promote, I think, a disrespect for law. If you have a law, first of all, it's going through an administrative process, which doesn't really provide people any rights if they are, if they do go to court, and doesn't provide the actual uh, city with any real recourse for making people pay, except pay, taking people to court who probably don't have any money anyway. So that's a real concern. So my concern also, of course, is how this is going to be applied against homeless and poor people. Ask yourself how many complaints have been made in the last year. These stats do not appear in the staff report. We don't know this. So I'd say if you're really going to want this ordinance, it doesn't sound like it's immediate in any way, bring, come back, bring it back, and bring it back with some real figures about all the big problems that have happened at downtown on Pacific Avenue, uh, which is really my primary concern in the last Last year and in the last two years actually because that's how the ordinance has been uh, that non-enforcement has happened um, so we have essentially a whole mass of downtown ordinances of which this was the latest restrictive ordinance this is the same ordinance we had uh, passed by the city council four years ago really it's been slightly extended and changed but it's primarily the same kind of thing but it is not a good law for a number of reasons some of which I've already stated 
the community knows it too. And so when Chief Mills puts up fences to drive away homeless people from outside the post office in violation of CDC shelter in place guidelines, then three times the fences have been taken down by community members and they're concerned with our own city codes, with the Constitution, with the CDC guidelines, then rules that train the rookies police force. So direct action will get the job done and it will restore conscience, faith, and, and morale as well as physical health to the community because moving people who are sheltering in place, which is one of the uses this ordinance could be put to because it talks about the storage of property on ordinances. That's new language in the ordinance. So giving the police more license to move along vendors or anyone sitting with what can be described as a display device and making it illegal to put your possessions on a blanket on the ground is both issue to conscience and also unfair. Is that my four minutes? All right, thank you for calling. Uh-huh. Okay, hey, next speaker, you're online. Hello? Evening. Yes. Uh, hi. Um, I think the law was um, intended, had good intentions, um, but it seems like your hands are tied as far as enforcement, which is, I, I, uh, I can see pros and cons to this. And um, so it also applies to parks, is what I understand. So my concern is about what if, you know, food vendors, you know, selling stuff in parks, how will they, you know, be, how will we be assured that they'll clean up after themselves? And then not cause you know health and safety hazards. Uh, will there be? An, will they have to provide um, you know trash cans? Will the city have to provide them? And uh, also, I was thinking maybe there could be a um, special area for artists and craftspeople to sell, so that they're not all jumbled in with all the other uh, you know tchotchkes, uh, or little um, trinkets and things like that. Anyway, I'm not uh, too happy with this situation, but I guess I'll just avoid the beach. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Does any other member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, now is the time to call in. Once you've dialed in, please press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand, and you'll be given two minutes to speak on this item. make a motion and, uh, to introduce for publication ordinance revising the three chapters of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code. So bringing them into compliance with SB 946 um, and then the rest of the language, uh, the three major municipal ch code chapters requiring revisions are chapter 5.22 uh, pertaining to mobile vendors, Chapter 5.81 pertaining to vending and display devices on city property, and Chapter 13.10 pertaining to sales in and on city parks and beaches. But I also want to say one thing, is I, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I kind of agree with Robert Norris in that <laughs> I think some of the people selling um, things downtown sometimes are kind of a draw for tourists. and. And um, it seems like the real nuisance, I mean, I do know that we need to focus on the brick and mortar businesses and I, I understand um, that, you know, our hands are tied in a number of uh, situations here, but I think that this situation that's going on on Beach Street is really what's, um, you know, a problem. And, and there is a lot of people selling things and have been selling things for years, like the guy that sells crystals and whatever that are, you know, fine people just trying to make a living, so, so that would be a problem. I have a comment on Councilmember Golder's uh, comment and, a, and also a, a suggestion. Um, 
before SB 946, the city prohibited generally vending activities on Beach Street, West Cliff, and on Pacific Avenue, but there was an exception for um, works of art or other products that were, you know, craft work uh, that were produced by the individuals who were selling their wares. Um, like the speaker set, the other speaker set. Like the little spiders and, you know, the, the little um, uh, trinkets that um, have always been sold down on Pacific Avenue. And that was, a, that was an exception that was written in recognition of the fact that, um, you know, some of that work constitutes expressive activity, uh, personal works of art, for instance. Um, under SB 946, those vendors are going to be competing with people selling, you know, T-shirts, hats, and stickers as well, so. Um, yeah, it's a shame. I know, like, I was just looking around my house right now, I can, can't even count the number of things I've bought off the streets from people, and so I think, you know, there's a place for it, but I think what's happening on Beach Street is out of hand, so, anyway. And then my suggestion was going to be to add uh, in the appropriate location, um, both in Chapter 1310 and Chapter 5.81, uh, the following. No person shall place, erect, or maintain a display device within 10 feet of any building entrance, stairway, wheelchair access ramp, fire hydrant, bench, sculpture, or planter. I may have overlooked something, but... Um, I mean, one thing I think uh, is like, I can't believe I forgot that one. Yes, certainly. What was that last edition, Mayor Cummings? Right. Is there any way we can also incorporate that they have to, like, pick up anything that they bring and take it with them, like pack or trash type thing? Um, yes, I think that we could add language that says um, sidewalk vendors shall be responsible for removal um, of, of their own uh, garbage and refuse and shall not uh, use public uh, refuse containers for that purpose. Thank you. And then not to like beat a dead horse, but is there a limit on the size that these can be? Or could I set one that spans the whole length of the street with like eight tents? Or is, is there any limit on that? With we could restrict the size, I believe. We could, or the state does? But, no, the state does not. Um, the state didn't think about that. Um, Would we be interested in incorporating something to restrict the size to anybody? Anybody want to add a comment? Um, I have a suggestion about that too, which would be that the city council uh, or city manager may promulgate additional regulations concerning the time, place, or manner of sidewalk vending activities, violation of which would also be a violation of the municipal code. Okay. Tony, it's uh, Bernie Escalani from the PD. Can you hear me? Yep, you're on. Um, I, I might have missed it, but did you mention like in or within so many feet of the planner boxes? I know that's been another uh, concern that we've heard that they're setting up inside the, 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 the planner box for the trees. Yes, there was a provision in the ordinance that didn't allow them to utilize planter boxes, but um, the new language would prohibit bending within 10 feet of a of a uh, building entrance or stairway, wheelchair access ramp, bike rack, fire hydrant, bench, sculpture, or planter. Thank you. Do a motion by Councilmember Golder on the floor. I'll second the motion. Okay. Motion by Councilmember Gilder, second by Councilmember Watkins, Councilmember Brown. Yeah, well, I was going to second, uh, but I also have a question. Can we clarify, Tony, uh, the response to Councilmember Golder's question about the size? I, I think that I agree that's a, that's a way to approach that particular question. Um, my preference would be that it 
be um, that there be some kind of uh, accountability for the, the council to if there any major change occurs that is within the bounds of uh, what we can restrict that it would come to the council. I'm not quite sure what. I, I guess I don't quite understand your comment. <laughs> I think you. I just heard you say a way to deal with the, the question about maybe thinking about size and restricting based on size is that we could include uh, some language that suggests that other, uh, you know, other restrictions may be to be determined by the city manager or the council. Right. So I guess I'm just like. I mean, I'm just wanting it to, wanting to clarify what role the council has versus staff making those kinds of decisions i think we need to be involved when it's a some kind of significant ordinance change um, yeah well the regulations would be either by a um, an executive order of the city manager or by resolution of the city council that's what i had in mind okay uh, but, if, but if the council's preference is that such uh, regulations come before the council, then you could simply limit it to authorizing additional regulations to be promulgated by the city council by resolution, and that would be another option for you to consider. Well, I, I, I didn't ask the question because I want to necessarily create a process that maybe delays intervening when there's a if there's a serious problem. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't ceding the ability to make decisions about this in the future to staff through a, you know, just that, that tiny language could, couldn't be a significant change. So I'm fine with executive order, um, particularly under these circumstances. Um, I don't wanna hold us up on that. It, it's just I'm trying to get clear about what that means or what that could mean. Yeah, and I just would remind the council that in the chapter 1310, it already provides that the director of parks and Rec recreation can promulgate additional regulations uh, when necessary to ensure the park's use and enjoyment of a given park or beach, um, or beach's natural resource and recreational opportunities. Um, so we could add uh, language to that effect in uh, chapter 5.81 as well. Thank you. Is the deputy chief still there? Is Bernie Escalante still on? Yes, I am. I have a question for him. Yeah. Well, good. Um, enforcement. You know, I I just don't all the little. One line is affecting Pacific Avenue, how hard that's been, and it's extremely cumbersome. And it sounds like, uh, I just, this seems overwhelming with the, the no, 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 no's. Um, just want to take from you about enforcement. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it is very difficult. Uh, you know, you have officers out with tape measures, um, you know, is it 10 feet, is it 10 feet, six inches, is it nine feet, uh, six inches? So it, it's it's not the most ideal, um, but as you've heard with the um, restrictions that we face under SB 946, um, you know, we've been working hard with other staff and other departments to try to find some sort of solution to this. Um, this probably gives us the best option to try to control it uh, better than what it's been in the last several weeks. Um, so uh, I agree, it's not the best uh, situation for officers, but it gives us, it does give us some, some direction. Okay, thanks. And I was just reminded that uh, there was a suggestion that we add language that would require um, sidewalk vendors to pack their own trash. So um, that, that's another option for you to consider. Yeah, I thought that was already in it, no? Hmm. Okay. Just, uh, Ronnie, if you're trying to speak, if you're muted. Oh, no, okay. Uh, Councilman Matthews. 
I really prefer the option of allowing the parking director, director to um, establish additional um, guidelines, regulations as necessary, and just inform us. And this is done frequently, and um, it's, it's, I think, a much, it's a much better solution. It's not that anything's secret, but it's just the management of the spaces as long as there's an understood direction, we support limitations on size and come up with something that is kind of a um, common sense and beneficial guideline. Um, you know, you don't need three four by eight foot tables full of stuff. So anyway, I, I prefer an administrative um, discretion with council being informed when there are changes. And then if anyone has a serious problem with it, they can bring it up. Yeah, I, I thought that was just clarified. I, I was just trying to get okay. clarification on what, that, yeah. what it would look like. And, and I believe Tony said that it's in there. So yeah, thank you. no further discussion. We have a motion made by Councilmember Golders, seconded by Councilmember Watkins. I'll turn it over to the city clerk to call the vote. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings. Aye. Right. So that motion passes uh, to update the language as improvements as it pertains to sidewalk rending and also add, um, got the city attorney to add additional language. So, Tony, with this, this will come back as a second reading and with the additional language added, correct? Great, thanks. Yes, that's right. Next item on our agenda is item number 32, general business, the appointment of three commissioners to the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. Um, so I'll turn it over to our city clerk, Bonnie Bush. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this could be very quick. We have three nominees that you guys have brought forward that council just needs to ratify your nomination to appoint them for CDW. Council Member Byers. Um, so we have Karen Madura, who is your just Mayor Cummings nomination. Mervyn Mays, who is Council Member Byers nomination. And Shannon McGuire, who is Council Member Golder's nomination. Great. Uh, if there's any questions or comments from Council Members, Council Member Brown and Council Member Matthews. Yeah, I would just go ahead and move that we ratify those nominations. So once we go... Wait a second. <laughs> oh, that's right. We have to go to the public. Oh, Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Do you have any other comments? Councilor Matthews, do you have any comments or questions? No, I just was prepared to, to ratify the nominations. Okay. And then Council Member Byers, do you have questions or comments? No. Okay, well, um, we'll go to the public. If there's any member of the public who would like to comment on item number 32, which is the appointment of three commissioners to the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women, uh, please call in on your phone. Once you've called in, please press star nine to raise your hand. You will be given two minutes to speak. Members of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item, bring it back for action and deliberation. Council Member Brown. I will move that we ratify the nominations. And I'll second that. And I do have a question following the vote. A quick question. 
So the motion by Councilmember Brown, second by Councilmember Matthews, um, to approve and ratify the new membership of the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. I'll turn it to the clerk so we can vote on the item of us. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. Uh, passes unanimously. Councilmember Matthews, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I think this is a question for Martine. Who's staffing the CPDAW these days? Sorry, it's uh, um, Ralph. Okay. Um, there's been quite a bit of turnover. You know, there was a fairly cohesive, um, stable, and productive commission for a good chunk of time. By nature, there's evolution, but um, there's been a lot of turnover. And so in both staff, several times, <laughs> and um, in the commission members. And so I'm just curious about what kind of um, orientation they get. There'll be three new members coming on as well as a couple of other recent ones. And it seems um, to find the right person to give an orientation. Just on the background and what um, maybe some goal setting for this group. You know, it, it seems like it's somewhat starting afresh. <laughs> That's just a concern. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah, we can, we can look into that and see what we can do to, to uh, you're right, there's been a lot of turnaround, so uh, maybe. I think they've had advice. different projects, you know, that they've right. worked on over the last few years. Okay, we'll follow up, maybe a more robust orientation yeah. program or uh, uh, just a kickoff program for them. So we can look at that. Great. Okay, with that, um, let's move on to item number 33 which is support for the Santa Cruz Warriors making Santa Cruz their permanent home. And um, I guess I can kick us off on that item, um, and then I can turn it over to uh, Director of Economic Development, Bonnie Whitscomb. So uh, a couple weeks ago, um, myself, Vice Mayor Myers, House Mayor Matthews, along with representatives from the CSAC company, the Warriors, and some community members, had an opportunity to sit and, and discuss um, the next steps moving forward. Um, as many of you saw in our agenda packet, we've extended the com our contract, uh, a temporary contract with the Warriors, and the discussion really was around, you know, what we would like to see as a city moving forward with the Warriors in our community. I, said, I think that unanimously what came up in that discussion was, you know, how much of a benefit uh, the Warriors has been in terms of helping to bring our community together, um, providing a space for people to take their families to enjoy basketball games, another event space in Santa Cruz that we're able to utilize, um, the jobs that it promotes and brings along with uh, uh, the, economic, the, the revenue that it generates through the admissions tax and by having events, the revenue it generates for downtown businesses. Um, and so uh, we thought that now would be a good time given that um, the Warriors are thinking about whether they should stay here or not, is to really express our current commitment and um, appreciation for them choosing Santa Cruz as their home and our desire to make Santa Cruz a permanent home for the Santa Cruz Warriors. And so with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to, well, before I turn it over to uh, um, Economic Development Director, I'm wondering if any other council members who are at the meeting would like to speak uh, to this item. Sure, I'll, I'll say a few words. Um, yeah, uh, we had a really productive meeting, and um, I think this is, uh, you know, for, I think we, we identified so many positives from the Warriors, and um, it's hard to believe it's been, I think, eight years. And, um, you know, I, I've gotten a lot, we've gotten a lot of emails uh, this week, um, just in the last few days. I think when this hit the agenda packet, um, uh, I've seen an uptick in people uh, writing us letters and saying that they're excited, they want us to, to make this happen. And um, so I really look forward to working with um, our staff and the Warriors 
and um, the the corporate office and whoever it is that we need to to uh, try to keep this wonderful asset in our community. So uh, look forward to doing the work. Quickly, a couple of the comments we've gotten have expressed concern that the city would go deep into debt to keep the warriors here, and I just want to assure whoever's listening that that's, <laughs> that's not the intention. I'm sure that our economic development director will, will touch on that, but the uh, discussion focused more on who were the uh, potential partners to include in the discussion. Pretty preliminary and yet serious. And, the, and there was the expression that the, the Warriors um, have been a very strong economic positive for the city, and that's part of what is, that's part of what's our interest. Plus the games are fun, and they're good community college partners. Just want to stress, the, um, we are not talking about subsidizing a giant arena for the Warriors. <laughs> I guess if there's one thing I'd like to add as well is that after that conversation, I had an opportunity to sit down with um, Chris Murphy and some other members of the community and really wanted to talk about you know, more opportunities for outreach um, for the team to be able to engage with the community and do more outreach with the community. And so I think also the benefits that they bring with being you know, role models and mentors for the kids in our community. and. Uh, role models for you know other businesses as well in our community for how they operate um, and you know their, their willingness and desire to be a part of this community I think is really positive um, in addition to the financial benefits they bring. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to our economic development director to um, to kick off the rest of our conversation. Great. Thank you, Mayor, um, Vice Mayor, um, and Councilmember Matthews, and all of the council. Um, I'm, I'm excited that this is before us. Um, we, we meet frequently uh, with the Warriors and the Seaside Company, but we don't often come to council and, and talk about sort of what is the status of our agreement, what's the status um, of both the lease with the, with the Seaside Company as well as with the Santa Cruz Warriors. So I'm excited that we have that opportunity today. Um, when we first started discussions in 2011 uh, with Golden State uh, Warriors at the time, um, now we have their franchise, you know, the G League, uh, Santa Cruz Warriors, um, one of the things and one of our goals um, that actually the council set for us was that not only would the Warriors become part of the community, and that was part of, was one of the goals, was that also we chose a location that really helped to revitalize an area of Lower Pacific. And I think we've really been able, uh, we've been really successful at that point. Where the Warriors is located, this partnership that we have with the Seaside Company and with the Santa Cruz Warriors has really helped revitalize that lower Pacific area and be a key, sort of a catalyst um, for connecting the downtown and the beach area, which is one of our main, goal, main goals set, set for us by the council at that time. So we feel really good about that. We'd love for them to stay permanently in Santa Cruz. Um, some of the letters that you've received over the last few days talk about, you know, the reading program that the players go into the schools and read with the children and just the positive impact that our local team has had in the community. Uh, the community green, when people go to games, you know, and connect, and it's just, it, it has become such a, such a part of our community and our culture here in Santa Cruz. Um, from a financial standpoint, I did want to address a couple of the letters that came in. Um, there was some concern raised about that our agreement would forgive um, any outstanding balance at the termination of our lease agreement. I just wanted to clarify that and say the existing arrangement has a splitting any outstanding balance that's not repaid at the end of any uh, lease agreement or after any extension. So to date, where we are here now almost eight years into the agreement, where we still have another year on the existing agreement with one extension possible after that, is that they've repaid three million of the four million dollar loan. They're paying on average about a little under half a million a year that gets applied towards the loan. What goes in the loan, we have approved um, repayments, principal and interest payments. In addition, we have concession revenue, we have facility use fees, and any event revenue beyond the Warriors game. All of that gets applied to the loan. So each year uh, we are chipping away at that outstanding balance and with the existing agreement that we have, 
and then on top of that, we receive parking revenue um, related to games as well as admissions tax. So if you put all of these funding sources together, both the loan repayments plus the interest on top of the loan on the principal, plus the admissions tax, plus the, plus the rent revenue for the parking, we actually received more than what we loaned to the Warriors originally. So I wanted to clarify that. Um, and any sort of future options that we come back to you, I think will be creative in nature. You know, we're looking at, you know, what are ways we recognize right now, this is from a fiscal standpoint in the middle of a pandemic, the worst time to come forward asking for, you know, a public subsidy, which some of the letters were concerned about. We would be concerned with that too. I think we want to be creative and look at ways and look at our partnership and how we can keep them um, their home here in Santa Cruz. So. Uh, I'll stop there. Um, and this is all, all, you know, an item also from the council members. So I want to respect that, and um, but I'm happy to answer any specific questions that you have. Thanks, Mark, for that presentation. Are there any questions from council members at this moment in time? Okay, hearing none. Um, if you are a member of the public who's watching. And you would like to comment on this item, now is the time to call in. Uh, there will be numbers displayed on your screen. Once you call in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to weigh in on this item. Mayor Cummings and City Council members, uh, I want to first of all thank uh, Bonnie Lipskin and the uh, Economic Development Department. This is Casey Byers, uh, Santa Cruz Chamber of Commerce. Um, we are 100% behind moving forward with this item. Uh, there are many members of the chamber that are uh, season ticket holders to the Warriors, and they look forward to the opportunity of seeing their hometown team grow in our hometown. So I encourage you to swiftly move through this item, get it, get it on the board, and uh, actually find a location that is compatible with what this, the Warriors need, what the Seaside Company needs, and what our town needs. Thank you. So if there's any other member of the public who'd like to speak on this item, now is the time to call in. And once you've dialed in, please press star nine on your phone. You'll be given two minutes to speak. No other members of the public would like to speak to us on this item. I'm going to bring it back to council for action but for deliberation. Council member Byers. Yeah, um, this is a question for um, Bonnie. What, um, go over the deadline, or not the deadline, but when does the lease end? You probably said it, but I missed it. The, the existing lease has a term that goes through September of 2021, so a little over a year from now. Although there is a clause in the lease that allows us by mutual written consent to extend it for one more year. So we have one more year for sure, um, potentially two more years. Okay. okay and thanks. Just, sure. And I just wanted to add, because I, sh I should have when I, I originally spoke and acknowledge our city manager who has been um, really instrumental in supporting the Warriors and in actually securing the Warriors in the first place and being supportive throughout the last, you know, seven and a half years. So um, I don't know, uh, Martine, if you want to say a few words, but I think you've been one of the biggest warrior supporters from the very beginning. Uh, no, thank, uh, thank you. Thank you, Bonnie, uh, first of all. But, uh, yeah, no, I think the council members have uh, kind of expressed the uh, – just the, uh, the overall benefits that the team has brought. Uh, many of them, you know, I think we didn't expect uh, from the very beginning, uh, and it was a bit of a surprise that uh, how um, successful they've been insofar as really being an opportunity for a cross-section of the community. It really is a place where you see people from all sectors of the community all coming together, so that's
it's really wonderful to see. And same off, I think the, the expectation out, out there is that uh, moving forward, this will be a partnership, uh, and that this is not uh, intended to be a 100% uh, or uh, primarily public you know, uh, type of a project here. It, it's a partnership, a, a true public private partnership is what is going to work for our community. Thank you. Yeah. I too want to thank Bonnie and Martine and anybody else that was on council back then and brought this forward. I think it's just been such a tremendous asset to the community. And I remember when a fifth grader in my class presented it as a current event, I thought they were tricking me because I was like, what? No. They're putting up a stadium. How fast? Wait, what? No. And then just seeing just the fervor in which the community rallied behind the Warriors and the enthusiasm that they brought to the schools and the, um, the arts communities and bringing in, you know, uh, they had, you know, different people presenting at halftime or um, opening, and it just, I couldn't believe how exciting basketball became to um, everybody in town. And my own daughter danced with their Santa Cruz Junior Jam squad one year, and they got to go up and dance at the Golden State Arena. And so it's just all these opportunities that I think kids have got um, and just giving them a positive outlet. Um, I can't, I have nothing but wonderful things to say about this, even though I will never be a basketball player. I'm not even five feet tall, but I have become a huge fan. So, thank you. And I'll, I'll make a motion if anybody doesn't want to yet. <laughs> I'll second. <laughs> if I can make a motion, go ahead. I think. Um, All right, I'll make a motion. Support making Santa Cruz Warriors um, the permanent home in Santa Cruz and all of the language that's in our report. Do you want me to read it or? Um, I'll okay. okay. So I guess if I, if I heard you correctly, it's to motion to make support um, Santa Cruz Warriors making Santa Cruz the permanent home and adopting the recommendations as presented in the agenda report. That's what you heard. All right. And so I motion by Council Member Goldberg and second by Council Member Matthews. Um, Vice Mayor Myers, let's see every hand up next. Oh, I think I, I, I probably forgot to lower it, but um, yeah, I'm very excited, um, wonderful that we can, uh, we can, uh, we can work hard to make this happen. And I do also want to thank Martine for all his work over the years and several community, community members who have been just really instrumental in working with the Warriors for a long time. So, let's do it. Uh, I can't help but uh, point out that uh, our city manager has framed Warriors jerseys on the wall of his office. <laughs> so let's just note that. <laughs> I put up a couple of pennants in my <laughs> on my door there. Yeah, so it's a strong message. Absolutely. Uh, Council Member Watkins. Well, I'll just echo all the comments that were made. I had my hand up because I was ready to make a motion too. Thank you, Council Member Golder, and thank you to the Council Members that brought this forward. I think the Warriors, for all the reasons we've discussed, have been a really great um, attribute and contribution to our city, and we want to do our best to make them a permanent a resident here. So thank you for bringing this forward, and I'm hopeful we can get it done. Go Warriors. <laughs> Council Member Brown. Yeah, I'll just express my, my many thanks to everyone who's been involved in this process of, of bringing the Warriors here and working with them. Uh, Martine, Bonnie, I know, and I know you've, you've been doing a lot of work on this and we don't hear about it all the time, but, um, you know, I, I have been a basketball player and I love basketball. It's my favorite sport. Um, so I was so thrilled <laughs> to, to learn that they were um, coming. I know that there were, you know, initially some concerns about in the neighborhoods about the potential impacts and um, I haven't heard anything since you know since then and I think that just the, the whole way it's been handled has been uh, great I would uh, ask for a friendly men amendment to say enthusiastically support <laughs> um, <laughs> but other than that I'm, I'm uh, you know I'm, I'm just really happy to see this happening and I also want to appreciate Bonnie uh, you for making the comments about the concern about 
you know, subsidy subsidizing this project, and you know, and and you know, I think that that's some a conversation that we will have con ongoing about how the city can support the the warriors and find them a permanent home or help them produce a permanent home. So, thanks a lot, everybody. Team effort. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, I want to make one more comment. I wasn't on the council at the time that this, this concept was um, developed. It was a little break for me on council. But let's look at the calendar. That was happening when we were just coming out of that recession. And that was a pretty gloomy time. And I think right now, obviously, it's worse. But we, we sometimes feel kind of paralyzed by the reality ahead of us. And yet, this is a case where the leaders at the time took a look at an opportunity and saw what it, how it could develop into the future. So I think maybe that's instructive for us <laughs> at, at a time that is challenging, um, that in the long run, this can continue to be a really wonderful thing. So I just want to point out a little historical framing there. on the council when it, um, it all happened, very exciting. Uh, oh, just to remind, some of you didn't know this, but uh, the D team came from Bismarck, North Dakota, and I had 11 <laughs> family members who had season tickets to the Warriors in Bismarck, North Dakota. They were not happy with me, <laughs> but um, they they knew that they were they were going to leave. And good heavens, from Bismarck, North Dakota, winters to Santa Cruz, because the basketball season is in the winter, so it turned out very well. But I also want to acknowledge Tina Schultz was uh, at the time, right, Martine, uh, assistant city manager, and really provided a lot of the legwork that needed to be done and did. And uh, you're right, we did it right in the, the research in 2012, mm -hmm. 8 to 12. So, yes, it's wonderful, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'll just say it as well, you know, echoing all the, the excitement and sentiment about it. And I just will share my story behind this because when I first saw the stadium coming, I was like, who in Santa Cruz likes basketball? And why would Santa Cruz ever build a basketball stadium? And sure enough, um, Santa Cruz has proven that it loves its Warriors. And so I think that it's really important that we do what we can to keep this new special tradition alive in our community. Councilmember Golder. I just want to also, I, I thank you everybody again, but I was just thinking in my head, like it's really like super optimistic to think about that, yeah, we can't be together now, but someday and we're thinking long-term, we'll be able to gather again and go see sports and have fun. And so I think that's what makes this even more exciting mm -hmm. tonight. Yeah. And I just got an email, they're gonna start serving lunch tomorrow. There's like 10 different sites yes. for Santa Cruz mm -hmm. City Schools. With that, uh, we have a motion on the floor by Council Member Golder, seconded uh, by Council Member Matthews. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to the city clerk to call the roll for the support of the Santa Cruz Warriors, making Santa Cruz a home, home, the ecstatic support, and the, uh, the adoption of the recommendations that are in our agenda packet. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member is Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Um, thank you, staff, for inviting us to that meeting and for bringing this up to our attention so we can move forward and fingers crossed this will be the, the last home for the Kansas Warriors. Um, and with that, uh, we have 
The next item will be our evening, well, the next item will be oral communications, which will begin at 7 p.m. And so it looks like we have about an hour and 10 minute break. So we'll see you all back here at uh, 7 o'clock. All right, so we're just waiting for a couple more council members to join, and once we have anyone, everyone, we'll get started. Everybody's back, and I think we all have audio too. So, with that, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 7 p.m. session of the August 11, 2020 City Council meeting. I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Golder? Here. Watkins? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. Uh, first item on our evening agenda is oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for people who are streaming in the meeting or calling in to address the council on items that are not on our agenda. If you're interested in addressing the council, please press, please call in using the numbers on your screen and press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You'll have two minutes to speak. When it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comments so we can accurately capture it in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required. And with that, uh, we'll turn it over to the community for oral communications. So if you've called in, please press star nine on your phone and you will be given two minutes. Hi, my name is Brittany Potter and I am interested in getting um, the current Loudon Nelson Center name changed to actually reflect the man who it's named after, whose name is actually London Nelson. Um, he was actually a really remarkable man, a former slave who came in here in 1856. After he died, he left um, a pretty big section of property from Laurel Street all the way down, um, I believe, to Pacific Ave, where the clock tower is now. Um, and after he passed away, they erroneously changed or made an error in calling him Loudon when anything that predates his death is actually London, L-O-N-D-O-N. And I think what a better time than now to get that corrected. Great, thank you very much. Okay. 
see if there's any other member of the public who would like to speak to us uh, during oral communication on items that are not on our agenda this evening. Please call in using the numbers on your screen. And when you're ready to speak, please press star nine on your phone. You'll be given two minutes. Hi, this is Garrett Phillip. Hey, it's a miscellaneous thoughts. I see public correspondence in, is included in the public agenda packet only on the day of the meeting in the new website format, depriving the public of time to read it no matter when it was sent in. I'm wondering why the pride flags were allowed to be displayed more than a month beyond their journey, 30th expiration date. Maybe I missed it, but I never did see any BLM or Pan-African flags displayed or any BLM street mural, but I'm good with that as I think that brand is more than tarnished by the violent Marxist uncivilized death, injury, and destruction meted out nationwide used as cover by that banner for Marxist anarchist purposes. I wonder uh, what the stale date is on the BLM graffiti monument that is now the clock tower. I wonder when the Lighthouse Bank, my bank, will think it's safe for employees to return to work there. I wonder when the life dissatisfied many will figure out setting goals, obtaining skills, working daily toward those goals with respect for others' rights every day will result in a better world for all than blaming others, destruction, discrimination, seeking special government favors, revolution, and trashing all this great country has accomplished, no thanks to them while giving up theirs and everyone else's rights while abusing public property and the First Amendment. I wonder if or when respect for this country's ideals will return. The progressive left mess that is Chicago, Seattle, or Portland is just the headline ugly violence of chaos. It's really a lust for power and control over the people fed by a carrot of an unattainable utopian socialist communist fantasy, instigating violence in the weak minds of the misdirected frustrations of the life dissatisfied. Black lives matter, Marxist lives matter. That's where Santa Cruz politics is going if people sound ethics and virtue don't speak out or act or at least vote. May I seriously suggest to the mayor September be declared White Man Appreciation Month. They've done a lot for this country and I don't see the recognition coming from the council. No really, tell me why not. Bye. Justin, I think you're muted. If, if, you're, if the last four digits of your phone number 1703, uh, now's your opportunity to speak. Is that 1703? All right. Uh, hi, uh, council members and mayor. This is Barbara Meister. I'm with Holy Cross Catholic Church here in Santa Cruz. Um, we have several people who would like to speak tonight, um, not several, just a few, uh, on the uh, oral communications time period. Uh, we've been instructing them how to um, call in. So if you could just be patient a little bit to make sure uh, that our folks have a chance to call in. And I just wanted to make sure we allow enough time for them to have a chance to get in. It's very challenging to try to participate in these uh, public deliberations these days. So I would appreciate if you just give us a few minutes to make sure we can get folks um, in through the process. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Thank you for letting us know. That will move on to our next speaker.
has been unmuted? Yes. Okay. Hi, this is Beverly Day Show. I am the president of the Electric Auto Association of the California Central Coast. And um, I wanted to commend the council. I was not able to attend the meeting earlier, so I don't know actually what happened. I only saw the agenda. But I understand that you are at least considering the buying of our first large truck that's electrified, an electric garbage truck, which is an excellent choice for, uh, for electrification because every time they start up, they spew a lot of pollution. And um, so we, as an organization, have been working on this uh, in transportation electrified for, well, over 50 years. Uh, before we actually even had the uh, major manufacturers. So um, I spoke with our um, the director or the supervisor of our uh, waste management, Lupe, and she's very forward thinking, as is the council, for even considering this, um, and as MBART is for giving the grant. And um, she is very forward thinking because there were some obstacles that were just logistical, and she has come up with a way to uh, think outside the box and make it work. There wasn't enough room to have two spaces for the storage, so instead she's consolidating the, uh, the route. So uh, we commend you and look forward to the future of all of the fleet being electrified. And if you have any questions, I am available for consultation. I will find you a source for electric vehicle in that, um, in that type of uh, vehicle that you're looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Any other folks who'd like to comment during oral communications, please press star nine on your phone and you will have two minutes to speak. Okay, next caller. If you could please unmute your phone. I just wanted to um, make a couple points that first express some public support for the ofrenda that was mentioned by the gentleman earlier. Um, this is at the Bell Tower and has been in place by a lot of community members. And I think um, it's been a really great opportunity for some healing to happen. A lot of people have um, a gorgeous show of solidarity. So I just really wanted to just say that first, you know, that there are people out here who really benefited from having it out in our public spaces and to keep it up as long as possible. And then the other two points I wanted to address are that um, it would be really uh, beneficial for a lot of folks counties <coughs> ending the eviction moratorium indefinitely, not just keep pushing it off by a month or two each time people are um, living in really precarious situations right now and need to know that their housing is going to be safe until COVID has subsided. And September 30th feels like a very arbitrary date to have right now. And the second point I wanted to make is that city council needs to really um, start looking at adding rent cancellation and mortgage cancellation to their next agenda. This would be a huge undertaking, but as a community, I think we need to come together to brainstorm some ideas to alleviate some of the hardships that a lot of tenants and homeowners in Santa Cruz are facing right now. Um, they're going to only keep facing it until COVID subsides, and that is really indefinite. So we need to talk about some long-term solutions for folks. Thank you. Thank you. Again, if you would like to speak to any item, uh, or sorry, if you'd like to make a comment during oral communications on items that are not on our agenda, please press star nine on your phone after you've called in to raise your hand. Hello? 
Hello? If you're 3129, you're on the line. The last four digits of your phone number are 3129. You are able to speak. Okay, next speaker. Hello. Hello. Uh, hi, my name is Socorro Robles. Voy a hablar en español porque uh, no puedo hablar inglés mucho. Está bien. Mayor, we do have Peter on the line. Okay. Peter, do you want to help with translation? Sure. Sí, señora. Eh, si puede hablar, pero deme chance hasta cuando voy. Eh, dame una dos oraciones y después yo, yo lo traduzco para usted. Dele. Está bien. Gra gracias. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Socorro Robles. Good afternoon. I'm Socorro Robles. Y soy de la organización Sendero en Santa Cruz. And I'm from Sendero Santa Cruz uh, Organization. Uh, solamente quiero agradecerles a los concejales de Santa Cruz por I um, want to thank the city council. extender el moratorio para las familias to uh, extend the moratorium for the families de septiembre. Until the 30th of September. Y también quiero agradecerles por el programa de emergencia que tienen uh, para todos los alimentos que nos están dando. And I also want to thank you for all the emergency food that you have provided to the community. Uh, con nuestra organización agarramos 38 solicitudes de a familias y nos van a ayudar bastante con eso. With our organization, we've uh, helped 38 families, and that will help the tremendously the, the people. Estamos pidiéndoles, por favor, que no solamente nos ayuden con los 12 meses para poder recuperarnos. But we also would like to, to extend that help uh, for at least 12 months in order, to, in order to recuperate and for these people to get back on their feet. Porque no van a ser suficientes 12 meses, ya que nuestras necesidades son bastantes, pero estamos pidiendo un poquito para que nos ayudemos. Nosotros somos gente trabajadora. We are really uh, people who would like to work, and we think, uh, you know, 12 months is where we're going to need to uh, help to get back on our feet. Uh, tenemos jóvenes que están estudiando. Tenemos uh, muchachos que quieren seguir uh, estudiando. Y por toda esta situación no tenemos los recursos para mandarlos a las escuelas. Y nos gustaría que también... We have young students that also are willing to, to work and to study, uh, but the, with the COVID, they're unable to go to school, and with the funds we're helping to do to school them at home. Y nos gustaría también que ojalá la invitación también se hiciera para los jóvenes para que pudieran este, estar, ser parte de todo esto. So we would like to have to include the young people who also are affected with this uh, crisis and include them in the, also this recovery program. Uh, muchísimas gracias de parte de la organización Senderos, de parte de la organización Copa, de la que también somos miembros, y de parte de toda la comunidad latina en Santa Cruz y en todos los lugares donde están ayudando. And thank you very much to our organization Senderos, Copa, and the whole community who's helping out people who are in need. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. All right, good evening. Hi, my name is Nettie Garcia. I am a leader with COPA, and I wanted to thank you guys so much for this meeting and allowing our public comments. It means a lot to us. I have personally led two virtual house meetings, and I would like to thank Council Members Brown, Matthews, Watkins, and Myers for attending those meetings and agreeing to work with us. It really means a lot to us, means a lot to our community to feel so connected and so, and like they can really trust their council members. It's nice to see their face and kind of see them as one of us. So thank you so much for taking that time with us. We appreciate it. We also want to thank you for extending the moratorium to September 30th to help our families and also for having a emergency rental assistance program. We managed to help 38 families like apply for this program who are very thankful and blessed that you were able to do this. So once again, thank you. And um, I am calling to request a 12 month payback period for rent that is owed for, well, you know, many families during this crisis. I have called countless families to invite them to their virtual house meetings and it always ends up with them telling kind of tragic stories about like their difficulties and their struggle to pay back rent once the moratorium is over. So thank you for, for having us. Thank you for letting me this moment to speak and I invite all of you to our next virtual house meetings and I hope to keep seeing you guys there and to keep working with us. Thank you. Thank you. The last four digits of your phone number, 3129, you are now able to speak. If there are any other members of the public who'd like to speak on oral communications, uh, now is the time to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand if you have not spoken already. Alguien hispano puede hablar ahorita. Okay. Do one more time with three one two nine. Okay. We're gonna move on to the next caller. My name is uh, Candace Brown uh, from Santa Cruz. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I just want to speak briefly and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm not a renter, but I'm talking to members of my community, including people that I formerly worked with, uh, colleagues and friends. And some of them are describing situations that are quite dire where they have been working in retail. Um, and they were laid off. And then they have not, for strange reasons, been able to receive unemployment because of uh, delays by EDD. And in, in one case in particular, I know they have not received it and they're still pending and they've been waiting for months. They are living in affordable housing, um, but they were concerned that they would have to leave the affordable housing because they would have no income and no guaranteed income. And so I'd like to ask the city to look into a situation where people are with are expecting uh, EDD um, and they could get a huge lump sum at some point, um, but also in affordable housing. And so could they have a deferment until such time as they could work out the issues with EDD, which could take more than you know, September 30th. I just wanted to make you aware of this. Um, I know people in my community that are having serious mental health problems because of this, and I'm quite concerned in some cases. So I wanted to reach out to you and let you know about the situation. So thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> 
here, the last four digits are 4041 down the line. Uh, si, buenas tardes. Um, si me escuchan? Si. Yeah. Um, mi nombre es uh, Carlos Romero. Y soy uh, miembro uh, de la Iglesia Holy Cross y líder de Copa. Okay, uh, me chance yo traducir. So my name is uh, Carlos Romero, and I'm uh, um, I'm from the Holy Cross uh, Church, and also with the uh, NGO Copa. Chiquele. Uh, solo quería agradecerles al al, al consejo um, por participar en nuestras juntas caseras virtuales. So I'd like to thank the city council to have participated into the virtual uh, home uh, meetings. Y reiterarles de agradecerles uh, por la extender el moratorio para prevenir los desalojos hasta el 30 de septiembre. And also to extend the moratorium for house eviction in the, until the 30th of September. Y agradecerles también por el programa de emergencia de asistencia de alquiler e informar sobre nuestro, uh, sobre nuestro alcalde a través de uh, the, the, and also for the extending the house eviction program uh, and the assistance on rental emergency. Hasta donde alcance y a través de las despensas de alimentos que obtuvimos y, y obtuvimos 38 solicitudes para la solicitud de, de la alquiler, uh, de asistencia de alquiler. And we also like to thank everybody about the 38 uh, uh, applications and that we received uh, to help uh, 38 families to pay their rent. Y pedir al consejo un periodo más de 12 meses para poder recordar, recuperarnos con pagar la renta debido durante esta pandemia cuando la emergencia, hasta que la emergencia termine and ask for an extension of possibility of 12 months uh, without rent to be able to recover for, uh, and be back on their feet. Y de nuevo cuenta, pues, uh, uh, invitarlos a, a los miembros de, del Consejo a otra reunión en el futuro para uh, participar y trabajemos juntos en apoyo a la comunidad. Y muchas gracias. And they would like very much to also have uh, some of the members of the city council to participate in another virtual house me meeting. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Gracias a usted. Okay, next speaker, you're all on. Yes, hi. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, city council members and mayor. My name is Jorge Savala. I'm a leader at Holy Cross Parish and Santa Cruz Community Health. And um, co the food pantry for the last uh, four months since uh, March. And so, as you hear today, um, you know, we do have a couple of community members that were successfully able to connect, but others that still haven't been able to. However, um, I just want to reiterate the thanks for creating the emergency uh, rental assistance program. We were successful in connecting 38 families to that program, and we'll be following up with them to see them through it. And if they do not qualify, we have developed a system to help them connect with other resources. And so we know that this uh, cannot just be on the city, and so we're partnering with other resource centers to help these families in this process. But we do need the city to uh, step up again um, and help with those families that may not owed before August, but will owe rent after August because they are all working very minimal hours at this time with many families only having one person working three days a week instead of five. And so we would also like to reconvene on the idea of a payback period. I heard the translation earlier with Carlos, and we are not asking for 12 months of free rent, but a 12 month payback period for the rent that is owed for families as they recover. So we look forward to reconnecting with city council members and talking about this in the near future. Thank you and have a good evening. Yeah. 
Okay, next caller. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Liz Robles, and I am an active member of the organization Senderos um, in Santa Cruz. Um, first of all, thank you for accepting my call. Um, I would like to thank you, um, you know, for having us here and for being able to. Uh, this has been working with our community through these very hard times to help our, our especially uh, Latinx families who are going through a very difficult time right now. Their hours being cut out. Well, Still, um, you know, having a family to support, um, and so we would like to first of all thank you for everything you do, you do for the city of Santa Cruz, as well as um, extending um, the moratorium. And we would also like to ask if, if we could hopefully extend um, back to 12 months for the, the help with rent since that is something that many of our families are having a very difficult time figuring out how are they going to keep their homes. Um, in addition, we'd like to thank the city for uh, providing places around the city to be able to pick up food for those families who might need it. Um, so thank you very much, and um, Senderos really encourage encourages any one of our members um, to please come out. Maybe we help these families once a month if you are ever able to see how all your help and the help in our community, the changes that it does for our families, that would be great. So we would just like to thank you for your help thus far, and we hope that you continue with the support as well as um, extend the help for the 12 months coming. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to our last caller um, and try to see if this. So, if the last four digits of your phone number are 3129, please unmute your phone and you're, you're able to speak. Buenas tardes, ¿me escuchan? Sí. Um, me llamo Isabel Velasco y soy miembro de la parroquia de Holy Cross, líder de, la, de Copa. Uh, my name is Isabel, espérenme dos segundos para que pueda traducir. So, good evening, my name is Isabel Velasquez, and I'm also with the NGO COPA. Dele. Quiero agradecerle al consejo, a los miembros que participaron en nuestras uh, juntas uh, caseras virtuales. I would like to thank the city council and for the people of the members who came to our virtual house meeting. Um, también uh, les quiero agradecer por el programa de emergencia para asistir uh, en el alquiler de, de las personas que han tenido problemas en pagar su renta. And also in the emergency assistance program, helping people who had, could not make ends meet for the under rent. Este, nuestro programa eh, este, sometió 38 solicitudes. Espero que la mayoría o todos califiquen. Uh, we have submitted 38 applications and we hope that all of them will qualify. Uh, ahora eh, nos gustaría pedirles una extensión de 12 meses para que nuestras familias puedan pagar su renta. Uh, so so we'd we'll like to have an ex uh -huh. so we'd we'll like to have an extension of 12 months rent help. Ah, uh, sigue disculpa. Ah, uh, sí. Y también gracias por extender el moratorio hasta septiembre 30 y esperamos que eh, estén de acuerdo en, en extender los 12 meses para pagar. And we hope that uh, you will extend the 12 months help to pay our rent. And also, thank you for extending the moratorium on rent eviction until the 30th of September. Fue un placer estar con ustedes en la casa, en la casa virtual. Y nos gustaría invitarlos para que el futuro regresen y podamos colaborar juntos. Gracias. It was, a, it was a pleasure to be with you on our virtual house meetings, and we hope to see you again.
Okay, with that, we're gonna uh, close out our oral communications and we're gonna move on to our last item of the day, uh, which is our item number 34, uh, Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness. Presenters this evening are Cash, also known as the Cash Club, well, our Cash Co Chair, Candace Elliott and Taj Leahy. We also have our facilitator for the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness, Fred Keeley. And our other chair, um, chairs of the subcommittee, will also be available to ask questions. And those individuals are Amy Chen Mills, name. Hope I got that right. Aram Nichols and Rafa Sonnenfeld. And so with that, I'll turn it over to the presenters who are bringing this item forward this evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor and Madam Vice Mayor, members of the City Council, and those of the public who are participating as well. Um, my name is Fred Keeley. Uh, I am uh, have the privilege of having been asked by the mayor uh, a year and a few months ago if I would be the convener of your uh, of the catch. And I want to be clear what that is. Uh, what my duties are is as a uh, convener and as a guide, if you will, to assist the catch in getting their work done. Uh, uh, I do not have and did not have a vote on this body. It's more like being a presiding officer without a vote. Uh, the uh, council in the first quarter established the catch with a clear mandate to take a look at work that had been done by predecessor interests uh, on two different occasions, uh, once in the late 90s and one in the relatively late uh, 2010s. And those reports looked at a range of issues around those experiencing homelessness, as well as our general community in terms of homelessness as well. Uh, the catch came together for its first meeting after the council had made your appointments to the catch and gave a charge to the catch to make a couple of other appointments as it deemed appropriate to fill out the representation uh, on the catch so that it was a truly representative body in terms of both the housed community and the unhoused community and various segment, segments therein. Uh, the, uh, uh, I think it, in my judgment anyway, the appointments did in fact reflect that diversity in our city. Uh, and a special note of thanks uh, for the council uh, making sure that those who had lived experience in terms of homelessness, uh, that their voices were on and heard at the, uh, at the catch from beginning uh, to end. Um, in July of 2019, the first catch meeting was held, and at that, the body made its initial organizational decisions, selecting uh, Taj Leahy and Candace Elliott as their co-chairs by unanimous decision. I will use that point to say that uh, it was the goal of the catch on every single vote, and they cast about 320 votes over the course of time, that all but one of those votes was a unanimous consensus agreement. Let me be careful about what that means. That doesn't mean everyone jumped up and down and was thrilled uh, with what they voted for necessarily every time, uh, but there was robust and seriously robust debate and discussion. Uh, yet at each one of those votes, when the time came to shape a motion and to move forward, consensus was achieved. As I say, there was one vote uh, that particularly sticks in my mind that was not a unanimous vote, but the others were. 
the uh, uh, at that organizational meeting, in addition to selecting co-chairs, uh, the body adopted there and at subsequent meetings bylaws so that they could operate uh, with a set of rules of the road that everyone, both members of the catch as well as members of the public, would understand what the rules of the road were. Uh, the catch also indicated that it very much wanted to have significant public outreach and engagement. And as a consequence of that, not only uh, were the catch meetings held in the evening so that uh, folks could be able to attend, there were also times where the catch moved its meeting from the police community station to the veterans hall to one of the high schools uh, so that uh, the body could move around and engage segments of the community uh, as, as would be the case. Uh, during many of the initial, I would say, dozen or so of the catch meetings, uh, they were a combination of two things. One was getting everyone up to speed on the issue, which is, to put it mildly, compound and complex. And so panels of folks were invited to come and present. Uh, across a fairly wide spectrum of opinions and points of view. And those were made typically at the front end for the first hour or so of the catch meetings, and then the catch would pivot to its actual business in terms of decision making. You are, uh, uh, one other point I'd like to make about the organizational meeting, that is uh, Mayor reference that there are other folks in addition to to myself and, and Taj and Candace, uh, we have chairs of the relevant subcommittees of the body, and this is worth taking a second on it. Uh, the body is a was good sized body, you know, just over a dozen folks. Uh, so getting work done between meetings in order for the meetings to be decision making, debate and discussion and decision making a subcommittee structure was set up and each of the three subcommittees had a lane that they were going to work in and debate and discuss issues in that lane and then bring it forth to the catch for consideration. Uh, some of those folks are, are with you this evening as well and, and certainly will make substantive. My presentation's a process, subs uh, process uh, presentation uh, the co-chairs and other members of the catch will make substantive presentations to you in a few minutes. The uh, One of the first things that the catch did and spent some time on was the following notion, and that is that although the city of Santa Cruz is the most obvious place where folks living uh, and experiencing homelessness, uh, it, is, it is the most obvious place in terms of visibility, in terms of seeing folks living in our community, part of our community who are experiencing homelessness. Not so much in the county, not so much in the other three cities. That's not to say it doesn't happen. We know that it does. Uh, but we do know that in the city of Santa Cruz, it's fairly visible. That uh, gave rise to an issue that the, that the catch went at when looking at previous reports, and that was that some of the previous reports on this issue to the city made it seem as if the city government is totally responsible or largely responsible for addressing the issue in all of its manifestations. One of the things the catch did early was educate themselves about who in fact does have what responsibility when it comes to working with and assisting those members of the community who are experiencing homelessness. It was clear that the federal government has essentially left the field a very long time ago. The state governments, both in California and elsewhere, are really the levels of government that make the policy and provide most of the funding for dealing with those experiencing, working with those who are experiencing homelessness. In that regard, the state of California 
uh, about two years ago made a serious commitment uh, to housing generally and affordable housing in particular, and then those experiencing homelessness as a component part of that. That money, both general fund money and bond money was directed to counties. Counties are literally, as you probably know, I don't mean to provide a civics lesson, you know this, but counties are literally a subdivision of the state of California. Uh, legislature could go into session tomorrow and say, instead of 58 counties, we're gonna have 158 counties, and that would be the law. Counties deliver are the delivery mechanisms for the state's programs of health, human services, and to some degree, criminal justice system. Cities are not designed by their very nature to provide those services. That is, that is not their function. They do it as an adjunct function. They do it if they wish to do it. They do it by allocating uh, general fund money in various cases. But in terms of governmental design, what the catch learned is that the state and the counties are really in the lead on this to get actual progress in many cases. And that was one of the things that the catch did in terms of its series of recommendations to you is to recommend to you those things you can do and are uniquely positioned to do as opposed to here's every recommendation, you figure out what the proper level of government is for dealing with it. The, uh, in December of 2019, the first report came forward from the catch by unanimous vote, by consensus, to you. Uh, that report contained nine recommendations, and all nine of those were, were accepted and then adopted by the city council with direction to the city management uh, to implement those recommendations. This is where uh, I would like to pause and thank Susie O'Hara and Megan Bunch, uh, Ron Prince, city staff generally for their assistance in helping the catch do its work by doing research and providing it back, by answering questions, providing information back to the catch. It was enormously helpful uh, to the catch and literally could not have been done without that level of staffing. But the catch is not the city government. The catch is an advisory body to you. What you've received from them is their work and their thoughts and opinions about how to deal with this vexing issue in positive and substantial ways. That led the catch to its February 2020 presentation to you, which contained 22 recommendations. The first set in December were what could be done immediately. Where can you locate some temporary bathrooms, some sanitation facilities, some sleeping areas? Some, what are things that could be done right now? In February, it was, here's a couple of more of those, but here are some medium-term recommendations that the catch has distilled down from an enormous amounts and hours of, of meetings and input. And those recommendations were forwarded to you. And the council uh, then from that list selected a fairly large number uh, that you not only accepted, but that you then turned those around and operationalized those. In uh, this recommendation, which you are receiving now, this report contains four which the co-chairs will be going for. By design, the first report was immediate, short-term, quick, what can be done. Second report, midterm. These now tonight are recommendations that have a longer term to them uh, so that together this body of work can result in better outcomes. I will say uh, two quick things. The grand jury has also issued a report on the topic of homelessness, and I was asked to be prepared to make some comments on that. I will say I will be very brief on this. 
the grand jury's report, I think like all grand jury reports, uh, are uneven. Uh, it, uh, this particular report, I think, matched up quite well with the kind of look at what the government Uh, roughly speaking, those involved community engagement, uh, effective governance on this issue, insufficient resources, and utilization of existing resources. I will say this about that report. They had a total of 18 recommendations, the grand jury. They had nine recommendations of those 18, which solely were directed at the county of Santa Cruz. They had eight recommendations, which were directed at the county of Santa Cruz, all four cities. They had one recommendation unique to the city of Santa Cruz, and it matches up to one of the major recommendations you will hear this evening. So I don't think they're very far apart in terms of what they're doing. I do think that they got the same education maybe that the catch got, which is, I'll sort of close where I started. The fact that those experiencing homelessness that we can, that is obvious in our community and maybe not as obvious in the three other cities and in the county at large, does not make it solely the, the city's responsibility to solve. So I think you see that where the catch got very focused on what this city government uh, can do effectively on this issue. Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, members of City Council, thank you for every kindness you've extended to me during this period of time and for the privilege of being the convener of this organization, excuse me, of this uh, committee. And I would now like to turn it back to the mayor. I believe you will be calling on both Taj Leahy and Candace Elliott. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, before we continue, I need to take a, a quick break. We have, we're having an issue down here at City Hall, so if we can just pause the meeting uh, for about um, so we can see I think it's City Hall. So we'll be right back in about five minutes. Mr. Mayor, I, I, I think if, if I might, uh, Mr. Mayor, I think this is the point where uh, Candace Elliott and Taj Leahy will make presentations on the final report, sir. Great, thank you. I'll uh, we'll just wait for a couple more minutes for other council members to join. Once we have everybody on, we'll get started again. on uh, council members Matthews, Byers, and Watkins to join the meeting.
Welcome over to back at their computers. If you could please turn your video on once you're back so we can get started. So in the interest of time, maybe we'll just go ahead and get started and hopefully my team will jump on here in a minute. Perfect. Okay. Great. So I'll pass it over to our two co-chairs from the catch, Taj Leahy and Candace Elliott. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Members. Uh, thank you, Fred, for that wonderful uh, introduction and a uh, little history lesson as to what um, CATCH has done in the past year. Um, it's been an amazing journey, and um, we couldn't have done it alone, so thank you to the staff as well. Um, Susie and Megan have been instrumental and amazing throughout this whole process. <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to jump right into recommendations. We have just a few uh, this time. Uh, as Fred said, some of the recommendations that we've had in the past were pretty hefty and uh, lengthy. Given COVID, uh, we just have to call it what it is, COVID kind of threw a monkey wrench into a lot of things. However, that said, um, a lot of really great strides have been made in the city, and it's pretty wonderful to see. So what we have is the first one is uh, sanctioned camping and safe sleeping given the covid pandemic much of the homelessness response was taken on by city and county staff which is wonderful many strides were made in terms of setting up managed encampments the catch recommends that the city maintain a similar or larger scale of safe sleeping through covid 19 recovery and beyond and use lessons learned during the covid 19 response to ensure constant improvement and community compatibility in short to keep doing what is being done right now to house our fellow community members. If you look around town, you will see several different um, encampments that have been put up. And from what I've heard, they're working really well. And so we're just asking that they continue from this point on. And that's our first recommendation. Candace. Thanks, Tosh. Um, thank you to all of you council members uh, and to staff who has been so helpful through this whole process. Um, our second recommendation is around community engagement. Um, in short, we recommend you keep doing community engagement around homelessness. Um, there are, it's a very dynamic space. Um, I've definitely learned that through this process. Uh, there are a lot of sort of changing stakeholders. There are a few stakeholders that are consi consistent who are sort of always there, but I think a lot of the key people inside of, say, nonprofit organizations and other sort of government positions change over on a regular basis, and so continuing, continuing to engage those people is really important. Um, I've seen some of the great side effects of community engagement. I think that um, it's a way that our community gets to know each other. It's a way that our community can share their perspectives. Um, but it's also a way that we can inform people about things that are going on and include them in the decision-making process. Um, as an HR manager, I know that people really hate uncertainty, and this is definitely a space where there is a lot of uncertainty for all of the people involved. Um, so the more that we can be engaging in the community, the more we can share information, the more comfortable people in general will be with whatever decision it is that happened, even if um, there's disagreement about which way to move forward. And I'll turn it back to Tosh. Great, thank you. Um, that was one of the things that was a pretty much unanimous yes all the time when we had our meetings. That sharing with the community what's happening, asking the community for feedback uh, was a way to get the temperature, but also a way to bridge um, some of the gaps that may have existed. Um, thank you, Candace. So 
we go to uh, public health. Um, under COVID-19, the city has deployed dozens of new portable restrooms and hand-washing facilities. It's been kind of wonderful to see because that was something that we recommended from, uh, I think, our, our second uh, report. But um, we were just asking for a couple uh, to start small. And because of COVID, one of the things we can say thank you for is that there are restrooms everywhere and uh, hand-washing facilities. And so we're asking uh, simply to just leave those up um, throughout covid after that, um, and let's continue to fund those and also maybe make them a little prettier so that um, it will cut down on graffiti potential, but then also make it so that it blends into the community, community a little bit better. Um, and that is it for our last recommendation. Or excuse me, my third recommendation. <laughs> So our, our last recommendation to review with you tonight is envisioning Coral Street as a space where a navigation center, additional services can be located. Um, Coral Street is that street right over by Costco that typically has quite a number of people who are experiencing homelessness living on the street, living um, near the train tracks, on the train tracks, um, using the train tracks as a way to um, move from where people are living further out in the Poganip and, and in the forest towards town. And there oftentimes people see um, drug use happening there. Um, and in other cities, it has worked to take places such as that and to locate services there and to to um, sort of reimagine what the space looks like. And so by providing services, um, it actually ends up improving um, the, the location for the whole community and not just for the people who um, are currently using the space. Um, Housing Matters is already located on that street. I don't know if many of you have had the ability to tour Housing Matters, but being able to go inside of that space and see what it actually looks like there is much different from what it looks like on the street. Um, and so our our sort of vision is, or a vision to look at would be um, to have that be a more comprehensive space where services can be offered for people um, who need them. So I would like to turn it back to the mayor. Um, thank you for giving us this time this evening to speak with you. We're here to answer your questions. Rafa and Amy, Susie and Megan are all also here to answer your questions this evening. Okay, well, thank you for all the hard work that you've all done over the course of this past year to really engage with the community, um, you know, working together as well to find consensus, even though everybody wasn't happy. It sounds like you were able to, you know, make recommendations that were reflective of a, a, an agreement that the community could collectively make together. So very appreciative. Um, the work that you all have been doing. Um, I'll start by opening it up to council members to, to see if they have any questions. And we'll start with Council Member Golder. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to thank everybody on this committee for the hours of volunteer work you did um, for your community and um, bringing this report forward to us. I know um, you sacrificed you know, time and energy, and I really wholeheartedly appreciate that, and I know the whole community does, so thank you. Um, and homelessness is an issue that's near and dear to my heart, and um, I hope that we can work together to make things better for people who are experiencing homelessness. So thank you. Council Member Byers. Um, the the uh, community engagement um, I read it and I still left it. I think I've been banging my head against the wall for about 20 years trying to get the community engaged and participate in this issue, um, totally unsuccessfully. Probably the little bit of success is uh, I'm on the board of the Housing Matters, been on that since the late 80s when it was, it's been named many things, but now it's Housing Matters. When we give tours, we know when we get people behind that gate and the other side of that gate, they are so impressed. And they they hear about, they learn about it. But that's only, you know, four people a month or something like that. It, it just, it isn't working. So I don't know, I want to ask you very specifically if you ran into any ideas, and even in reading your report, I didn't see things specific that 
people like myself could do or our organization could do maybe or the city could do. You want me to take that one? Sure, please. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I got to be one of those four people a month ago <laughs> for Housing Matters when it was really amazing. Um, I was there with Sibley. So um, the way that we approached community engagement was to create a, sort of the first hour of our, a few of our meetings was focused towards specific topics related to homelessness. Um, and so one of them was focused on public health and hygiene. Another one was very focused on um, safe sleeping in campgrounds. And we invited people to participate in sort of a brainstorming process. And then we took that data and information and used it in order to make our recommendations. Um, and I, the details of that process are in our previous reports, but I would be happy to expound on them at a later date if that would be helpful sure, sure. to the council. Yeah, thank you. The other one, I just um, absolutely agree with all the work you've done and all your recommendations and not only implement, anxious to implement, but follow through that they stay implemented, if that's a correct jargon uh, word. Uh, as you know, Housing Matter, their whole mission is get people in housing. Until we get them in a house, are we going to end homelessness? And of course, that's a big, uh, but we do know it works and it's successful. You know, get them a place to live with a case manager and they will stay. And I think we've done, I think um, 180, 180, probably got close to 1,000 in housing, and um, Housing Matters gotten close to 500. So that's almost 1,500 off the street today, and half of those were on the street maybe two years ago. So this didn't really speak to it, and I know what it means is affordable housing, but I think even if we can just keep, all of us keep our eye on that ball, with increase the case managers will will really meet an meet an overwhelming plea from the community is and I don't want to use off the streets but that is why we get them in housing and uh, and 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 we know the statistics are showing that they're staying you know it takes a lot of work and a lot of case management but but they they stay so anyway and maybe you'll have a fifth report or something one of these days and you could address it. Thank you. I think that's all. And thank you for the words about Coral Street. We're working very hard on Coral Street and it's so unfortunate that the city wasn't able to buy that building because um, right next door that would have just really tied everything together and we'd be so far down the road in resolving the immediate issues. But we're, we're working on it and I'm sure you everybody involved in city and county will continue to work on finding a navigation center. Thank you. Can I just add something on housing? Yes. For me, yes, please. The, the mayor. mayor. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. Something that's just so important to keep at the top of mind right now is to keep people from losing their housing. Yes, we need to keep people in the houses that they have mm -hmm. and, and thinking creatively about the open spaces that we have available and commercial space houses that are being rented at this time. And if I might, very brief comment. Um, Council Member Byers, uh, during the lifetime of the CAT, the co-chair and the CAT invited various folks. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a federal official who came and made a rather lengthy for state and county officials as well uh, who did. It, it, uh, we were mindful of what Governor Newsom said at his first State of the State address, which is that shelter solves your sleeping problem, but a navigation center helps solve your homeless problem. And there, that two-step move is the one in terms of capital outlay and why uh, I believe anyway, as an observer of it, uh, not as a policymaker at the catch, but that the catch very much dialed into the idea 
that a lot of what's going on over uh, at Housing Matters is the thing, damn near everything that needs doing gets done over there, but it needs to be four, five, or six times as much of it. That 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 was, I think, where the the cat settled uh, on that issue. Th thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could I um, speak to the community dialogue piece? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, I know that we have a few new councils, and um, I have been other reports uh, you know, of the catch, but one of the um, directives for us was to look into the idea of wisdom council. And um, we did that. We explored wisdom councils with Jim Ruff, who's the founder of wisdom councils. And there was actually um, an independent wisdom council like pilot set up that included former, former council members, Don Lane um, and other people, both advocates and people who've been, I guess you could say more conservative on this issue, were all in the room together. And we recommended that the council explore the idea. My experience being on the catch was the sort of the cumbersome nature of being in a government body, trying to have conversations when people come up and they have two minutes to talk and then you don't get to respond. You don't really get to have a dialogue. You know, and so I would highly recommend the council look into wisdom councils and or dynamic facilitation or some kind of a, um, a place where people can really talk and get to some deeper matters around this. Um, I found it very frustrating to be on the catch the, and not everyone was a great person on the catch. It's just that with the way the agenda is set up, the way that um, it has to be facilitated the way public comments happen. It's very formalized. And I really felt like we couldn't get to some real, um, what are the deeper issues on this wisdom council that we did have, which was more of a pilot than an actual council. We, I heard things from people that were very new to me, like that there was less resistance to encampments than there was to tents from some people. And people were so concerned about tents. And yet I thought that they were resistant to having any encampments at all, and they weren't. These people that I saw as more conservative, for example. And then Brent Adams was there, and he brought up the idea of, um, you know, we do need housing, and housing is great, but we, in the meantime, happening, and sort of emphasizing, like, what is happening now for people? I sort of was saying the housing first, um, issue at this time and it'll take time and so anyway there were a lot of things that came up and dialogues that happened between people who normally wouldn't even be in the same room together um and everyone sort of coming to to some new understandings at least so i'm just putting that out there that's sort of why i joined the catch was i was interested in new ways of community dialogue and i think that there's ways out there it doesn't have to be wisdom councils but ways to engage the community that really can get to some sort of root, more root cause discussion and sort of real solutions, if that makes any sense. Because there's a depth that I think has been missing around this conversation. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so next up we have Council Member Brown, Vice Mayor Myers, and then Council Member uh, Watkins. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. I could spend a lot of time talking about how wonderful and dedicated you all are and have been and how much work you put in uh, um, and kind of how how inspiring it is. I'll leave it there because we don't want to stay later than we need to. Um, and I also want to thank Amy. Thank you for bringing that up. It's a constant kind of mm, frustration of mine as well that the way our public meetings are set up uh, they, as they need to be uh, does not allow for that kind of uh, in-depth conversation. And so I really want to just put out my two cents supporting uh, the city taking a role and in, in staying committed to trying to facilitate those spaces or at least be part of them in some way. Um, I think that that will really 
uh, keep us moving in the right direction in, in the community. I've been really heartened by uh, the way that people have kind of just um, been okay with, uh, ex you know, pretty significant expansion of safe, safe sleeping spaces zones um and so i think that there that really provides us with an opportunity to keep moving forward and i thank you for your recommendations um and i just as an aside i'm just going to say because i have it here um council member byers mentioned that she's been con thinking about that community engagement uh process and the challenges with it for about 20 years now and i'm looking at minutes from um, uh, uh july 2000 council meeting <laughs> when a homeless South Wars was uh, reporting back to you all and you were there so it, it's been more than 20 years um, <laughs> but I so I you know I do hope that we can really make some you know like just with more kind of uh, focused attention to how we do that um, we can you know keep moving forward my question uh, is about the um, the Coral Street uh, Arian, I, I, I'm glad to see that that uh, was one of the main recommendations you're bringing us now as a space that can be better configured or expanded upon. And I know we had, there was a, a lost opportunity or um, foreclosed opportunity with the, um, the, the, the space over there, which may reopen. But in the meantime, was there any, like what was the conversation like and what, were there any sp more specific ideas about like what housing matters would need, what level of uh, like, are they of openness and willingness to be part of that, are they? And kind of, uh, just to get a little bit more of a sense of what would it take to really achieve that vision. Um, so I'm just, that's just a, you know, kind of an open question. If we all thought, talked about that, I'd love to hear more. Yeah, I think this would be a great question for Susie O'Hara to take if uh, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, you saw that I prematurely unmuted and my kid walked by and slammed the door. Um, good evening, council members. <laughs> I'm so pleased to be here and I, I do want to also reiterate my thanks to the entire catch for their dedication during this process and then of course the, the assistance of, of Megan and Ron um, and Fred, of course, was just um, created such a space for um, success. Sorry, there's my kid again. So um, with regard to Coral Street, I will say that the concept of really looking at Coral Street, the entire campus area around Housing Matters and thinking about how to best utilize all of the real assets that we have and potentially could look into um, utilizing and on behalf of really the county and the city, we have over the last several months since COVID um, kind of changed our entire dynamic um, back in March have been engaging really directly with Housing Matters and the county on re-envisioning that area. It's falling um, under the county's shelter and care task force of which I sit on and some of our other colleagues here at the city and Housing Matters um, sits on as well. And we are working with Nielsen um, Design Studios to think about how best to um, create navigation center, housing center um, programming uh, at Coral Street. And that is really gonna take a heavy lift on behalf of the county and the city um, to think about immediate COVID response, um, to ensure that folks that are congregating on Coral Street are doing um, that in a way that's safe with regard to social distancing, but also to uh, lower barriers of access to the important services there, both at HPHP, the Homeless mm -hmm. Personal Health Project, as well as Housing Matters. And Nielsen um, has really done a tremendous amount of work already. A few council members have been able to engage in this process, and I'd be really happy to bring more information to the entire council on that. But it is um, really hopefully going to change the dynamic on Coral Street and make it a community center that can be appreciated and um, really invite the greater community into um, solutions around homelessness. So I'm happy to talk more about that, Sandy, um, at a future council meeting or one-on-one -on -one, um, and share also some preliminary design considerations that Nielsen has um, provided in early in these conversations. Uh, 
uh, Vice Mayor Myers, and then we'll have Councilman Watkins. Good evening, uh, Taj and Candice and Amy and any other cash members who are there this evening. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Keeley, for all your guidance for this group. Um, I think sometimes it's hard to kind of understand when you're looking from the local perspective why things aren't getting done or why you can't fix something, even though you have a compassionate community that really wants to help. So I think, you know, reminding everyone about the history of and federal priorities, lack of funding, um, closing, you know, some of our mental health facilities in the late 70s in California. I mean, we're, we're seeing a, a, you know, we're experiencing something that's been in place and, and kind of coming at us for quite some time. And so uh, it's a massive policy question. It's a massive policy puzzle to solve. Um, and I appreciate all the people on the cash who put their time into this. I think the cash was especially different than what we've tried before in that we intentionally involved um, medical folks on this committee. We intentionally involved um, people who were either living or had experienced homelessness. Um, we involved communications people, different people who brought different skill sets. And, um, and I know government, um, government interaction is frustrating in that it is so rigorous and so confined in terms of how you present and how you get to have discussions. Um, but uh, I, I'm just very pleased with the work. Uh, I'm very supportive of the recommendations. And I uh, just want to thank you all for all that time and energy. I think you were meeting weekly for a whole year, and um, that's an extensive committee commitment. Uh, and so, um, and I think we've also just been able to, um, you know, gather more voices in this community to about solving the issue. And, um, so, you know, I'm confident that you guys have brought us another big step forward, actually a leap forward. Uh, and um, I, you know, I'm just very thankful just for that. I, um, I was uh, lucky last year, last summer, um, to be able to go to the National Homeless, uh, National Conference to End Homelessness, actually with some leaders from Housing Matters. And um, it's an excellent conference, it's five days, and um, I, over that period of time, I talked to many, many, many communities who had been where we were and are in different places today. And um, there is a systems approach that can be followed that helps these individuals in our community to become successful in their lives again. And um, there's also a clinical approach, and there's a way on how you provide and how you prioritize, um, you know, care for this community. So I think we can do it. I'm very optimistic. We're going to need the state's help, uh, and we're going to need our whole community's help. Our whole county uh, will need to pitch in on this. But um, I'm confident that there's a, a road we can follow, and uh, I think you guys really important priorities for us as a community. So thanks for your work. And um, I, I don't know how else to say, you know, just just my utmost appreciation and sincere gratitude to every one of you for all your dedication and work. I was on the council when you decided to jump into this position, and it was a very difficult time for our community, and it was a very contentious time for our community. And you um, you went into it, and you you really you. You led with your values and you found common ground around compassionate solutions to homelessness and houselessness in our community. And I have just so much appreciation to every single one of you. I don't know how else to say that. I would give you a, a, a trophy if I could. Um, I know it was a lot of just countless hours on behalf of the staff as well as just your volunteer time. And I too am just so supportive of the, the work you accomplished. I was having a conversation with a colleague recently and it's we were talking about homelessness, just homelessness and houselessness. It's everything at this moment. It's 
it's lack of affordable housing, it's mental health issues, it's uh, racism, it's long-term poverty, this, these long-term crisis crises that we've seen coming, and I know um, the Vice Mayor just mentioned some of those. It, it's so many things, and it's sometimes overwhelming and, um, and has been paralyzing to a certain extent in our community. And we need tangible solutions, but we also need to seek this moment for transformation, in my opinion, and how can we rebuild in a way that's uh, really prioritizing uh, affordable housing and well-being for all and interrupting some of these uh, cycles, if you will, um, of poverty and 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 really getting the resources to those that need it in a way that will get them out of homelessness and to a successful life um, independently. And I know that's not for all, and we and we have to recognize that too. Um, but at the but the end of the day, it requires our community coming together and your ability as a committee to go through some of these very difficult conversations with. A, a number of criticisms I know, uh, and and come up with these recommendations uh, almost unanimously with, with absent a few. I mean, it's just remarkable about what can be done. So I, I just want to kind of highlight that because I think that's really core and critical to what took place here. Um, and 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 so I'll, I'll leave that because we were going. work over in the Harvey West area and when we were actually, you know, on on site for work, you know, I would see parents and mothers with their strollers walking down Coral Street and the conditions were not uh, conducive to families. And I think we need to remember there's very different populations of homelessness in our community. And I just wonder, as you uh, dis discussed uh, the Coral Street vision, if, if there was consideration of having a different location for families as part of that discussion or if that didn't come up at, at all. But um, kind of observing it, it didn't, it didn't feel like the right place to have uh, parents with children uh, as it was or as it has been in the past. Yeah, I can, I can follow up on that, um, Council Member Watkins. So the, the question about the best way folks that are experiencing homelessness in our community all in one area certainly has come up not so much within the context of the catch deliberations however um, the work with Nielsen Studios is also hovering around assistance and consulting work with master planning and we had kick-started a master planning process um, last year with Ron Prince um, kind of leading the charge on that and had begun to work with an architect um, go this is the city county and um, COVID happened and so in returning with the design of Coral Street obviously the programmatic needs between the agencies that are um, cited at Coral Street have come up and that is in addition to the business owners and the neighbors as well. And I will reiterate as well that um, the we shifted folks into the managed camp on Coral Street. We had a father with a six-year-old daughter come out of Redley Shelter and say that they had never walked on the sidewalk before that day um, out of fear and really, quite frankly, um, concern for their safety. So I will, you know, obviously supports um, that that um, reaction and also know that it's really important to ensure safe um, accessibility for everybody and that will be certainly be part of the design and uh, master planning process moving forward great thank you Susie and I, I'll just make one last comment and just sort of a quick shout out to Dwayne Tate who is now in New Zealand who's a colleague of mine at the County Office of Education's tireless advocate for homelessness and homeless families and partnerships and a collaborative person and I know he uh, felt really moved by this experience and it uh, added to his character and he had a really incredible uh, foundation already um, but I, I know he would he would be here in spirit, and I just want to across the globe uh, give a shout out to him as well. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I see one of the um, subcommittee members, Rafa, um, signed so wanted to make a comment. So, Rafa, if you could join us, go ahead. 
Well, thank you. Um, I hope it would be all right if I spent a few moments now just uh, trying to distill uh, uh, the uh, perspective uh, that I, I can share from chair of the Safe Sleep Subcommittee. Um, over the course of a number of public meetings hosted opportunity to hear from a wide range of members of the public and receiving correspondence from the public about various potential types of programs for people experiencing homelessness to be afforded a legal place to sleep. It was human efforts that among the, uh, there's a preference for options there for 24-hour indoor shelters, uh, tiny home villages, and things of that nature. And at the same time, uh, many people experiencing homelessness stated a preference for the autonomy of being allowed to camp outdoors independently or in self-managed camps. Uh, while recognizing the general preference many people in our community have to see people experiencing homelessness shelter indoors, in practice it does not seem likely that the city of Santa Cruz will ever have adequate capacity in its indoor shelter system to meet the needs of 100% of the people who sleep outside. Uh, for this reason, uh, we need to continue to develop city policies such as a uh, revised ordinance that does not generally criminalize the act of sleeping outside and that designates pl places where people are allowed to camp. Uh, we must continue efforts to create additional capacity for managed indoor shelters such as navigation centers, uh, tiny home villages, and temporary indoor shelters while continuing to refine pol policing practices. Moving to an outreach first model of enforcement where uh, people sleeping outside and designating lawful areas for people to sleep will result in better outcomes, is more cost effective, and will allow police officers to spend more time dealing with serious threats to public health and safety instead of essentially continuing uh, to herd people experiencing homelessness who sleep outside from one area of the city to another. Uh, everything that I've mentioned thus far has already been recommended by the cash to the council, uh, but the council has yet uh, taken any substantial action to move these recommendations forward. Uh, by my count, only tw seven of the 22 recommendations made by the cash at our last presentation to council. Things for the outreach first model. Uh, recommendations regarding the uh, developing safe sleeping sites beyond the temporary nature of the COVID-19 relief funded programs, uh, developing additional long-term uh, uh, indoor shelter capacity, uh, uh, several recommendations regarding the modifications to the camping ordinance that reflect the values of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, Martin v. Boise ruling, and uh, uh, and with that, uh, uh, decriminalizing um, uh, sleeping, uh, creating safe sleep zones for folks to legally have a place to go. Uh, the Benchlands right now, which is a, a site that, that I think we all think is, is a, a good program model, uh, has approximately 100 residents, uh, but it's, it's at capacity. And uh, it's also set to close in, in the middle of October because of, of flooding concerns. So, so the question becomes, uh, what happens to the people uh, who are staying in that, sh that location now? Where, where does that, that uh, site move? Is it gonna be more than one location? Uh, there are a lot of, of, of questions that are up in the air right now around that site. Uh, so, Identifying locations for these safe sleep zones or other programs, uh, that's a really critical uh, aspect of, of the, the city's uh, responsibility for uh, managing uh, uh, outdoor uh, camping and people experiencing homelessness who are, are unsheltered. Uh, the CASH never did make specific recommendations about sites for outdoor safe sleep programs. Um, this was probably the most controversial topic we were asked to look at and the most challenging. Um, however, the Safe Sleep Committee was in the midst of developing a, ru a rubric for siting criteria that the city could use in selecting a site that we felt was an improvement over the criteria uh, when the city was poised to choose between sites like the Wharf Corporation Yard, uh, the North Depot Park 
parking lot, uh, the city-owned space on High Street, uh, Lot 17, et cetera. Uh, that work was ultimately not completed due to the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, but we felt uh, adapting the city's existing scoring system used by the planning department to weigh the site siting criteria, uh, which we listed in our interim recommendations. Uh, uh, in that report, uh, that would be a critical uh, and a crucial um, uh, goal in producing a, a, a fair, balanced siting recommendation that follows the objective criteria and uh, reduce, reduces neighborhood political influence in site selection. Um, I also just wanted to mention uh, quickly and finally that uh, uh, the Safe Sleep Subcommittee had um, uh, put forth a recommendation for uh, developing a strategic action plan on homelessness for the city uh, with 11 specified elements. Um, unfortunately, the, just the nature of, of the, the catch meetings made it uh, challenging for us to, uh, to turn that, the subcommittee's recommendation into a formal recommendation that the cash could bring forward. There just wasn't enough time in our meetings to, to get the wordsmithing right of, of that recommendation. Um, we just didn't have enough time to move, move that forward. But, but I, I would hope that, that the, the catch would have been um, uh, supportive of, 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 an, of that recommendation that came from the, the Safe Sleep Subcommittee. Um, and uh, in addition to that, there was another uh, 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 policy suggestion, uh, which is mentioned in our interim report, which is to uh, take that strategic action plan and, uh, and, and the uh, idea of the outreach force model of enforcement and make those two things the highest uh, homelessness-related priorities for the city. And with that, I'll, I'll send it back to the mayor. Thanks very much.
that um, the flip side of that, which was captured a little bit in the report, is that pandemic has um, created um, a really tremendous opportunity for um, increased coordination across the region. And this is between the city and county jurisdictions, as well as with our nonprofit and faith-based um, and private partners. Um, as the mayor mentioned, um, the county is moving forward with a six-month work plan, which develops a bridge between COVID response and ultimately the sustainable approach to systems, um, uh, systems response and governance with regard to homelessness. The six-month um, work plan, which uh, the CAO's office and the Human Services Department brought to the Board of Supervisors at the previous meeting, not the one today, um, really does capture the momentum that was created during COVID. And as the mayor uh, talked about, we have vastly increased our sh shelter capacity. Um, that is in um, hotel rooms for our um, isolated um, and quarantined and vulnerable individuals. So those are folks that have either been tested COVID positive or are vulnerable, particularly to um, the, the illness um, created by the virus, to um, congregate shelter programs at both the Santa Cruz Vets and Watsonville Vets Hall, to of course what, you'll, what you see at the Benchlands that started a few weeks ago and at the Coral Street um, housing, I'm sorry, shelter program that um, supported folks to transition from the unsanctioned encampments on Coral Street. In addition, um, there is an entirely coordinated outreach model now that is being led by the Homeless Persons Health Project um, across um, probably two dozen service providers that have never worked together before. It's been a tremendous thing to watch um, from the city's perspective, um, how much case coordination can happen when um, folks work together on those, um, meeting those needs. To um, the county just launched a housing center um, case management program within um, the, the current shelter programs. And so really putting an emphasis on the case management um, aspect that Council Member Byers was talking about, which is critical for people to um, assist people to exit shelter into housing and to stay in housing. So that six month work plan, I know uh, Mayor Cummings, um, Elisa Benson, the Assistant CAO is certainly willing to come and talk to the City Council about that process as well as um, the, the, the process for which the three year work plan is being created. The one main point that I think is really pivotal for the council to be intimately involved in is the new system of governance that um, will be part of that focus strategies work, which will be replacing the, home, uh, the HAP, um, the Homeless Action Partnership, which is our region's arm of the continuum of care, the COC. And right now, um, we are working through the Focus Strategies Advisory um, Team to develop um, essentially a county commission for which um, elected officials um, from the local jurisdictions as well as the county would sit on as um, in addition to folks with lived experiences um, as well as um, other you know, critical members in the community that are involved in, in homelessness response. So that governance process um, is um, really important for the council to weigh in on um, in that essentially it is expected that this new commission will be um, making those funding and fiscal decision, decisions as well as policy decisions to improve the lives of um, folks unsheltered as well as our housed neighbors. So I'm happy to work with the county CAO's office and HSD and bringing more information to um, the city at, uh, you know, at a future meeting if, if that is desired. Great, thank you, Susie, for that update. And one other thing, if I remember correctly from that six month plan, is there's mention of creating a homeless services division and the hiring services director at the level of the county, is that correct? 
Yeah, so the, the CIO's office has been um, housing, no pun intended, the homelessness response for the county. That is in October moving over to the Human Services Department under the leadership of the new HSD director, Randy Morris. I believe that they are um, in the process of recruitment for that position. They are going to be hiring a new division director, um, of which the staff from the CAO's office is going to be moving over, and then um, HSD staff that works on Smart Path and other um, housing action is going to be sitting. So most of that work is going to be moving over to HSD um, come October of this year. Susie? Yeah. Hi, this is Martine. I just wanted to add, uh, actually, the uh, I'm actually serving on the interview panel for the new uh, director tomorrow, actually, all day today. So uh, all day tomorrow. So they're moving forward with that uh, position. Great. So, yeah, I think it's just great that, you know, the, the amount of work that's have gone into you know, homeless services and housing of homeless during COVID is really you know developing into something much bigger at the county level that's going to be addressing this issue. And so, for all the work, I think it's you know now is a time where we're going to be as a county you know unifying to really address this issue head on. And so, um, just thought it'd be good for council members who may not been aware of you know what the planning that's coming forward around homelessness at the county level, but it's pretty extensive and, and, and very exciting. And so uh, I'll move on, uh, Council Member Goldberg, Council Member Matthews, and I'm hoping we can then open it up to public comment and come back uh, to take action on this item. So I just was wanting to bring to everyone's attention, according to the report, there's 77% of the people who either suffer from um, substance abuse or um, or a psychiatric condition. And in my experience, sometimes people don't want help, even if you bring them to a navigation center. And so one question I have is, what recommendations do you have for people who are treatment resistant? And then another um, thing I don't want us to lose sight of is that we talk a lot about the homeless um, houseless individuals and um, that they are the most vulnerable members of our community, and some of them are. Uh, but I also don't want us to forget that the children under the age of 18 in our community are really vulnerable members of our community, and prevention is something that we have to keep up the forefront of our minds and, you know, not just look at the here and now, but look really long term. And I know Santa Cruz City Schools has been doing a good job of focusing on mental health and keeping sure that um, that mental um, health and uh, we've got full-time counselors at the elementary level, we've got socio, uh, social emotional curriculum, and it's just as important as the academic curriculum starting in kindergarten. That being said, like where I think Santa Cruz City Schools, and I'm probably guessing schools across the city, state, and county fall short, is with any education around um, addiction and and drugs, quite frankly. I know like my high school junior has had one week of health education about drugs in probably his whole school career, a couple days in ninth grade health, a couple days in seventh grade, and a day or two in fifth grade. Like, and we're hours of a day. And so if we're not focusing on the youth and we're not educating people about ways to not fall into this trap, then it's going to be just a snowball effect and we're really never going to get out of it. So while I agree that I think we need to focus on the folks that are suffering here and now, we can't lose sight that we need to put some money and some resources wherever, I don't know where it can come from, into making sure that uh, this is prevented in the long term as well. Thanks. Mayor, can I um, provide one, one little piece of feedback on that for Council Member Golder? So, um, Renee, I have yet to sit down with you and talk about core investments, and that is um, being extended a year by virtue of COVID, but gets to much of the upstream prevention um, investments that the city makes along with the county that um, we are moving forward with developing a new RFP um, in the coming 
months um, along with the county. And what you have raised in terms of the need to, and I know Council Member Watkins will, will agree with you on this along with many others, other of your colleagues, um, that the Our school system into prevention with regard to behavioral health disorders is a critical investment um, of that upstream collective impact. This is an issue that we will be bringing to the Community Programs Committee as we continue to think about how best to invest. Um, so that is going to be um, a significant priority for the city council in this coming year and thinking about what that investment should look like moving forward. And I can't remember if you're on the community programs committee or not. I think you might be. So if you are, I'd really be happy. <laughs> Thanks, Susie. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Matthews. I will briefly second everyone's comments, extending thanks to um, the entire CASH team, convener, chairs, committee members, and staff. It was just a heroic amount of work over time. I do want to second, uh, I think, Catherine's observation. It's been a long time dealing with this and all those reports and recommendations and so forth. And honestly, frustrating, frustrating. Um, for advocates, for providers, for the community. And I think as several have mentioned, certainly um, the mayor and Susie, um, the combination of the county re-looking through a focus strategy uh, study and report about how they can do it better and the urgency of COVID in forcing a more uh, engaged, uh, partnership between the city and the county has gotten us further than years of asking, quite honestly. And if there's anything I feel emphatic about, it's that the burden, the expectation for this should not continue to rest on the city of Santa Cruz. I think that's, I probably, I see a lot of nodding heads on that. So that's the momentum for us and for advocates and providers all to carry forth with. Um, I'm encouraged to hear about some of the things, certainly the re-envisioning of Coral Street. I agree with um, Council Member Watkins' statement. That's not a therapeutic environment for families. Let's not kid ourselves. So um, there's so much to look at that can get us to the kind of results that we want. And uh, I am hoping um, that as we move forward trying to implement the um, the study, the county study, the cooperation and the staffing and the government that collectively in the sense of urgency that we feel now with the sheer numbers and our COVID that we can start, begin to feel that we're making progress on getting people to better places. <laughs> and that can take a whole lot of different forms. But um, uh, I think there, there definitely has been a sense of frustration, fatigue, uh, settling upon the city. And um, I hope that the work of cash and the focus strategy and a new partnership um, can, can get us to see some progress. Okay. Um, there are no further comments from council members. I will turn it over to on this item. So if there are members of the community who would like to comment on the report is being brought forward by the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness. Um, now is the time to call the number that's on your screen. Um, once you have called in, please press star nine on your phone and you will be given two minutes. I do believe there was one uh, member of the public representing the hook who called in who was at for four minutes. And so at this point in time, I'll go to the members of the public um, to open up for a public comment. Yeah, hi, this is Kerry Phillip. Hey, I'm convinced the best homeless shelter solution involves real housing consisting of family-like support group homes run by professionals trained in health and safety rules. More 
conditions and rules of the house would be all by voluntary mutual agreement and enforced. This targets the neediest cases, unlike some as to how this is paid for, who runs it, is another matter, but the city should not be the primary driver of these programs. It would be cheaper than constructing new shelters, ordinary housing is involved, and target the neediest, unlike Section 8 subsidy solutions or the indifference of mass shelter or encampment solutions. It's time to try something different. Now, back to what I've always said for two years. Number one, the population density of homeless in Santa Cruz is much higher than the state average, higher than any city I know of. It's almost 2% where the state is more like 0.35%. This means far too many homeless in Santa Cruz, and we are in danger of becoming an exceptional cesspool of government subsidy. To catch the reasons why this is, and identifying this problem requires acknowledging that dimension. The question is why this extraordinary density is just here. You really, really, really need to answer that question and admit reducing the number of homeless here should be a major necessary rational goal and a measure of success before committing one dime to do anything. As is, I only see the extraordinary cesspool of government dependence growing. I suspect it is the militant homeless advocates and a militant nonprofit base that feeds off the homeless even as they support, attract, and maintain them even as law and order looks the other way. Those are high on the list of reasons for these numbers. I desire to hear your Santa Cruz specific explanation as to these large numbers. I expect to hear crickets. Uh, number two, crime. The homeless population adds considerably to police action, crime, and blight, something the greater public does not deserve. Some of these people should be locked up and not catch and release. I have more, but uh, that's all for now. Bye. Serge Cagno. I'm a member of the CATCH, and this is where I'd like to reiterate what everybody said. Thank you. Um, there's been so much work and so much sincere effort uh, trying to solve our city's issues on this and trying to help the people on the streets. Um, I was on contract with the county to help design and set up the vet hall programs. Um, I do a lot of collaborating with case managers and with outreach staff, um, and I think that no matter which side of you know these issues you're on, I think we all want effectiveness. We want to have a change in the status quo. Um, and as we're trying to decide what is our next step, I think it's all about we would like an effective response to be able to change um, what what everybody is, what our community is challenged with. Um, COVID was a chance where the city collaborated with the county. And that didn't need COVID. And I want to really be clear on the collaboration with the county can, I hope, continues post-COVID without this always challenging of the county should take care of it, the, the county should pay for it. So part of what the county did and what we designed for the vet fall shelters is we designed it as low barrier programs. And that means not having unnecessary stigmatizing curfews or demanding abstinence from residents in the midst of their addiction. Using low barrier, you can still absolutely demand safety and you accept people for where they're at. Um, we engaged many, many clients who have never been in the system before, never accepted services from anybody. And we, we used HMIS, the Homeless Management Information System, which is online case management pretty much. And we found many, many people had never signed up. So it's this idea of accepting people for where they're at and making sure that you have safety, but being flexible about everything else, treating them with respect, gets them engaged in the system. We had services in the shelter. Um, I think Susie mentioned one of them, talking about case management, trying to get people into housing after the shelters. But we also had social work, we had behavioral health, and behavioral health is mental health and substance use services. 
and we had county staff coming in and doing hours and meeting with people. And that compassionate face-to-face -face time is hand down the most effective way to engage people into services. The status quo pre-COVID in the city of Santa Cruz is a law enforcement response and a city manager response of trying to deal with encampments. I'm sorry, I have to cut you off, but um, you have gone beyond your two minutes. But I definitely thank you for your comments and appreciate the hard work that you're doing with getting services and getting um, people, you know, connected to services in our community. Okay, is there any, if there's any other member of the public would like to speak to us on this item, now is the time to call in. Um, and once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you'll be given two minutes to comment on this item. Okay, I'm prepared to make a motion and not just because it's a school night. I um, am also, and I can't believe I'm saying this again, agreeing with, <laughs> I'm agreeing with Garrett Phillips in that. I do think people would be, um, it'd be awesome to see people in non-traditional homeless type shelters like we're in, in co-housing situations. And I would love to see further collaboration between our city and the county moving forward. And I agree with Serge and that it shouldn't have taken a global pandemic to bring all the players to the table. And I really hope that this two by two committee can be expanded to do a two by five and include all of the, I mean, I mean, I can't do the, all the board of supervisors, but you know what I'm saying, bring more voices to the table and really um, move things forward. So that being said, um, um, move the, um, receive the community advisory on homelessness um, staff recommendation um, and accept the, accept the final cash report and direct the city manager to implement council accepted cash final policy recommendations as identified during council deliberations. And I would just like to add one more thing. If there's any money in that CARES Act that we could put um, towards this, um, and I'm open to whatever people on council think about that. Like that I'm going to leave it at that. So I have a motion by Golder. I see council member Watkins, your hand is raised next to the queue. I was just going to second the motion or make the motion, but I'll second the motion now that council member Golder made it. Okay. I see a motion by council member Golder, second by council member Watkins um, to accept the final report and direct the city manager to implement council, accept the catch, final policy recommendation as identified during council deliberations. Um, council member Brown. Yeah, thanks. I, um, I want to support the motion, but I want to try to clarify and follow up on council member Golder's uh, proposal to direct uh, potential CARES Act funding to the, um, the, the follow-up and the process for, I think in particular, the Coral Street project. I think that's something that we could make a meaningful contribution to, uh, and uh, pro with the help of the county, given the, the relationship that's uh, um, flourished and um, what I'm hearing about the county's willingness to participate in that as well, I feel like it's uh, a good incentive to, to really get that going. So if we could just like, I mean, I would say yes, I support Council Member Golder's proposal and if we could sort of figure out, um, you know, if, could we find $100,000 as how Council Members feel about that uh, from the CARES Act funding that I believe um, we should have available to us uh, for these kind, this kind of purpose. So, is that a friendly amendment, or could you then maybe yeah. state? I'll, I'll call it a friendly amendment to clarify uh, contribution from the city's CARES Act fund to move uh, the work at Coral Street forward.
if, that, if that's accepted by the maker of the motion. Yes, there's been a friendly amendment by Councilmember Brown. Councilmember Brown. Well, I understand the interest, if, if I could, but I want to remind us we're going into a budget one week, and there are going to be so many claims, even on CARES Act, and I'm very reluctant right now with this as the one thing from advice to specifically designate any amount of money. Obviously, it's a candidate, but um, I would just prefer that a specific designation not be explicit a budget. There are a whole lot of things that are in the cash recommendations. They're all going to be buying for resources. So that would just be, I think, a suggestion. Even consider care, but not to designate or say a priority or an amount. If, if I can interject and, and maybe ask um, Susie as well, I know, and, and maybe the city manager will win, because I know that you know, the conversations that we've had with um, through the two by two, and just kind of understanding the funding currently, you know, as we're standing up all these different projects, there's a need to have funding, and some of these are reimbursable. Um, and, and so I'm just wondering if you can maybe speak to how the funding is being utilized to fund the numerous programs that we're standing up in the city. Uh, sure. Oh, go ahead, Susie, if you want to go. Oh, sure? Yeah. Um, so one thing that I wanted to mention, thanks, thanks, Mayor, um, and I'm sure my team will um, elaborate on this as well, is that the, the funds that have been used to stand up the vast majority of the programs have been provided um, during COVID response, have been provided by the county, however, under the continuum of care. So some of these funds um, were originally programmed through the Homeless Action Partnership, um, of which the city sits on the governance as well as the advisory board for um, the, the, the HAP. Um, some of those funds to the tune of $1.4 million were HEAP funds that were supposed to pay for Seaburg, um, and by virtue of those negotiations falling, falling through, those funds still sit in the HAP jurisdiction for allocation. That is one source of funds that could be used um, to help support the work of the catch and these recommendations. Um, further, you know, I know that um, during your budget hearings um, and the study session that begins next week, um, as Mar uh, Cynthia mentioned, there will be um, a lot of challenging discussions around cuts, et cetera. Um, the CARES funding, um, in addition to CDBG and other funds that may come from the state and the feds, moving forward could be used for some of these um, priorities. Uh, and I think the biggest consideration that we need to make is what is eligible for FEMA reimbursement mm -hmm. and for the CARES funding in particular in things as the count. And so I know um, uh, Martine mentioned in the letter from the mayor to the board earlier during his city manager's report, there is a request to look deeper at the CARES funding um, portfolio at the county level as well. And I think, you know, in hearing um, Sandy's friendly amendment, it, it might make sense to at least, um, while not putting in a specific number, um, to make um, a consideration around that negotiation with the county um, with regard to the CARES funding portfolio and then include some of those considerations in your budget discussions um, next week. Yeah, yeah let, let me elaborate. And some of the funding is being used to pay for um, the, the activities. And there's a variety of funding sources um, there's really two, two buckets. Uh, one is uh, funding related specifically to, to COVID. Um, and, and some will be covered through FEMA reimbursements uh, by 
the nature of this being a declared emergency. And so we're tracking those and we'll be submitting for reimbursements. And so there's a number of expenses that uh, we'll be looking to get reimbursed for. And those includes uh, uh, homelessness related expenses, you know, sanitation facilities, uh, things like that. And the county is as well with some of the things that they've stood up. And then in addition, there's the CARES funding, which is funding that was allocated through the first stimulus package, uh, the federal stimulus package. Uh, there was some money given directly to large cities, half of half a million or more. And then the rest was given to the states to distribute to counties and cities that were smaller populations. And so then what the state did was out to, to give a direct allocation to cities of 300,000 uh, that was a pretty significant. They gave a pretty significant allocation to counties, really minuscule allocations to small cities. So what we received was minuscule uh, by comparison. Um, and really, what our, it's, it's not even going to cover our expenses that are not eligible. So, for example, we're receiving $780,000, which might seem like a lot, but it really isn't in the context of what uh, we've been spending. The county, by comparison, received $27 million uh, of CARES funding. Uh, so, so that's uh, so for the, what we're looking at with respect to our CARES funding is just trying to cover the expenses that we've had that aren't going to be covered by FEMA uh, and uh, to uh, just be able to, to, and as you know, with our budget situation and the, the huge deficit that we're facing, we're just trying to make sure that uh, we're able to pay, pay the bills and cover COVID-related expenses. It has to be for COVID-related expenses to do with respect to the, the small allocation that the city received of CARES funding. Uh, then the other part of uh, funds that's uh, out there is really from the state, uh, and uh, Susie mentioned some of the allocations, the heat allocations that have come in the last several years that have been used, and then there's some additional funding in the current uh, state budget also. And so the state, uh, and then there's a, some additional state funding for mental health services uh, as well. Much of that funding, again, has gone to the county. And so the county has really a large, the lion's share of overall funding for um, homelessness services that's been allocated through the state budget as well as the federal CARES funding. And then of course we also have allocated funding through our general fund. So we have some uh, approximately a million dollars in general fund allocations and then we also allocate some through CDBG uh, and other, uh, other sources, federal sources where uh, it's eligible. So that's, that's kind of the status of our funding, uh, but the, the honest truth is we just do not have uh, you know, additional funds at, the, at this point to uh, allocate for additional programs that are sustained. The county has been allocated uh, a significant amount of funding for that purpose. And so in that regard, since they were allocated the, the bulk of the funding for, that, for those purposes. Mike, if I could just follow up, if I remember correctly, I think there was some mention about the Coral Street in that letter. Yes, yes, it, it, it was to pay investigation, the search capacity, uh, yeah, RV uh, uh, capacity. Uh, those are some of the, the, the areas that, that we, we've asked for some assistance in doing that. Now, of course, we, we also are, have invested in some of those areas through CBG, and we'll continue to do that and through the general fund. Um, and, but I think uh, with respect to the CARES funding, I think that was part of the question. You know, our, 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 our focus right now is trying to address the, the anticipated, unanticipated expenses that we had as a result of COVID. And, and of course, we're also trying to deal with the, the, the huge budget deficit as a result of COVID. So it's, it's sort of part of that mix as, as far as how to be able to use those funds. They're really not extra funds that we have to spend at this point. Um, Councilmember Brown, did you, I know that you had your, you kind of asked. Yeah, I, I have several comments and a follow-up question. Uh, so the reason that I suggested CARES Act funding is because I feel like that's a place where we can make a strategic investment now. It is uh, one-time funding, um, and I also my understanding is that it would help 
uh, motivate the county to uh, invest as well. Um, and so I'm, I'm a little concerned about the, like reverting back to this, well, it's the county's job and you know, it's, we, we're not really um, equipped to deal with this. And if we've already expended all of those funds, um, is it possible for us to get an accounting of what that money was spent for? Um, because I, I don't recall um, seeing anything like that. Yeah, you'll be getting that as part of the budget process. Uh, what it does is it, it is allocating their COVID funding for COVID-related expenses, you know, IT expenses, um, PPP expenses that they've acquired, uh, for example. Uh, they, uh, again, uh, they've got $27 million that they're allocating. Um, so what it does for us, it just simply makes our deficit bigger. Uh, so we're, we're <laughs> so that's the way I sort of look at it from a budgetary perspective. It's, you know, it's, obviously it's up to the council, the budget will be for you and, and you'll make that decision. Uh, but from a purely financial perspective, um, uh, the way we looked at it was, you know, we've got expenses that we haven't, we don't have the money to cover, and there are expenses that we have now, and we have a deficit, and so we're trying to, to cover those expenses. So yeah, you, so we'll get a, a specifically where that seven hundred and eighty million, eighty thousand okay. dollars, what that has been spent for, yes, yes. committed to. Yeah, much like the county is doing too, yes. Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm aware of what the county's doing. Um, so I guess going back then to the, so um, Council Member Golder, did you want to just withdraw the idea of uh, during out money at this point? Okay. Yeah, I think that's appropriate given the conversation. Okay. Uh, thank you. Councilman Matthews, Vice Mayor Myers, and then I have a uh, ask of the um, other family members to propose as well. My only question at this point was, what's the motion? So it sounds like it's and just. For, I'm sorry, really briefly. That if you know, if there's an opportunity to work with the, with the county and partner on a project, that uh, you know, I, I think that might be worth considering. But we should be sort of flexible with how we fund that. And so I think I just want to uh, make sure that we have retain flexibility to do that. And so there's a variety of funding sources that potentially we could take advantage of if there's an opportunity to partner or something. So I don't want to say that we shouldn't be partnering and potentially investing in things. I think we will have to make some investments. Um, I'm just saying that we just want to have flexibility with respect to how we fund that depending on you know, our budget situation and what's available. Uh, and, and, but it'll all come back to council in any case. So just to be clear. For a little bit of a clarification, um, and certainly would invite any of the council members to participate in the um, budget uh, hearing tomorrow if you can support the county city partnership. Um, the letter that was sent by the mayor and myself did um, specifically include um, a request for support for Coral Street. Um, and um, I know that for the last several months, um, I've been working with at least two of the supervisors um, to keep them updated on Coral Street and trying to understand the needs and uh, sort of the longer vision there. Um, as Susie mentioned with her work, try, uh, you know, we, we've been doing a lot of communication in terms of Coral Street. With information. We've talked about CARES Act, we've talked about other funding, so to Martine's point, I think we don't necessarily need to call that out in this motion, but I, I just want to assure you that the conversations happen literally almost every other day in terms of trying to figure out how to support these different efforts. So um, I want to, I just want to compliment um, especially Ryan Coonerty and um, Supervisor McPherson because um, we really do communicate almost, almost every other day. I really do feel like the partnership has grown substantially and, um, and I want to compliment the county staff. Um, I don't think by any means is this, um, you know, a, a, an impossible uh, request. I think uh, there's a lot of money that needs to be sorted amongst, amongst a lot of existing expenses that need to be covered and then the future. So, um, 
um, I think I think we're I think we're in good shape. Um, just being able to report out as a two by two member that way. So I hope that helps. Thanks. Yeah. Um, one friendly amendment that I was wondering if we could make to this um, is to the motion that the first part of it to accept the final catch report. As a friendly amendment, I was wondering if we could also directly report those to the county supervisors, um, given that there's extensive work that was done. I think that it would be good for this report to um, not only go to the county, but then also the, in the direction of the city manager's office that they um, work with the county on implementing council accepted catch final policy recommendation as identified during council deliberation. So the idea being that um, all this work and all this information that's come through this group, it'd be really good if the county has these recommendations as well, that they understand that council's accepted these, and that we really try to work with the county um, since they're the ones who are you know, really moving forward with creating the infrastructure to roll out um, all these different programs. I think that you know, as has come up in the conversations right now, you know, even as we talk about funding, if we're able to work with the county and kind of see the county as the leaders with this and work with the support, you know, letting them know what our needs are, I think that that uh, would really be helpful in, in continuing to maintain this collaborative, collaborative spirit and relationship. I will gladly accept that friendly amendment. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. I agree. I was just going to say I agree as well as the secondary of the motion. Okay. Thanks. Um, that friendly amendment was accepted. Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Brown, and then maybe we can wrap the evening up. It was mentioned that it would be good to have someone represent the city at the budget hearing tomorrow. We, that was mentioned earlier today also. Is anyone planning to do that? You are. Okay. What time is it at? Well, pardon? What time is it at, the meeting tomorrow? That's what I, do you have a time certain for that or a, a window? Um, yeah, I, was, I, was, uh, I believe Susie mentioned, I think the, the meeting starts at 9. It's hard to know exactly, but so maybe somewhere try to tune in by 10-ish. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. I don't know, Susie, you were watching that closer than I was, but I think yeah, but to the extent that we can, we can advocate, let's, you know, please anyone that can join in. I've got a little time between a meeting at work, but if there's more people that can join, it'd be great. Well, I'll try to make I time. That's all, that's all Zoom, too, so it's just a matter of calling in. <laughs> Is that correct? Yeah, so um, I sent an email to the mayor and vice mayor about the timing of it, um, Councilmember Matthews, and I think that the meeting starts at nine, but there is um, public comment before that, and there have been a fair, there has been a fairly long line of public comment in recent meetings, and I don't know if the budget hearings will be an exception. Um, and then they are going to do the consent agenda before they move into the CAO's office um, budgets. And that, so my expectation is anywhere between 9.30 and 10.30 is when public comment would be happening on that particular element of the agenda. It is the first general business agenda item. Text us, Susie, text us. Yeah, text, 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 text,
make a small, a modest contribution to demonstrate that we really want to partner on a project like this. So um, I'll just say that and um, leave it there until the budget conversation may come up again. Okay, um, if there are no further questions or comments, um, the piece of motion is before us uh, with the included from the amendments, which was to accept the cash report um, that we directed the report to be sent to the county and that we direct the city manager's office to work with the county on implementing council accepted cash final policy recommendations as identified during city council deliberations. Uh, the motion was made by Councilmember Goldberg, seconded by Councilmember Watson. If there's no further questions or comments, I'll turn it over to the city clerk to call the roll. And Mayor Cummings, may I make a quick request for forward staff clarification? And I know um, that this might be helpful for the clerk as well. The, the motion was written in a way to allow for you to identify specific recommendations from the final recommendations to move forward. I'm assuming that you mean all four recommendations. Um, I just want to make that clarification so everybody's on the same page. I'll ask the maker of the motion if that's the case. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yes. So that's all four recommendations. So I'll turn it over to the clerk for the roll call vote on this item. Council members Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? that passes unanimously. Well, again, to all the cast members and to all the people who made it, um, thank you uh, to Mr. Fred Keeley. Thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> to our city staff who took a lot of time working on this with the, the community and all the community who were able to weigh in on this process. Um, it was really great that we were able to get some solid recommendations and get people engaged and involved. And we look forward to going forward with our work with the town to um, really do as best we can with the resources that we have to address um, homelessness in our community. Thank you all, and have a good night. Goodbye.